by the list you want to be on. What do you mean drug users? People that actively do drugs? Oh, you can do drugs one time and be a drug user. I mean, how many times do you have to lie to be a liar? Sure. People lie every day. Well, then they're liars. Right. But they don't have to lie every day to be a liar. You can lie once and be a liar. You can steal once and be a thief. Not to steal every single day, but even right. every other day. You're still a thief. But if you take a drug once, that doesn't define you as a drug user. That defines you as something that made a mistake. No, you're, it defines you as a sinner, is what it defines you as. Well, everyone's a sinner. Well, everyone has sinned, and everyone's a sinner. Everyone sins every day. And that's not true. Yeah, it is. Where'd you get that from? People lie every day, people make mistakes every day. Now, hold on a second. So, the only way you can know that everyone sins every day is if you're God. Well, you're not God, so we've established that. Right. The only way you can know it now is if God told you that. So, where has God told you that everyone sins every day? So you don't think everyone sins every day? Of course not. Because I'm one of those people that I don't sin every day. And so is he. He doesn't sin every day. Either does he. So that's three people right there that you know right now who are confessing to you that we don't sin every day. And for you to argue against that would mean to say, once again, God told me you sin every day. Well, you don't have that knowledge from God. God hasn't told you that. The Bible doesn't say that. Right. But my question is, if someone does drugs, let's say one time, and they repent for it, you're saying hell awaits for them. Well, you didn't mention repentance. No, not one time did you mention repentance. I've done a lot of these things, man. I've turned from it all. Okay. And now I live a holy life. Right. That's, I'm, not, that's I'm, crazy. Not, I'm not doing it anymore. Okay. Oh, so you're saying the constant. Like without repenting. But if, if someone lies and just one time, which is nobody, no one's a lie just once that I know of. Right, right. But if you lie just one time, you're a liar. Right. And you remain that way, you're guilty before God of that sin until you come to him in humble childlike faith and repent of it, turn from it, forsake it, and begin to follow Jesus. Right. So I until that, so yeah. until then you're just a liar. You're a sinner in God's eyes. And so, and Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. So if, if you're really going to follow Jesus, Jesus not lead you to sin. He leads you to be righteous. Yeah, he leads you to be righteous. So if, if you're really going to be a Christian to follow Jesus, you're not going to be sinning every day. Not even close. You shouldn't be sinning at all, period. Well, that's As a Christian. Impossible. No, it's not impossible. It's not. It's impossible to not sin one time. And you're, like, it's impossible. At some point, you will slip up. You will, you will sin. So does the Bible say you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you? Yes. It does. Okay. So is that does that does that include does that include uh, overcoming sin? Huh? I'm sorry. Sin free now, baby. Does that does that include overcoming sin? I'm sorry. What did you say? When the Bible says that you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you, right? Does that include overcoming sin? Yes. Okay. Can you do that for a minute? Yes. Can you do that for an hour? Yeah. Can you do it for a whole you day? Can do it for a lifetime. Oh, that's what I just said a second ago. You argued against it. No, no. You I, said you were eventually going to slip up. Yeah, but I'm saying there's not, there's no chance. There's not one time in your entire life that you slip up and commit a sin. There's no one that doesn't sin. Well, we've established, we've established already, young man, that everybody has sin. Right. But once again, we're not talking about that anymore. So you don't need to bring that up anymore. That people have I'm ever sinned. Has. I'm talking about. Okay, but but so do you not see the contradiction between what you're saying now? I'm asking. Don't, don't you don't you see the contradiction though between what you just said now and what you said a second ago? Because a second ago, when I quoted Philippians 4:13 to you, you said yes, you can you can live a lifetime overcoming sin. Then you say yeah, there's no chance. Sin, but, but overcoming sin would mean that you had to sin and that you had to go, have overcome it. Right, but we've already once again we've already established that we've sinned in the past. Right. We're not talking. You already said we're not talking about the past anymore. So let's not going back to that. Let's talk about the present and the future well, going I forward. Saying, like, in the remainder of your lifetime, there's no way you won't sin. Why do you keep saying that but say the opposite thing at the same time? I'm not saying the opposite. I'm saying that. I, I'm just going to tell you, young man, that according to James 1, you are a double-minded man. Yeah. You're unstable in all your ways. The Bible says if you walk according to the Spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. See, young man, the battle for you is in your mind. If you don't think you can be holy, you're never going to be holy. That simple. See, I know what God's Word says. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, No temptation has overtaken you, except such as is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. That's what the Bible says. And so 
When temptation comes, whether it's temptation to lust after a girl or a lie or a cuss, you know what comes with temptation every single time? Every single time, what comes with that temptation is the way out. So we don't look at it like, oh no, it's here again, I'm gonna fall again, I can't help it, I'm gonna sin again, I, I can't stop this. I look at it and say, well, you know what? There's the temptation, but you know what? With it is the way out. And with it, God says, this is not more than you can handle with my help. And so if I know those things in my mind and I've submitted my mind to God's word, I can be successful and victorious every single time. Yeah. Have you guys ever been successful with this? Have people like given their life to Christ when they sign? Well, see, yeah, that has to answer you quickly, yes. But I think your mindset is a little, little, little wrong, though, because when it comes to proclaiming the Word of God, it's not simply about getting converts, okay? The Bible describes the preaching of the Word of God as a seed. Have you ever gardened before? Have you ever gardened or farmed before? Yeah. Okay, so what's the first thing you do before you plant the seed? You prepare the ground. You till the ground. You prepare the soil. And then you sow the seed, and then you water it. The sun hits it, you water it some more. The sun hits it, you water it some more. Eventually something comes popping up. And then eventually, weeks, months later, you have some fruit on it. But what you're asking me is, are you, have you ever had fruit? Yeah, I've had fruit. People get saved. But it's also the plowing. It's also the sowing. It's also the watering. And so we're not simply here just to get converts. We're here to be faithful to God and declaring his whole counsel, his good news and his bad news, to those who have free will. And they can receive it. They can reject it, they can be apathetic, they can mock, they can scoff. These are all things that happen in the Bible when Jesus, John the Baptist, and the Apostle preached the Word of God. And so we're not to expect anything different. And so every place we go, we're going to four different kinds of people. People who aren't Christians, who laugh and mock and scoff and who hate it. People who aren't Christians, who are humble and contrite and broken and want to hear it. Professing Christians who hate it and they come against us and contend with us. And there's professing Christians who love it, and it's like they're encouraged, and they want to keep on doing it. So everywhere I go, I've been doing this for almost 20 years now, everywhere I go, I get those four groups. And no matter where I go, it's going to be a different amount in each one of those groups. But I'm called by God to be faithful to His Word, to declare His Word, and declare it with the, the right motives and attentions. And if I'm doing that, then in God's eyes, I'm successful, no matter how many converts I get. You know, so if, if I'm going to model myself after Jesus and John the Baptist and the apostles, these New Testament guys who I'm modeling myself after, they didn't get tons of converts. Right? Yeah, I, I understand where, okay. where you're coming from. Okay. But do you guys really think that God is telling you to come out here with these signs? Of course I do. Yeah, so then I have if, I did, if I didn't think that, young man, I wouldn't be here in the first place. I, I wouldn't drive almost two hours to come here. I wouldn't take my whole day be using my own money to come out here, to drive up here, to have to get a meal afterwards. I could be working, could be spent time with my family. Yes, if I didn't think this was God's will, that I've been doing it for, for 17 years now, then I wouldn't be doing it. I just, I don't know, as, as long as you're not condemning people. What do you mean by that? Because I see that your signs say like hell awaits. Is that true? And you know, like obey God and you have a problem with those things? It's, I don't feel like we're called to tell people they're going to hell. But here's the thing, though, young man. Your feelings don't really make a difference. No, that's what, what we, matters is the truth. It's not our job to tell people whether they're going to hell or not. That's God's job. Wait a minute. Hold on a second. Hold on a second. Does the Bible say that sinners are going to hell? <laughs> yes. Am I a preacher of God's word? I see what so, so, so if I'm not, no, you see, you don't want to go there because you know I'm right. See, when it comes to me being a preacher of God's word, I'm going to preach the Bible, not what you feel, not what you think I should preach. You're not my Holy Spirit. You're not God telling me how to preach or what to preach. God tells me what to preach and how to preach. And so I'm, I'm beholden to the word of God, not to you or your feelings or anyone else's feelings here. I'm beholden to the word of God because I have to give an account to God. I don't give an account to you or anyone else here. I give an account to God. And if I'm giving an account to God, I'm going to do what he says, not what you say. Well, that's kind of rude. You know, do you actually believe all what's on your signs? Wait a minute. Hold on a second. Let's, let's reverse. What I just said, what is rude of it? What, what did I just say I was rude? being kind of rude about it. 
Like, do you actually believe all that on your signs? Because the Muslims also, they do. So, so if, if what I'm saying is truthful, the way I just said to him was not rude one bit. The only reason why you think it's rude is because you don't like it. Let's, let's just be honest. You just don't like what I say. Why, you, why if God's telling you to drive two hours to come here to preach your signs, why you do it in the first place? Okay, so, so you want to know my motives, what you're asking. Okay, well, it's for the glory of God primarily. I want to obey him and serve him and love him and do what he tells me to do. That's the primary reason I do it. Secondarily, I have a love for sinners. I don't want you to go to hell. I don't want you to get what you deserve. I want you to get what you don't deserve, the grace and mercy of God. Okay, so what makes you think that you deserve the grace of God? I don't deserve it. So then why are you holding the sign telling people that they because deserve God, it if yeah. you don't yeah. deserve it all? Well, I do deserve it. I deserve hell. You deserve it because you're holding a sign. No, I, no you're not listening to me. I deserve hell. Okay. Well, I've, I've probably... Way. I'd probably send more. Listen, I'd probably. I, for holding up these signs, making all these well, people on there think it because your opinion means nothing to me. No okay, offense. Your opinion means nothing. To I'm not giving you my opinion. I'm giving you God's word. Yeah, well, God's word means nothing to me if that's what. You well, then walk mean. away. No one's making you stand there. I just wanted to share. If it meant nothing to you, then why'd you walk up? Because I wanted to share my grace. You don't have any grace. Because in the long run. You don't have any you grace. You ask for forgiveness. You should get it anyway. That's how. The That's not the way it works, actually. God calls you to repent. So you can ask God for forgiveness all you want, but if you're not willing to repent, forsake your sins, put them away, and live holy, God will say no, no, no every time. I just want to say that your sign is dumb because God tells you not to judge thy neighbor. Actually, the Bible does not say that. Everybody. Actually, the Bible does not say not to judge your neighbor. It actually says if you judge, you'll be judged too. Exactly. And I have no problem being judged. If I'm holy before God, I'm blameless before God. I've been forgiven of my sins. Uh, if you say you've been forgiven of your sins. I have. So I've turned from my sins. But the problem with you is you want to be a rebel and have grace at the same time. But it doesn't work that way. You can't be a rebel and God gives you forgiveness. Try that in a court of law. Let me out, judge. I'll go kill and rape some more. Ha, ha, ha. Sure, go ahead and go out. What good and just judge would ever do that? The God of the universe is a good and just judge. He's going to judge you for your sins. And there's no hope for you outside of Christ. And there's no hope to be in Christ outside of repentance and faith. Oh, that's great. Like I care. You obviously do care. That's why you stopped by. But your opinion means nothing. What matters is God's word. Not what you think, not what you say. What God says. What God thinks. You can tell yourself that if you want to, but on judgment day, God will judge you by his supposed non-existent word. You have nothing to say then. You have no excuse then. Pretty good. Say it again. Sorry, say that again. Yeah. Yeah, I prefer to talk about things that don't really matter. Yeah. Yeah. You can just search for Kerrigan Skelly, you'll find it. Yeah. It's a K-E-R-R-I-G-A-N, and then Skelly, S-K-E-L-L-Y. I have 75,000 subscribers. That's my videos. The videos I have. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Are you right with God? I'm chilling, yeah. What's that? Yeah. I'm not getting 
all yeah. the Have you forsaken your sins? Have you become born again of the Holy Spirit? You can just say, am I a sinner? And I'd like answer the question. I think a lot of people will like, this There's like 80 different phrases to say, are you going to hell? And the answer is probably not. Am I going to know until I die? No. Am I pretty certain? Yeah. Because they're projecting uh, well, there's no uncertainty about who's going to heaven and who's going to hell. Not in God's word. No uncertainty at all. If you're living in sin, you're on your way to hell. If you've forsaken your sins and turned in faith to Jesus Christ and become born again. We're not talking about denominations. I don't know why you're bringing that up. I've not said one thing about a denomination. No, it's not interpretations. Jesus said, repent or perish. Interpret that. He said, go and sin no more. Let's say, worst thing happened to you. Interpret that. You interpret it wrongly. Let's see how you interpret it. Okay. Besides, it's actually what it says. If I wasn't that ambiguous or vague about these things. You can deceive yourself into believing it is and comfort yourself with that vagueness, supposed vagueness, but it's not going to help you on Judgment Day. Burning hell will not be cool by definition. I mean, you make a hell, right? By definition, it won't be cool. There'll be no friends there, there'll be no partying there, there'll be no pornography there, no entertainment there. It's you by yourself burning in hell forever. I don't know why you bring up pornography like that. Why like, like that occupies in front of your mind. Well, because I'm here among college students and it's, it's a plethora here that engage in pornography. And all manner of other wickedness. Getting drunk, using drugs, fornicating. These are all things that happen in every campus. Yeah, of course. Yeah, so that's why I brought it up. Because it's probably applicable to you. Probably. It doesn't have to be, but it probably is. Maybe your conscience is seared then. Yeah, you're like another college since I met this last week at University of West Georgia. He was very apathetic, very kind of shoulder shrugging. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But do you, do you think when you stand before God and give an account for every thought, word, and deed, you'll be shrugging your shoulders? Yeah. No, you won't be. God won't give you the ability, the, the, the opportunity to shrug your shoulders. You will not dishonor and disrespect God in that way when you stand before Him. You'll be so ter trembling in fear, you'll think of nothing else but the, the torment that awaits you. I mean, have you ever watched those people on YouTube, the compilation videos on YouTube where it shows people who justly get a life sentence and how they respond to it? You ever watch those videos? Do, do, you, see the, do you see the terror in their face? Do you, do you see their, their utter despair, their utter hopelessness? And, and, that's, and that's just for someone who is going to jail for their life. I'm talking about you going to hell forever. Yeah. Not standing before an earthly judge who only has the power to send you to jail forever or put you to death physically. We're talking about the God of the Bible. And Jesus said, I say to you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who can kill the body and after they have no more they can do, but I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who, after he has killed, has power to cast into hell. Yes, I say to you, fear him. You need to fear God, man. It's got nothing to do with America, man. Nothing to do with America. Well, I know that. You need to fear God. It's a, it's a good, it's like a good foundation that we have to uh, touch on. It's a lot of Judeo-Christian values. And I'm not going to say, uh, I'm not going to be out here and say, this country was founded without religion. It was founded on the basis of religion, but we wanted to avoid as such so that we could have justice. That's irrelevant to your soul, young man. I know. It's irrelevant to your eternity and irrelevant to the effect you're on your way to hell right now. You know, you're not, not going to give God a history lesson when you stand before Him. You understand? He's not going to be impressed by your knowledge when you stand before Him. The gospel is the same whether you stand here or you stand in Africa or you stand in China or you stand in India. The gospel is the same. You still need to repent. No matter where you're standing, no matter what freedoms you have or don't have, you need to repent. Do you usually go off on tennis like this? Yeah, I do actually. Do you have Tourette's? Abide in me and I in you, right? Jesus said in John. And that 
Follow Jesus. He died for you. No. No, they haven't died for you. Name one person who's died for you besides Jesus. My name? Huh? Name someone who died for you. Just anybody. Not to add another first name, the personal pronoun. Name someone who died for you, even in an ambiguous and vague way. Name one soldier who's died for you. Name one war. Name one war where you were being protected. You weren't alive in World War One. Okay, and that wasn't protecting the U.S. either. That was in Europe. That was in Europe. That was in Europe. We didn't have to get involved in it. That wasn't protecting our country. Okay, so that wasn't protecting our country or our people. Either it was World War Two. Either it was Vietnam, either it was the Korean War, either it was the war in Iraq or the Gulf War. None of those things were to protect you. Doesn't matter, still wasn't there to protect you. There's no threat in our nation. Everything I do is in those history, and therefore it is good that I view it in that line, and that I accept that everything that's had has happened up until the time has had an impact on my life, whether it be small or good, whatever my effect is, more or less a real thing that can be a mind thing. You still have a name one person that's died for you, young man. Yeah, Including every Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marine just ever existed since you've been alive. You raise your argument, but I not really thought about it So we're still back to square one then. Jesus died for you. No one else did. And even if they did die for you, they didn't die for your soul. They didn't die for your salvation. They didn't die for your eternity. They didn't die for forgiveness of sins. Jesus died for all those things. He's the only one who has. I love to see this conversation, but I got to God, who formed you in your mother's womb, gave you life and breath, gave you food to enjoy, gave you years on your life, and even gave you a mind with which to think, and a spirit and eternal soul to enjoy life. God sent his only begotten son into the world, the man Jesus Christ, fully God and fully man. And he came preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God to repent of your sin, to repent of your sin and turn to Jesus Christ for the remission of your sin, that you would no longer be a sinner walking according to your own lust, walking according to your own way, or what you think is best, even though you've only been alive 18 to 25 years, you don't know what's best for your soul. You don't know Christ. What verse are you reading from? And God, you can talk to my, my brothers. Okay. What verse are you reading? And God has called what version? you, what commanded verse? you to um, repent of your sin. Right and now, he doesn't have to do uh, this. Come over here. He's, he's he doesn't have to do this. Talking about which one? Which part are you talking about? He loves you. Uh, okay. which, which part are you talking about? God wants he's, to give you a chance to have He's quoted several life. verses. Oh, okay. And so he sent his only begotten son into the world to die on a cross. That's John 3, 16 right there. For the shedding of blood. For an atonement for your soul. So that you could be made right with God. Do you want to be made right with God? Because right now, if you're walking in your sin, you're walking in your lust, you have made yourself an enemy of the God who formed you in your mother's womb. God Almighty. And as you're going to school, to get a degree to get a good job 
and hopefully make a lot of money so you can sit on it for the rest of your life. Do you not know that your life is more valuable than money to God? Even though you chase after money, which is why you go to school, typically, you want to get rich, you want to have a nice house, you want to live the American dream, but your life consists of more than and water, and money. Jesus said to beware of covetousness, for a man's life consists not of the abundance of the things which he possesses. And so God wants you to have your eyes set on eternal things. The things that are going to be there after you die. If God is the only one that can judge, why do I judge? After you die, you're going to have to leave say that? everything behind in this life. He's the only one that can um, do judgment. Who says that? All the money that you have. Everybody is born saying. All the power that you have. Everybody is born saying. All the power that you have. The Bible doesn't say only God can judge. And the Bible doesn't say that we're all born sinners either. You got to show me where to live at. We're all born sinners. We're born into the world of sin. Well, being born. He's made human. He's the only thing they say that wasn't good. You know, he made the land. But we weren't good. That's not true. Said everything was good. Yeah, read your Bible, man. Long, I read it at the beginning. That was the original. Yeah, that's the original. Then that, you had the whole yeah. good, and then. Well, actually, that's not what happened. Through the whole God Bible, Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve sinned. Through right. The whole Bible, so they man. sinned. But yes. but are you accountable for that sin? Christ, um, today we are. Yeah. No, you're not accountable for any sin, but you're on. Consequences on that with that. Okay, with consequences, that means you're accountable for it. He paid the men to work, and women paid and stuff. He paid all the men because they didn't have body at first. They had consequences that, that we still are here to today. I, th I think you better open the Bible and read it, man, because Genesis 3 doesn't say those things. It says that he made it harder for Adam to work, yeah. Okay, so doesn't say doesn't say that. Okay, it doesn't say women started having period because of that. That's what you said a second ago. So you have some misinformation there, but but when it when it comes when it comes to us being. So how did he? What, what did he do with Eve? What did he do? With Eve? He made it so painful for childbirth. Well, God, it's still a consequence. So we got to adhere to the day, I, right? I never said there wasn't any consequences. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So but, you said, but that is a, said that we have to uh, adhere to that stuff today. Which we no, I said, we're not born, <laughs> I said we're not born sinners. We're not accountable we're for their sin. The well, that's, that's no doubt about that. The world's yeah. sinful. But that doesn't mean you're a sinner when you're born. When you look throughout the Bible, there's a number of disobedience. And you only you have a few people. Who, no, there's righteous people. You got a few right people in the Bible, like Job, Enoch, who walked with God faithfully. David, Noah. John the Baptist, Jesus, the apostles. You probably caught him on your face. The majority, the people who want that, and that's people he appointed. But the people that he didn't appoint, which you probably not appointed, he probably not appointed. The people he didn't appoint, okay, man. Okay, okay. If you say so, if you say so. That's not facts. That was your opinion. That was your opinion. But listen, you still got to repent, man. No, it's not. It's God's word. It's God's word. There's coming a day and an hour that God Almighty has set that He's going to judge the thoughts and intents and deeds of the of the, of mankind. There's coming a day of judgment. Whether you live to see that day or die before that happens, you're going to stand before Christ. And the best place you can be is in Christ in that day, so that you don't have to stand in the judgment as a wicked sinner and be cast into the lake of fire. That's not God's will for you. God's will for you is that you turn from your wicked ways. Turn from your sin 
that is an offense to Almighty God. According to the Bible, if you're walking in fornication, which is sex before marriage, if you're having sex before marriage, or even lusting after women, lusting after men, this is considered a sin before God. God commands you to repent. According to the Bible, God commands you to repent. If you're walking in homosexuality, if you're a man trying to be a woman, a woman trying to be a man, a transgender, or whatever you want to call yourself, that is not according to God, it's a sin. According to 1 Corinthians 6, 9, no homosexual will have their place in the kingdom of God. Folks, if you're a liar, a thief, a blasphemer, idolater, worshiping other gods other than the true God that gave you life and breath, then you're walking away from Him and you will not enter the kingdom of God. And that's not God's will for you. God loves you in this. Not that He accepts your lifestyle. Not that He's tolerant with your sin. Not that He's just going to let everybody into His kingdom just because He doesn't want to lose anybody. No, that's not God's love. But He loves you in this. That even as a sinner, Christ died for you. He didn't have to do it, but he did it so you could have an opportunity to become a child of God through Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. But what will you do on the day of judgment if you reject God's offer of salvation? What will you do when you stand before God? What excuses are you going to give him? Are you going to say, I didn't know? Are you going to say, oh, because the church I went to, they didn't preach right doctrine? Oh, because all the Christians I've ever known, they've been so mean to me, or they, they were hypocrites. All the excuses that I've heard from sinners that are lost are not going to ride in the face of Jesus Christ. He's not going to sit there and say, oh, I understand. Come on into my kingdom. No, because he's given you a way through repentance. Repentance is a turning away from your sin. Those things that are offense against God. Turning away from your wicked ways, young lady. Then you won't flick off the preacher anymore. Then you won't be filthy minded anymore. You'll be a woman of God. An honorable woman of God instead of a wicked devil. God doesn't want you to be a wicked man or a wicked woman. He wants you to be a holy child of God full of holiness and full of His Spirit. But a lot of people want to mock. And that's what Jesus said would happen. If they hate you, just know they hated me first. They reject my word. They're not going to listen to you. That's what Jesus said. So when we see mockers, when we see sinners riding by, flicking us off, cursing us, this is ex you're proving the Bible true about what Jesus said would happen. So open the word of God and see what it says about your life. 1 Corinthians 6, 9. Let's deal with love, actually. God's love is not the love of the world. The love of the world says to to tolerance and acceptance. No, the love of the world is lust. The love of the world is just emotional. Because you make me feel good, I love you. That's why people people will take care of a cat or a dog before another person. Because they're easy to love. Because they wag their tail and they lick your face no matter what you're going through. Oh, they're so easy to love, aren't they? That's why animals get basically worshipped in America. I'm a dog daddy. I'm a dog mom. I'm a cat mom. And all that nonsense. No. Her babies. But God's love, it says, suffers long. It's long suffering. It's patient. It's patient with us. It's patient with others. It's kind. It's not jealous. God's love does not envy. When you see men and women looking at other men and women and saying, who does she think she is? Who does he think he is with that on? Because they want what they got. They want that necklace, they want those shoes, they want those clothes. Envy, that's not love? No. Love does not bunt itself up, it's not puffed up, it's not proud. And so you say you love yourself, you love your culture, you love 
your pride month or homosexual month, whatever it is, that's not love. That's pride. When you think that you're better than other people because of something that you are, you walk in, and you, you blast it to the world as if you're better than everybody else, that's pride. There's a whole month they call dedicated to pride month. That's not love. That's pride. That's not God's love. That's pride. The Bible says pride goes before a fall and a haughty spirit before destruction. That's not love. That's pride. Love does not behave itself unseemly. It doesn't behave itself wicked. It doesn't walk by and flash somebody or flick somebody off or curse somebody out. That's unseemly. It doesn't walk around wearing next to nothing on, look at showing your body off to the world. That's not love. That's unseemly. It's not God's love. God's love is not easily provoked. But you drive down, you drive down the street and people are so easily provoked just because they got cut off or someone in front of them is not going fast enough. The world does not have the love of God. It thinks no evil. The love of God doesn't think evil about somebody. Even though they're a sinner, God wants you to be saved and born again. That's why he sent his son, Jesus Christ. It doesn't falsely assume. It doesn't think evil of somebody. And it rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. God's love does not rejoice in sin. So when you see two homosexuals saying they love each other, they don't love each other. They're lying to each other. They're lusting after each other because they're, they're causing each other to sin before God. And that's not God's love. But you say love is love. But what is love? It's not God's love. You need God's love. God's love rejoices in the truth. When we preach the truth, God's love rejoices in that. So everybody that loves God rejoices in the preaching of the truth. Regardless if you call yourself Christian or not. And so if you don't have this love in your heart, you don't have God. And if you don't have God, you need to get him today through Jesus Christ. As it says in scripture, 1 Corinthians 6, 9. Know ye not, don't y'all know, that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Are you unrighteous today? Are you a sinner today? What is a sinner? Who is unrighteous? But those that practice lawlessness before God. What does your lifestyle look like? Are you a drunkard? You like to get high? You like to have sex outside of marriage? Masturbate? Watch pornography? Then you're a sinner before God. And you should be, a, you should be afraid right now about where your life is heading when you die. But yet, some of you walk around in your cocky pride acting like you're gonna live forever when you're not gonna live forever. You're gonna die one day. And the fear of God is going to come upon you in that day. But it's going to be too late. Let the fear of God come upon you now. Fear and tremble if you're a sinner about where you're going to go. And turn to the Savior. He says, don't you know the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Don't be deceived, folks. The world is deceiving you. Neither fornicators, those that have sex before marriage, idolaters, that would include Muslims and Hindus and Buddhists and Zoroastrians, atheists, who consider themselves, even though they don't know it, they're their own God, because they decide what they do and where they go, and they control their own life. These are idolaters, Mormons, Jehovah Witnesses, that have a, another Jesus than the Jesus that is preached in the Bible, then the Jesus that's in reality, these are idolaters because they formed a different God in their mind. Nor adulterers, effeminate, those that are homosexual, men trying to be women, women trying to be men, these will not inherit the kingdom of God according to the Bible. Nor thieves, sodomites, 
those that do acts of sodomy, they abuse themselves and they use their bodies which God has not intended them to be used. Those that steal, covetous, those that lust after material things and are not content with what they have, drunkards, those that like to get drunk, that like to drink it up and smoke it up and get intoxicated on weed or heroin or cocaine or meth or, or alcohol, nor revilers, those that, that, that do evil things to others, that revile people, that hate people, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And this is a small list. There's more on this sign. If you're on this sign or you're in the Bible that calls, that talks about these kind of sins and these are in your life, then you're in big trouble. Your life is in danger. Your soul is in danger. And you don't even know it. Walking in your pride. You can't see. But God will give you eyes to see and ears to hear if you're willing. You want to hear what the truth of the of the Bible says for those that are willing. And Paul goes on to write, and such were some of you. That's us. That's those that have been born again. Were, past tense, ex-homosexuals, ex-fornicators, ex-transgenders, ex-thieves, ex-liars, ex-blasphemers, ex-idolaters, ex-sinners. No longer sinners. Such were some of you. But ye are washed, sanctified, ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. That could be you if you want it. The question is, what do you want? Do you want to continue in sin? Then God is going to give you the wages of sin. I love pussy. And the Bible says the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death, folks. And this culture loves death. What do you really want? Do you want to continue in your sin? Do you want to continue in your sin because it makes you feel good? It'll only make you feel good for a season. And then it's not going to feel good anymore when God gives you the wages of that sin. When you die and you, and you wake up in the lake of fire, which Jesus said was prepared for the devil and his angels. That wasn't prepared for you. But you'll end up there. If you keep walking in your sin and you die in your sin, God wants to make you a new man, a new woman, through Christ Jesus. But he has, he has commanded you. God has commanded you. The God who formed you in your mother's womb. The God who gave you a free will to choose who you will serve. Will you serve yourself or him? That God has commanded you to repent. He hasn't asked you. He hasn't... He hasn't asked, said, please, please do this. No, he commands you because he created you. He can command you to do things. Are you listening? Are you listening to him? <coughs> Are you listening to God Almighty when he commands you to repent of your sin and be born again? Believe by faith in the gift of God, which is Christ Jesus, and that blood of atonement, which is there waiting. The blood was already shed for the sins of the world, but it hasn't been appropriated to you unless you repent. Unless you repent, turn away from your sin and turn to God by His grace. As the Holy Spirit convicts you, and He gives you he, he starts enlightening your mind. The, the engrafted word of God starts to go into that dark heart, that dark soul that's longing for truth and light and deliverance from sin. But it's not for the proud hearted. God resists the proud. The Bible says in James, you resist the proud. He gives more grace to the humble. 
Wherefore he says, God resists the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, unto God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh or near to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Don't walk around in pride anymore. Don't walk around in pleasures of sin, laughing it up and drinking it up with the world. One day it's all going to burn up. Don't do that. But let your laughter be turned to mourning and humble your, and your joy. Your joy in the things of the world be turned to heaviness and humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. Because God is not hearing the prayers of the proud sinner. There's proud sinners that pray all the time and God doesn't hear them. In fact, I believe he refuses to hear them. But he only hears the brokenhearted. As the Bible says, a broken and contrite spirit I won't cast out. If you come to him like a child, Jesus said, unless you humble yourself like a little child, hey, you will not enter the kingdom you of God. Guys are associated with There's a lot of it's called Maranatha Fellowship. Yeah. You guys get people to actually come in, though? Come into what? Like, uh, do you guys have conversations? All the time. But they have Hundreds. No idea when they die. Every year. That's good. That's good. Do you feel like... I mean, I'm a very strong Christian. I'm actually starting a pro-life ministry on campus right now, and I engage in these kind of conversations all the time. Do you feel like people are coming here to argue? So the Bible says to humble yourself. Some do. God wants you to humble yourself to Him. Do you think they actually, like, go to Him? Of course it does. Get some the truth. Right, you didn't right. create yourself. Well, in my you didn't perspective, form yourself in your mother's womb. I used to do this a lot. You used to do this. Like, hold signs that said, like, abortion is murder. They're going to hell. Is that true? I mean, it is true. So and why did you, you stop it? The glory. Because of this reason. God deserves the because reward. Because you didn't talk to any, your reach anybody. That's not true. You, you got deceived. You got lied to, and you he bought it. You um. I have talked to, to a lot of people, though, who are struggling with God. abortion. Not I don't want them to make that God. choice. We know that everybody's the truth is a creation of God, but, not but what I would do God. is I'd talk to them on a relational level, like, hey, do you, do you disagree with me? Do you agree with me? Where is your perspective coming from? Because obviously there's truth, there's statistics, but... Listen, if you want to have a one-on-one conversation with someone, I have no problem with that. But the Bible says to preach the gospel to every creature. Yes, for sure. That's what we're doing. So if you're going to tell me that I'm doing it wrong or my methodology is wrong or ineffective, you know, these things I hear from professing Christians all the time, I'm not going to buy it because it's not based upon the scripture. Your objection to what I'm doing is based upon the scripture. It's based upon your feelings. And upon other people's feelings. But I'm not going to exalt your feelings. Yeah, about those feelings about scripture. God's word is what I'm holding to. I, I'm going to count to God, not to your feelings. Yes, I, I totally agree with that. I think a lot of Christians, they dilute the gospel, they dilute the truth because they want to bring people in. And I don't, I don't agree with that. But I do think, especially on a college campus, having relationships is the most important thing. So you, you think God says in his word, preach the gospel to every creature except on college campus? No, 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 no. Preach it. Oh, okay. I agree with that. That you turn from your sin and what? turn to God through Jesus Christ. I don't, I don't know if they're necessarily going to have an open... Relationship well, that's their choice. I'm not here to have a relationship with them. If I was to tell me to have a relationship with people, tell me to go and preach the gospel to them. So so you don't say like go into all the world and have relationship with people. Okay. Right? It, it, it say does, that. Well, it does say love God and love others. But how do you love others? How did Jesus love others? With truth and love. I mean, with Jesus in the well. You use the word the love to define love, love, though. Okay, love I'm, is patient, the, love is kind. Love sure, is, but we're, we're, we're not talking about that. We're talking about methodology now. Right, right. So you're trying to, it seems like you're trying to say my methodology is not loving. And that your methodology is loving. Prove that to me from Scripture. From I, I see John the Baptist doing what I right. do. I see Jesus doing what I'm doing. I see the apostles doing what I do. I see all the Old Testament prophets doing what I do. Are you telling me they're not loving? No, no. I'm saying, okay, okay. for the example, uh, Jesus, what you're saying. Human, uh, uh, the woman at the well, uh -huh. a known prostitute. No, she wasn't a prostitute. She uh, was an unknown adulterer, okay. right? Right. Okay. Sleeping with lots of different men. Uh -huh. uh, she was also Samarian, right? 
Samaritan. Uh -huh. Samaritan. Sorry, I'm uh, still learning the okay. little. You're doing. What I do what know is that Jesus met her at the well, and he didn't at first say, "You're going to hell." He first okay. said. Okay, but she was humble though. So right. I mean, I don't, I don't go to exactly. people just tell them they're going to hell. Right. But people, if people are humble, I'm gonna give them grace and give them sure. mercy right. and give them the cross. Mm -hmm. But if someone's not humble, which is most people. I give them the judgment and wrath of God, the law of God. Right. And hopefully they will humble themselves and then I can give them grace, like the Bible says. Mm -hmm. you know, God opposes the proud and God gives grace to the humble. Right. And so we can't take one example, like the woman at the well or even the woman caught in adultery in John 8 and say, that's the way we do it every time. If we don't do it that way every time, know, every then time. we're doing it wrong. I'm simply telling you, those are two examples. Mm -hmm. But how many examples do we have of just preaching to large crowds mm -hmm. and just preaching the Bible? Right. Not developing relationships with thousands of people at one time, but simply just preaching the Word of God to them mm -hmm. in a public place all the time. We see that way more often than one-on-one -on -one conversations. Mm -hmm. So if we're going to do it like that, I can simply quote those ones and say we shouldn't be doing the one-on-one -on -one conversations now. But it's not either or, it's both and. Right. I agree. I agree. Okay. So, so what I'm, you giving up holding signs was wrong. I'm going to tell you, shut up. You shouldn't have stopped doing that. Well, I okay? do hold up different signs. But there's nothing wrong with saying abortion is murder. That's true. Right. They are murderers. I hold up those signs. I go out for an abortion lesson and preach to people. We see people turn away from it mm -hmm. and have their child instead. Right. We said, but even if I never saw that, it wouldn't change my methodology because my methodology is biblical. Mm -hmm. And what I'm telling is the truth. And the Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Mm -hmm. So if I'm preaching the word of God, whether well, it's on my sign, coming out of my mouth, coming from a gospel track I have, or a, or a, or a sign I'm holding like that, that's, that's doing God's work. Right. It's doing God's will. And no matter how they respond, it doesn't change my methodology. I don't change what I do based upon how, what they think about it, what they say about it. Imagine if Jesus did that. They, the Pharisees yeah, hated agree. what he said. Right, for sure. I mean, but he, he still gave them the truth. Mm -hmm. In Matthew 23, he called them whitewashed tombs through with full of dead man's bones. Mm -hmm. He said that, that you travel over land to sea to make someone a convert, and you make him twice the son of hell that you are. I don't think they felt pretty good about that. I don't think he was developing a friendship with them, right? But he was telling them the truth because he loved them. So love is manifested in many ways, but to say love is only manifested in this one way, you have to develop a relationship with someone first. That's not biblical. Nowhere does the Bible teach that, nowhere does it model that. I respect that. Um, for me, the reason I held up those signs was a pride thing. Okay, well, if you had if you had issue with your motive, then you should deal with your motive, then go back to hold up the signs for the right motive. So what I do now is I say, there's hope and healing. Let me offer you some resources, and I say, you know this is wrong. I okay. tell them that. Just, just, you, you, you just can't, you can't, you can't treat them like they're a victim, though. Okay, because well, they I are. Think, they're, I think the women that undergo this are mostly pressured. No, no, they're the, they're the perpetrators of the crime. They are the only ones, according to our nation, who have the right to determine the fate of that child. Okay. It's not, honestly, I, I really do work with 40 Days for Life, Sidewalk Counseling for Life. The local are you working at Roman Catholics? No, I'm Protestant, non-denominational. You can check out my church. But I'm saying 40 Days of Life, that's, that's, that's Roman Catholic stuff. What do you mean? 40 Days for Life, that's Roman Catholic. No, they're not. They're non-denominational. I do, but I took a day off to come preach to you. Yeah, so... Um, so but, but with did, them, I, they have science and like studies talking about how uh, there's a law right now being pa passed that says like 72% of women who have abortions are coerced into this. And if you keep treating them as they are murderers, they understand that. But that's why we have post-abortive healing. That's why we have counseling. I can't tell you how many women okay. I personally talk so, to and they're like, they break down. And start you you said a lot of things there, but my, my point still remains. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to treat them like they're a victim. They are the ones that have the choice. And most of the women who have abortion, they do it for convenience alone. I agree. Not because agree. they want to have the baby and someone's forcing them to do it, as if someone can really force them to do it. I mean, maybe a teenager who got pregnant really young, their parents or, might be able to try to force them right. to do it. I agree. But that's, that's a very small percentage. And, you know, we're not slamming them, but we're simply telling them the truth. The truth is, that's a baby. Mm -hmm. You have no right to kill that child. And God, no matter what the circumstances were that surrounding the conception of that child, that is, that is not a mistake. That is not a, a sin. That child is not a sin. That child is creating God's image. God's knitting them together in your womb. And you have no authority, no right. No matter what America says, no matter what the Supreme Court says, you have no right, no authority to kill that child. So I'm not, I'm not going to back down from that because, uh, like, I, I've seen people do this. Like, I've seen that one girl who was a Roman Catholic who made the movie. She loves to treat women like they're victims. 
when they have an abortion. As if poor you, you're killing your baby. No, that's not the way it works. Now, after they've done it, they've gone through with it, they humble them, they see that, yeah, I'm gonna give them, like I said, I'm gonna give them grace because they're humbling themselves. I'm gonna help them I get what recover saying. from that. Your, your but we're talking about before they commit the crime, not after they commit the crime. Most women actually do it multiple times. And that's, I've had to learn, which is so upsetting. And what I've had to learn is that a lot of women, I, I have no idea what these people are going through. I have no idea. And if I just sit there and tell them, like, you're going to hell, you're going to hell, you're going to hell, which is true. But then I don't but who, grace, who, but who and But who does that? Who, who just who just tells them they're going to hell, they're going to hell, they're going to hell? Who does that? I don't, uh, I, I just, well, I don't know anyone who does that. that like, uh, they dress up in groomery for costumes. They have okay, well, there may be people, some people who do that, but I, I don't right. know what you're talking about. It, we, we give the good news and the bad news. We don't just tell them they're going to hell. We offer them forgiveness and reconciliation. We tell them that we were willing to help them. I've even told them I'm willing to take their child. Mm -hmm. I have eight children already. Right. Oh, I, but I told them I want to take their child. It'll right. stop them from killing their child. I will take their child personally. Right. And there's other places like the one we go to in southern Atlanta. There's a there's a mm -hmm. right like right down the two buildings over. There's a women's clinic there that actually will help them mm -hmm. financially, whatever it may be. There's resources there that'll help them. So yeah. we, it's not like we're just slamming them, but we're we're not gonna just because we preach the good news too. The good news supposes it good because there's bad news. Right, and, and right. the good news it's supposes that. they're not a victim, because mm -hmm. right. they're a victim that deserve my pity. Right, I get what you're saying. They deserve they deserve my pity, not my like you're going to hell. But God says they're going to hell, mm -hmm. and if they're not going to hell, then they have no reason for redemption. Yeah, I I completely agree. I think, and this kind of goes back to your signs and like the the thing on your shirt says risk of fire. That kind of goes back to hell without redemption i think that's when people first see that's all they well, see and they don't understand the perspective that you're coming from. so you're telling me because someone misunderstands or misconstrues right. what i'm doing i shouldn't do it no i'm saying you should do it in a different way no so that's, you, you keep saying that but what you what do you only thing you've told me so far is to have relationship with them okay but but when a bible talks about preaching the gospel it doesn't say go into all the world to have relationship with them first there's no example of that no command to do that okay and so I'm going to preach the whole counsel of God. Now, you pointed out one thing on my shirt. You didn't point out everything else, though. Well, that's just the thing that you can visually see because there's a strap there. Um, what the? Okay, so I have a strap on, but I have two sides of my sign. Okay, okay. I didn't see the other side. That's okay. fair. Right. I'm, not saying, I'm not saying you're wrong. And I, I honestly, more people should be on fire like you guys and be out here preaching and not watering down the gospel. I totally agree with okay. that. I am saying but, maybe as I, I am a college student. And if I wasn't a believer, I would not stop. Okay, so, so let me ask you this. If you think there's more people should be doing what I'm doing, and what I'm doing is biblical, shouldn't your approach instead be to encourage me instead of criticize me? No, I'm not trying to, oh, I'm not criticizing you saying I, I don't hate, I hate what you're doing. I'm just saying, well, from my I didn't say you said you hated it. I don't think that's a very good way. And we should be upholding each other and criticizing when we might have disagreements. That's what we should do as brothers and sisters in Christ. We should unify and try to get better. And maybe there's a different strategy. Okay, okay, well, there's, nothing, um, nothing, there's nothing you said, though, going back to it once again, your criticism of what I'm doing, nothing you've said has been based upon Scripture. You've given your advice, you've given your opinion, you've given feelings, but you haven't given me any Scripture to tell me I shouldn't be doing what I'm doing. And I've given you many examples and Scripture. You gave me Scripture that tells me I shouldn't be doing this? I gave you Scripture that says, like, maybe you should look at another perspective. That's all I'm trying to say. What Scripture was that? I was talking to him about Jesus talking to the woman at the well. Right, um, we talked about that, though. Being stoned. We talked about that, though, right? What we, love is. Love is patient. Love is kind. Okay, but we... we enduring. Okay, so you're saying this is not loving? Well, I feel like this is just going in a cycle now. It is because I think I think we've already gone through all those things, and, right. you're, and you're bringing them back up again like we didn't go through them. We talked about the woman to woman that you talked about, woman at the well, woman caught in adultery, and those are two examples. But there's many other examples of just preaching to thousands of people, mm -hmm. not developing any relationship with them, right? And, and it's basically doing exactly what I'm doing. And so, but but on that basis, for you to say I shouldn't be doing this or should think of a different way, you would have to have been in Jesus' time telling him the same thing. No, 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 no. I'm not saying that talking in front of people is wrong. When you're talking in front of a large group of people, that's what about the awesome content of the message? Though? What about the content? The of The content message? should be the Bible. And my only critique is that you guys, the sign, the other side, especially, and the, the fire says, 
there's hell, but there's not redemption. As long as you have both... It doesn't say there's hell and not redemption. Right, I know. I'm just telling you the perspective. I'm trying to just get you to understand, when people walk by, I am a Christian, I want to do the same thing you're doing, but the perspective is not what you're trying to do. It's getting the message is getting lost because the bad news I don't, is overshadowed. I don't think I don't think you know that. I don't think you know what people's perspective is. Well, honestly, I had friends telling me I should go talk to you guys. Like I had other Christians saying, "Man, I really wish they would just do it a different way." Like I really appreciate what they're doing. Okay, so so once again, let's talk about it again. Once again, what we're doing is biblical. Mm -hmm. Period. If it's biblical, your criticism falls on deaf ears because mm -hmm. I am beholden to the Word of God. I'll be judged by God, not by your feelings, right. not by any other professional Christian's feelings, not by any of your friends' feelings. I'm judged by God. Mm -hmm. And so if, if you can show me, once again, from the Scripture, that what I'm doing is wrong or I shouldn't be doing it this way or it's ineffective, I want to listen. But you have not shown that yet. You have not shown that yet. You've not given me any inkling of that. And I've been, I mean, I've been a follower of Jesus Christ for 24 years now. Right. I've been doing this for 17 years. Mm -hmm. So I've heard these, I've heard these objections before. It's nothing new to me to right, hear these right, things. Right, yeah. So it, it also seems kind of funny for you. You came up here and I'm you're just trying to understand your perspective. I'm not trying to change your mind or like argue with you. I'm trying to be like, well, this is my perspective. This is what I'm thinking. And I, I'm, okay. I'm going to go look at scripture. I'm going to go look at this and yeah. think about this and pray about this. You know, maybe I am wrong, but I do want to hear your perspective and I want you to hear mine too. Yeah, I've, I've, I've heard, I'm willing to hear it again, but I've heard it a hundred times, thousands of times, actually, mm -hmm. over the last 17 years. And so it's, it's nothing new to me. Mm -hmm. not, I'm, I'm not willing to hear it again. I'm just simply telling you that your perspective that you're bringing to me is not based upon Scripture. Mine is, so I'm going to keep on doing it the same way I'm doing it. No matter what people think, no matter how they misconstrue it, you know, people could have walked by and heard Jesus only say this, Brood of vipers! Oh, I wish he would have done it a different way. They could have walked by right here. He was flipping over tables in temple courts. I wish he would have done it a different way. He had a whip of cords in his hand and was flipping over tables, driving out animals that were there to be sold to people who were coming there to right. offer sacrifices. People could have said to him, I wish he'd do it a different way. But he's just doing what the Father told him to do. Sounds like you're on it. It sounds like you're still and so it doesn't matter to me what people think of me. I don't really care about what people think of me. I mean, I'm, 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 I've crucified with Christ. Longer I who live, Christ lives in me. I take up my cross daily. I deny myself daily. And so it's not about me. It's not about my name or about what people think of me. It's about the Word of God. And I'm going to give them the bad news, and I'm going to give them the good news. I'm going to give them both of them, Lord willing, to the day I die. I respect that, for yeah. sure. All right. Well, uh, I don't know what that club is doing. It sounds like you right now that is a mystic club, and a lot of people are actually seeing your sign and talking to the mystic club. As I was walking up here, they were like, don't pay attention to them. Do you guys meditate? Do you guys... Pray, so and then they have like a whole bunch of mystic totally books. Lost, like that's that's what's going on right there. Like that, that doesn't bother me. I mean, I'll talk to them too. Yeah, I mean, I I encourage you to talk to them. Um, that's just God's mercy. I'm just thinking about it because I'm trying not to like speak to you. I appreciate talking to you, and I will definitely. How often are y'all out here? Probably about three times a semester. Oh, okay, you guys don't come out here every single week. Oh no 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 no! I, I travel all over the place in, in Georgia and Alabama and Florida. Is this like a church sponsored? No, it's not a church sponsor. I'm a pastor, but okay. I, I don't I don't have a I don't have a salary. I'm like that. I I work for a living just like anybody else. And okay. Make an income to provide for my family. I do this on my own time, so does he, and so does he. We all we all have jobs. Okay. We all love Jesus and love the lost, so we we're compelled to go out and do something and say something. Right. Okay. Well, it was nice to meet you. Okay. What's your name? Kerrigan. I'm Riley. Hi, Riley. Good to meet you. Okay. you too. Every person I've ever talked to, my brother's right. sister. And then I started realizing that the power of the Lord. Hey, man. How's it going? I get your opinion. It's valid. Just anybody else. I'm sure mine. Well, it's God's word, in my opinion. Well, it looks like a lot of bullshit to me, man. Well, if you call God's word right. that, it's on you. Hey, you know, God's word is one thing, but the way you're using it is wrong. And That's not know, true. That's not true. Yeah, it is. You no, it can use it to support any cause. What? You, you can use it to support any cause. Any like what? Claim. What cause am I supporting in my Man, I'm just saying, you don't need to be out here stirring up stuff like you do every year. I'm sure you got better things to do with your time, unless this is just what a lot of conservative dollars are going towards. 
Well, number one, I'm not a conservative. That's okay. a false accusation on your part. That is. That, that's no, no, number two, I'm not here to stir people up. Mm -hmm. That's number two. Number three, I come out here and for the glory of God, to please Him and to obey Him, preaching the whole counsel of God, the bad news and the good news. And so I'm going to continue to do that no matter what you think, no matter no, what you say, I, I no matter what else thinks or says. I mean, that's the you good can thing about being in America. You can falsely accuse me. You can falsely assume things about mm -hmm. me if you want to. That's on you. I have to answer to God for that. But I'm here blaming us before God. Hey, and there's nothing, nothing wrong with that, man. But I was just letting you know my piece. The Bible says that God commands all men everywhere to repent. Because there's coming a day in which God will judge the world in righteousness. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that he shall also reap. If you sow to please the flesh through sin, 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 the Bible says you're going to reap destruction in the end. But if you sow to please the Spirit through repentance of sin, childlike, humble faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and obedience to Him, the Bible says you will reap eternal life in the end. The Bible says, do not be deceived. Do you not know the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't deceive yourself. If you're living an unrighteous life, God makes it clear, the Bible makes it clear that you're on your way to hell. Turn from your sins. God does not take the light in the death of the wicked, but rather that they turn and live. God does not desire to give you what you deserve for your sins. God's desire towards you is to give you what you don't deserve for your sins. His grace, His mercy, His forgiveness that He offers to you through the blood-stained cross of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is your only hope. The only hope for sinners is the Lord Jesus Christ. You have no hope in your sin. There's no hope in continuing and your sin, there's no hope in your religious actions, activities. They will not forgive you. They will not cleanse you. They will not make you right with God. You're only made right with God through the blood of Jesus Christ. He said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the light. No man comes to the Father but by me. How's it going, man? Good, how are you Good doing? to see you. You a senior now? Uh, junior. Okay. Yes, sir, I got one more year. All right. Y'all doing good? Then? Yeah. Good to see you, man. Jesus Christ said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. The Bible said there's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved besides Jesus Christ. And the Father has given Jesus the name above every name. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Is he the Lord of your life? Have you submitted your life to Jesus Christ? Have you become born again of the Holy Spirit? Are you, are you made right with God? The scripture says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. All the old things have passed away. Behold, all has become new. That's the promise Jesus Christ offers to every sinner. He says, come to me. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He said, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, 
and you will find rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. See, Jesus Christ wants you to come to him. He died for you on the cross. For when we were still without strength and due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So the Bible says, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his ways, the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, and he will have mercy on him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. It's all the wicked world has. False accusations, stupid signs. It's all the wicked world has. It's all they have. They can't reason things out. They can't be logical. They can't talk about things properly without lying and misrepresenting somebody. It's all they have. It's got to tell you something about their arguments. It's got to tell you something about their position when they lie about It's called a ad hominem attack. It's called a straw man argument. That's what they do. So they can't reason things out because they don't love God with their mind. The Bible says, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's what Jesus Christ said. That's the greatest commandment. But when you have a debased and depraved mind given over to sin, there's no, no telling what will come out of such a life like that. You know, Jesus Christ said, either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for a tree is known by its fruit. And then Jesus said this, how can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, brings forth good things. An evil man, out of the evil treasure, brings forth evil things. And then Jesus said this, and I say unto you, that for every idle word men may speak, they'll give account of it in the day of judgment. For by your words you shall be justified, and by your words you shall be condemned. You can mock, you can scoff now, you can make fun of now. There'll be no mocking and scoffing on judgment day, sinners. No making fun of God's word and his judgment on judgment day. That's you standing before God. And the Bible says the eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch over the evil and the good. The Bible says eyes are on the ways of men. He sees all their steps. There is no darkness nor shadow of death where the workers of iniquity may hide themselves. Can't hide your sin from God. God's going to bring your sin into judgment. Cast it away from you now while you still can. Give up your sin now while you still can. Turn to Jesus Christ now while you still can. You may not have another chance. You may not have another opportunity to get right with God. The Bible says your life is but a vapor that appears for a little time and then it vanishes away. The Bible says, see then that you walk carefully, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. And the days are just going to get more and more wicked as lawlessness abounds and the love of most grows cold. If your love is growing cold towards God, towards people, it's a sure sign 
You're one of the people that is talking about in Matthew 24. But Jesus said the two greatest commandments are to love your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. That's what Jesus Christ said. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. He who has my commandments and keeps them, and it's he who loves me. He who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. So in order to love God, you must obey God. You can't love God and be a sinner at the same time. It's impossible to love God and be a sinner. It's impossible to love Jesus Christ and be a drunkard. It's impossible to love Jesus Christ and be a fornicator. It's impossible to love Jesus Christ and be a homosexual. It's impossible. Don't deceive yourself. It's impossible to love Jesus Christ and be non-binary. God is binary. God made Adam and Eve. God is binary. If you're non-binary, you're an enemy of God. You're an enemy of God. You're deceiving yourself. You're deluding yourself. Are you coming out right now? No, I'm bind. I'm a male. He's binding. He's binding. He's binding. He's binding. <laughs> you're binding your trans? I just had a full conversation. I'm going to hold You guys really funny to lie about people like that? Mason. It's funny to lie about people like that? Real funny, man. Fuck yeah. The Bible says every liar shall have his part in the lake of fire. But the Bible says. Far. You won't be saying far on Judgment Day, sinner. I'll be saying that. God calls you to repent this while you still can. Though like, all the sinners join hand in hand and give themselves high fives, it will not change God. It will not change God. God's will will not change. God's word will not change. God himself changes not. God changes not. His judgments remain. His judgments remain. God's going to judge your thoughts, your words, your deeds. He's going to bring the judgment. In fact, the Bible says he'll judge the secret things, the things that no one else knows about, the things you hide from others, the things you are ashamed of. God will judge those things too. I think you're ashamed to be a party, bro. That's why God has no, sinner. I never even considered being a sodomite. Never will. It's too perverted for me. It's for perversion. Man with man, woman with woman is shameful. It's vile. It's an abomination before God. You need to repent of your filthy, perverted ways. Give your life to Jesus Christ. He will change you. He will cleanse you. He'll make you what you ought to be. Instead of being a pervert, you can become clean before God. God can clean you up. He can make you a new creature in Christ. You can, you can become born again. Be saved. Be full of the Holy Spirit. Be cleansed from the inside out. The Bible says that God is a God of order. A God is not a God of confusion but a God of order. There's confusion in your life. It does not come from Jesus Christ. Bro, you're making people not want If there's confusion in your life, it doesn't come from God. It comes from your sin. It comes from the devil. But the devil comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But Jesus Christ came to give you life and life abundantly. Jesus offers you life. They don't belong here. Jesus don't Christ go offers you your, his mercy. They don't go here. They're just material girls. <laughs> Turn to Jesus Christ. Turn to Jesus Christ and live. The Bible says, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. 
Cleanse your hands, you sinner. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourself in the sight of God and he will lift you up. God loves humility. God opposes pride. God opposes your pride. God opposes your proud. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before the fall. Your pride will be your downfall. But God is calling you to humble yourself. Turn from your sin. Turn to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the only way, the only truth, the only light. You can follow these perverted mockers to hell or follow Jesus Christ to his kingdom. You can follow perverted mockers to hell or you can follow Jesus Christ to his kingdom. There is no other way but Jesus Christ. He's the name of every name, the name by which every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. The Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. You're hearing the Word of God. Mix it with faith. Mix, it, mix the Word of God with faith. Believe the Gospel. Repent. The Bible says in Isaiah 1, Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they're red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you are willing and obedient, see, God is willing to cleanse you of your sins. God is willing to pardon you of your sins. But you got to repent. You got to give up your sins. You know, Jesus Christ said, go and sin no more. There'll be no freak show on Judgment Day, sinners. Be no mockery on Judgment Day. The Bible says the Son of Man will send out his angels and will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and those who practice lawlessness and will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. But Jesus Christ said, Who is Jesus Christ? Oh, yeah. All sexual perverts will end up in hell. Yeah. All sodomites, all sodomites, all lesbians, all homosexuals, as well as heterosexual fornicators, porn watchers, lustful people. The Bible says they will not inherit God's kingdom. It's like, what if I want to have sex with Lord, Jesus Christ said this. If you look upon a woman to lust after her, you've already committed adultery in your heart with that woman. He said, if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. For it's more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. For it's more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. If your right foot causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. For it's more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. The Bible makes it clear. Get rid of your sin. Your sin will be your ruin. 
Your sin will cost you your soul. You'll sit, your sin will earn you a place in the everlasting lake of fire. You understand that? But Jesus Christ came to give you life. Jesus Christ came to offer you life. You It's all fun and games in front of your friends, but on Judgment Day when you're by yourself, it won't be funny any longer. Won't be funny on Judgment Day, sinner. You won't be laughing and mocking and scoffing before God. The God of the universe is going to condemn you to hell if you don't repent. He offers you life through Jesus Christ. He offers you life, offers you forgiveness of sin, offers you salvation through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. He's the only way. You mock and scoff the only way you have of forgiveness of sins. You mock and scoff to your own demise. That's what you do. God will laugh at you in derision on Judgment Day. In Proverbs 1, it says, Because you hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord, you have none of my counsel and despised my every rebuke. Therefore, you shall eat the fruit of your own way and be filled to the full with your own fancies. There's a generation that curses its father and does not bless its mother. A generation that is pure in its own eyes, it is not washed from its filthiness. That's this generation to a T. Do you think you're right? Do you think you're pure in your own eyes? But God sees you as wicked. He sees you in truth. God sees you in truth. And God will not change his mind. You can make up a God to suit your sin if you want to. But he's a figment of your own imagination. Your God cannot save you. The only God that saves is the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the only one who saves. No other God can save you. The God of the Bible offers only one way, and that's Jesus Christ. He's the only way. If you try to come another way, you're a thief and a robber. If you try to come another way, you're deceiving yourself, deluding yourself to your own demise. You know better. You know better than to be a sinner. You know better than to be a drunkard and a fornicator, a liar and a thief. God is calling you to repentance today. God is calling you to faith today. God is calling you to obedience and holiness to God today. You can continue if you want in your sin. But it's going to be your demise in the end. The Bible says the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. Don't deceive yourself. You continue down this path. All is left for you is the anger and wrath of God. Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long suffering? Do you despise the goodness of God that should lead you to repentance? But in accordance with your hardness and your unrepentant heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in a day of wrath and the revelation of the righteous judgment of God who will render to each one according to his deeds. Eternal life to those who by patient continuance and doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality. But to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish on every soul of man who does evil. But the Bible teaches Oh, I 
Sexual perverts are not heroes. We are heroes. Yeah. Sexual perverts. Woo! Maybe to the I devil you're a hero. The real sexual perverts, rape, uh, rapists and pedophiles. Including you. I Lesbians, homosexuals, sodomites, I'm transgender, non-binary. Y'all fit in the same, y'all going to the same hell. Y'all going to the same hell. You're not going to know anyone in hell, you can be by yourself. You can be by yourself in a solitary confinement in hell. No party in hell. No hanging out with your friends. No, there's no party in Hell Center. No hanging out with your friends. No getting drunk. No getting high. No, no sodomizing your boyfriend. Have you tried for No sodomizing your boyfriend. White cloth, all that. No making signs in hell. Your sign's gonna burn up with you. Walking in your sin is the truth. What kind of sin do you think I'm doing? I don't know. You're, you're against the truth. I'm not against the truth. What about this? We just have our own truth. There's tons of truths. No, you're wrong, Zinner. There's only one truth. Are there a lot of rapists out here? Are there a lot of pedophiles out here right now? Again? No, I see, I see sexual perverts. We're allowed to be here. We have no priests on this table. That's why you should work on your side. Okay. Okay. Yeah, it's so, so original. So original. So original. Pucker up, Buttercup. Bring it in. You're a liar. I don't make a penny off YouTube. I don't make a penny off YouTube, Center. You're a liar. Get a job then, dog. I have a job, Center. You ain't getting paid for this. Are you getting paid for this? No. No. Go get a job. Go get a job. Go get a job. Why are you here? Go get a job. Go get. I already have an education. Go get a job. What is your job? Go get a job. Why are you here? Go get a job. You must not have a job if you're here holding a sign, right? So go get a job. Go get a job, right? Because you're holding a sign, you must not have a job. So go get a job. 
I'm getting a call. I already wore your pants. That's my job. I'm not doing you any good. I just, I just took over. <laughs> you want to go do some good, go do some music here here. You know, the ones homeless, really like the homeless, it. maybe some food or something. So it would be a better way to <laughs> You're so self righteous. Actually, there's nothing better I can do with my time than preach the word of God. Nothing better I can do with my time. I don't care what you say, Senator. How are you changing, Mason? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually not a saint. Shame on you. You heard the truth, you rejected it. Shame on you. Eat the fruit of your own ways, man. You got to reap what you sow. Judgment is coming. <laughs> upon, upon sinners. Upon sinners, that's right. You, you, mock, you mock your own demise, sinner. You mock your own demise. You mock your own demise. These types of people, because of rapists and pedophiles who come on the highway and take girls. But see, if you're not concerned with that, because you don't have police at night. But this is our concern right now, not this. Yeah, my concern is you're a soul, sinner. You don't go to hell forever. What do you think my soul is? What do you think I'm doing? You're on your way to hell. You're a sinner. What, what have I done? I have you're, I done? you're virtue signaling right now. Yeah. Then you're fucking not. <laughs> like, dude, this is the OG virtue signal. You are not. Like, this this is virtue signal. Y'all do this every month. I only do this because I go to school here. Good for you. This is not you feel unsafe right now? I mean, yes. <laughs> then walk away. Then walk away. Yeah, walk away. Because usually, usually people who feel unsafe around something, us. they don't want to be around them. I'm not close to you. A bunch of drama queens, that's all you are. I had a gun in my hand and I wanted to kill you, you wouldn't be sitting there. Are you saying you have a gun? Nope. Okay, do not say you have a gun. I didn't say that, sinner. Stop twisting my words. I said if I had a gun and I wanted to kill you, you wouldn't feel safe. That's not a safe. I'm just saying, I'm, I'm destroying. I'm, de I'm destroying your logic that you don't feel safe. I've had people pull guns on me. So have I. I you know, you know, the least safe I've ever felt in my life is when I was a sinner. On my way to hell. Under the judgment and wrath of God. You shouldn't feel safe. You have no safe place on this earth as a sinner. Because God sees it all. God's going to judge you for your sin. You are not safe in your sin. You are not safe in your sin. You're on your way to hell. God Almighty sees your sin. He's going to judge you for your sin and sends you to hell. That don't make him go away. That doesn't make him go away because you don't believe in him. Oh, I don't believe in this grass. It makes him go, oh, look, it went away. I don't believe in that tree. Oh, look, it went away. It disappeared. The tree disappeared because I don't believe in the tree. Oh, oh, that building. I don't believe in Carmichael Student Center. It disappeared. Look what happened. That's the logic you have because you don't believe in God. He disappears and goes away. God is still there, and God's still going to judge you. It's so true, Bessie. Although, I have a question. Oh, don't answer the question, then. That's fine. She didn't ask the question. How can I answer if you haven't asked it? He's not mad, baby. He's not mad. No one's mad here, Senator. I just want to give you a little kiss. But anyway, I was going to ask you. I reject your perversion. I reject your sexual perversion. I said sexual perversion. Open your ears and listen. I reject your sexual perversion. That's filthy. That's wicked, man. You want to see the picture? You're so nasty. Shit, that's what Dominic did. What's wrong with you? Why are you such a pervert? What, what are you? What are you feeding your mind all day to th even think stuff like that? How depraved are you? How depraved are you? That's all you're thinking about is sex. You're depraved. You're depraved. You're sexually perverted and depraved. That's perverted. That's really perverted. That's really perverted. Are we gonna kiss? You're like the sexual tension. If anybody has this fear. Disgusting. I have no attraction to sexual perverts. Of sexual perversion right here. And you're mad at rapists. It starts in the mind like this, right? You probably look at pornography all day. Watching pornography, homosexuality, sexual Actually, I don't watch pornography. All these things. I didn't say you did. You just said I'm just li listing it. I'm listing it as sexual perversion. Do you actually believe this? Believe what? 
I believe that you're on your way to hell if you don't turn. She believes that. Yeah, because I used to be. I used to be with you guys. And you're mocking now, but you won't be mocking in that day, young man. I grew, I grew up in the church. I, was I used to be stuck in the SBA. <laughs> okay. Well, they're they're a cult, so they're a cult. Woe well, unto those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. The Bible makes it clear. You continue in your sin, God's going to mock and laugh at you in derision. God's going to mock you. He's going to laugh at your demise. You continue in your sin. Get up in hell. Need to repent while you still can't. Give up your sins while you still have time. No excuse on that. Don't get what you deserve for your sins. Rather give your life to Jesus Christ and get what you don't deserve. His mercy, his grace, his kindness. That's what he offers you. Jesus Christ of fire. Fire. I can't yeah, hear. Oh man. Oh, the doctor, the gospel. Hurt, hurt feelings. your feelings. Oh, man. Oh, feelings are gonna get hurt. I'm feeling. This is the. I did this last, but I didn't have an exam. I only got one more. I can waste all day. The gospel of feelings. There's so many of you here today who have an idolatry of feelings. You care more about each other's feelings than about what God says, than about God's truth, than about what God commands you to do. How the fuck do you think you're going to bring anyone to God by holding up a sign like that? With your filthy mouth. That's how. You're not a Christian. With your potty mouth. No way. Thank you for your good example. Thank you for your good example. Thank you for your rebuke, hypocrite. No, that's how you, that's how you talk Thanks to Thanks for your rebuke, hypocrite. That's how you talk to him. It hasn't done you any good, sinner. It hasn't done you any good. You're a hypocrite. You're a filthy mouth. Absolutely. Hasn't done you any good, hypocrite. Hasn't done you any good, hypocrite. Stop naming the name of Jesus and walking as a sinner. How about you repent of your sins? How about you live a holy life? How about you obey God, hypocrite? That's what Christians do. That's the problem Bro, with even fake Christians, Christians right don't there. Even like you. He's not a Christian. He's a fake. He's a fraud. You call yourself a Christian and live in sin? You're a fake. You're a fraud. God calls you to obey him. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. That's what Jesus Christ said. If you follow the word of God and read the Bible and understand the word of God. If you love Jesus Christ, you obey Jesus Christ. If you know God, you'll know he commands you to be holy. He said, be holy as I am holy. The Bible says in 1 Peter 1, as obedient children, not conforming yourself to your former lust, as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, so you also be holy in all your conduct, for it is written, be holy, for I am holy. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, now by this, we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He who says I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. See, a true Christian repents, follows Jesus Christ, obeys Jesus Christ. The fakes, the frauds, the hypocrites, the counterfeits continue in sin and call on the name of Jesus. But he will say to them, I never knew you. He will say to them, I do not know you. But if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. All the old things that passed away, behold, all has become new. That's what a Christian is. Someone is born again, walking in newness of life. And if you claim to be a Christian, you're ashamed of his word. Shame on you. Shame on you. You'll be ashamed of his coming too. Jesus Christ said, if you want to come after me, if you want to come after me, you must deny yourself, 
and take up your cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake in the gospel shall save it. And what shall profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? What will a man give in exchange for his soul? And then Jesus Christ said this, if you are ashamed of me and my words, this adulterous and sinful generation of you, the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angel. I've talked to so many professing Christians today who are ashamed of God's word. They're ashamed to stand up for God's word. They care more about feeling and they fear man over God. But the fear of man is a snare. The fear of man is a snare. Whatever trust in the Lord shall be safe. The Bible says, fear God and keep his commandments. For this is man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. Going to bring it all into judgment. You're not ready. You're not ready. Unless you repent of your sin. Unless you're in Christ, you're not ready. He's the only way, the only truth, the only life. Jesus Christ. These sinners are seed snatchers. Seed snatchers. The Bible talks about the seed of the gospel being sown and it hits hard ground and the devil comes and snatches the seed, takes it away. Absolutely. Uh, don't give them what they want. Don't Sexual pervert. Didn't you cheat on your wife, dog? Sexual pervert. Didn't you cheat on your wife? Sorry. No, go ahead, bro. Go for it. That was a Yeah, you broke a pinky, dog. What the hell is this? What is this? What is that cross being around your neck, man? It's a piece of jewelry. Why are you wearing it, though? Because I bought it. Okay. You know who died on that cross for you, man? A lot of people died on a lot of crosses. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah, Jesus. Right. Yeah. That's a symbol of what he did for you. Well, you know, it could be, but it could be a symbol of a lot of things. Symbols mean different things to different people. So you're stealing the symbol of Jesus Christ dying from the cross and makes it different. Well, that's the thing, right? Symbols are universal. You ain't gonna get anywhere, my man. They dumb as shit. You look at his shit. Well, I'm just, I just wanna see where this goes. Go get it, So symbols are universal, right? No. Sure. No. No. Everybody knows the cross means Jesus Christ. What he did for you on the cross. Everybody well, the knows cross that. You can deceive Christ. it, you can you can twist it, whatever you wanna do. You can say it's a nice piece of jewelry on your neck. Listen, man, that cross, someone died on, for you on that cross. Unless you trust in him and turn to him, unless you trust in Jesus Christ, the one who died for you on the cross, and turn from your sins and follow him and obey him, you have no life. You have damnation in the end, man. Yes and no. No, yes. So, if it's true, have you ever heard of the Pascal's way? Hey, do you pay for your wife to get cuffed, or do you just like seeing her get fucked by other dudes? <laughs> you sexual pervert. You're a sexual pervert. You're a pervert. You're a pervert. Get fucked. You're a pervert. Because of what comes out of their mouth. Pascal's way. Of course I have. That's sort of what I'm going to Okay, so if I'm wrong, I'm fine. If you're wrong, you're going to hell. I just gave it to you. If I'm right about what I just said, Jesus dying for you on the cross and him being the only of salvation, then you're going to hell. If you're right, I'm fine. Assuming I don't believe in Jesus. Well, you don't believe him, it's obvious. The way you're acting, you know it's by its fruit. You know, so you don't have to be dogmatic to believe in Jesus. Says so. Says the Bible. Where does the Bible say that? I mean, it's a, it's a long book. Have you ever? All right, so, so it's a, in other words, translation. I don't have a verse. I made it up in my head. Of course not. It's a big book. Yeah. Who's gonna read well, if it's it a big book, then get up, get out your smartphone. You have it right now. Do a Google search. So do an iPhone search, whatever you kind of search sure. you do, and search for 
Where does the Bible say you don't have to be dogmatic? But, but who's to say that Bible's everything, right? God, God, Jesus, Jesus God says that. Well, Jesus was a real person, correct? Of course he was. Exactly. So that Bible is a big book, but that book isn't big enough to talk about everything that Jesus did. Well, it even said that in the book itself. It says it in John, says John, the last chapter of John, it in. says if everything that he did was recorded, there God. wouldn't be enough books to record it all. Exactly. So what you just said is actually in the Bible. Exactly. So it's a big, you know, it, the Bible doesn't document everything. I didn't say it did. Exactly. No, I, I'm, just, I'm just stating that as more of a matter of fact. You continue walking in it. So, who's to say there can't be a Bible too, or a deleted scenes of the God? God. Where God's will is that you turn the Bible mm -hmm. Well, that wouldn't make any sense. That's contradictory. No, it's not. You could have a deleted scenes of the Bible where it's like the post scene of the Last Supper and after Jesus washes their feet, all the apostles. Why don't, why don't you just stop being, stop being vague and ambiguous and tell me what Gnostic book you're talking about? It's not a book. I'm just saying there could be a deleted scenes of the Bible where God's having an orgy but there isn't. with the apostles. But there isn't. That's that's perverted, man. Why would you even say that's perverted? No, it's correct. That's you perverted. Have a sense of humor, man. Stand for all this. I'm definitely team. Amen. Amen. If you gotta have a sense of humor. It's not you funny. Can't laugh about you won't be laughing before God, man. With that kind of perversion, sure. don't be laughing before sure God. Sure, you man. can laugh before God. God has a sense of humor. Not at your perversion. Well, you He's know. angry at your perversion. He hates your perversion. He's gonna send you to hell for your perversion. No, he doesn't. Sure, he does. Where, where does the Bible say that? God is not mine. He assumes it. Where, where, where do you get that idea from that God forgives all sins? The Bible. Nowhere is that found in the Bible. Sure it is. No, it isn't. You're deceiving yourself. You're deceiving yourself. I disagree. You're lying to yourself. You're deluding yourself. You're going to have to hell. I disagree. Well, you don't have to. It doesn't matter if you disagree. Truth is truth. Here is that ugly ass the Lord, and that's why you love sin. If you feared the Lord and loved Jesus, you would have hated sin and No, you're a mocker, man. But that's not the case for a majority of people we come across. When God commands all men everywhere to repent, because there's coming a day where, John, where God will judge the world. And if you're not with Christ, then you're his enemy. If you're a homosexual, if you're a fornicator, if you're a pedophile, if you're, if you're a sexual pervert, if you're a porn watcher, if you're a liar, a thief, a blasphemer, a danger, that's just a few sins the Bible lists. Then you're not right with God. And God wants you to be right with Him. And so it says in John chapter 3, this is exactly what happened. You're already condemned in your sin because this is the condemnation that's in the world. That life, Christ, Jesus Christ is coming to the world. And men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. For everyone that doeth evil hates the light and does not come to the light. Read the whole verse. The whole context. Read it all. Don't judge me then, bro. Okay, then you're a hypocrite. I am saved. <laughs> the only way to be saved in the eyes of the Lord is to do it by day seven. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'll go to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I didn't even do it. It's all right. Hey, man. Amen. Hey, I was wondering, you know, man, I'm a born again Christian. I was saved two years ago. A lot of people will profess Christ and I'll share different gospels. So I want to come to you directly and ask, like, what are you guys preaching? Are you a Calvinist? Yes. Okay, I figured that. I'm a non-Calvinist. Okay. I'm really like an anti-Calvinist. Okay. I don't believe any of the letters of Tulip. At one point in time, I was a partial Calvinist, but I started reading the Bible without my Calvinist glasses on. Came to knowledge of the truth. Now I reject Calvinism completely. I reject the definitions I use of sovereignty, of dead, of what is free will. Of What's that? I don't, I don't know personally the definition of Calvinism. What it, what it is well, it's typically defined by the acronym TULIP. Okay. Which was which was created by not Calvin himself, but his followers, Theodore Vazor, his son-in-law, and the people who came after him, 
at the remonstrance. And they were responding to the five points of the Arminians. I'm not an Arminian either. Um, TULIP stands for T, stands for total depravity or inability. U stands for unconditional election, reprobation. L stands for limited slash definite atonement. E stands for grace. And P stands for perseverance or preservation of the saints. So do, you, do you disagree with certain points of TULIP? Or is it All of it. All of it. All of it. So because there's you don't no perseverance in Christ. Go when you die we're not the totally center. depraved before Christ. Like is it? That's well, why we come out here. See, to total depravity, depravity and ability is really what it's, it's talking about. So I believe that when I was a sinner, I was wicked. His blood yeah. would wash away but I, I didn't lack but ability to respond to the gospel. Unless the Bible never teaches that. Um, well, what do you go with Ephesians 2 that says we're dead, dead in the trespasses? But see, that's why I said a second ago, I don't, I don't agree with your definition of dead. Okay. You think dead means you can't do anything, you can't respond to the gospel. But that's not what it says in Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2 is talking about their character, the way they were living their life. And it talks about how they were dead. But it doesn't mean you can't respond. And people oftentimes respond, they, they will say, well, let's talk about Lazarus. How, how could he respond? He was dead. That's physical death. Yeah, we're talking about spiritual death. Spiritual death. Okay, so yeah, spiritual death is we're spiritual. talking about uh, the good best example I can find in scripture is the prodigal son. He was alive. Right. He was dead. And he was alive again. So him being dead is I mean he can't respond to his. He can hear his father appealing to him to come back. Yeah. He could he could understand that even a servant in his father's house has it better than he has it in a pig slot, right? Yeah, so well, when if you as you continue to read Ephesians 2, it also tells you the way of salvation, God being rich in mercy. You know, we, we're saved by grace through faith, and this okay. is not of your own doing; it is a gift of God. So what, I don't want to. Well, hold, 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 what's what's but well, what's not of your own doing? What's what's not of your own doing? The grace. You didn't do it yourself. It no, that's not. Uh, you're 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 saying the faith is not of your own doing, but the Greek does not say that. The Greek says the grace is not of your is not of your own doing. I agree with that. The grace that God offers me through his son, so we're saved him, him by dying. grace through you, faith. What are you going to have? I just want to get a picture. Are you gonna have not right a second. So we're saved by grace through faith, and then there's a comma, and this is not of your own doing. So I believe that the grace. salvation itself is not by your own doing. Okay, I, I, I've, I've studied Calvinism. I have the whole channel, refutingcalvinism.com on YouTube. No, I have, we'll yeah. have this grace, but, but what I wanted to come and ask you is, Regardless, what are you? What's the gospel? But if you, if you're going to be like Charles Spurgeon and say Calvinism is the gospel, then we're not going to agree. Calvinism is not the gospel. I'm not, I'm not going to necessarily say that, but I just okay. want to get the message. So, I, so you guys let me tell you what I don't believe. I don't believe that God sovereignly chose everybody from eternity past to be saved or not. Okay, I don't believe that. That's true. I, I don't I don't believe that God only died for Jesus only died for some people. They died for the whole world. I don't believe that. God forces people to come to him irresistibly and they have to be born again before they'll have faith. I don't believe in any of that stuff, okay? What I do believe is that God calls all men everywhere to repent for this coming a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness. And I believe if we have a humble childlike faith after hearing the word, because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, we hear the word of God preached and we have humble childlike, come to him like a child and we repent, he receives us. He cleanses our heart, cleanses our mind, cleanses our conscience, gives us His Holy Spirit. We become born again. All things become new. Behold, all things are passed away. And I would believe the same thing. Repent and put your faith and trust in Jesus. And then you live a holy life. Yeah. You obey God. Yeah. You're not sinning every single day. Can I, can I ask you one quick question? Yeah. But, but, well, hold on. Just no, one no, second. No, no. So I believe that those people aren't going to go to heaven because they are sinners and they're not in Christ. But I also believe that God can save a homosexual. Of course He, he can. can save, but when they do repent and put their faith in Jesus. Of course. So I've, I've seen people with this sign, and I'm not saying this so is you, you guys. you won't be a sinner you guys, anymore. There's people who will have this sign, and they will not preach sinners. the grace. They will not preach the name of the escape. No, we got you need both. to be preaching the full gospel. That, the full yes, counsel of God. Yes, yes. The goodness and severity of God. That's what I wanted to come That's and ask you. Yeah, of course you guys, we do that. Okay. Of course. Yeah. But here's, here's the thing, though. If, 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 a, if, uh, if people are here, and they're prideful, boastful, God opposes the proud, right? And gives grace to the humble. humble. So if they're full of pride and full of rejoicing over their sin, yeah, let's go fornicate. Well, then I'm going to give them wrath and judgment and tell them about the, the anger of God. If they humble themselves, I'm going to give them the grace and mercy and kindness of God. I would, I would go to Romans so we see in the scripture. I would go to Romans 1.16. For the gospel is the power of salvation. We need to be preaching 
the judgment. We need to prove the holiness and righteousness of God, but also the grace of God that God the Father would send His Son Jesus to live that righteous sure, sure. and perfect life. No, no, I don't believe that. But last part you said. But anyway, and to die on the cross for their sins. That's right. That I believe that. But but the, but the whole thing of transferring righteousness and sin. That's not that's not Bible. You don't believe God that, gives us our righteousness? No, 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 no. We we are we are cleansed of our sins. Okay. Purified of our sins, and then He calls us to live righteous life in His power. So the cleansing comes before, and then we come to faith. Is that what you believe? No. no. I repent of my sins. I said it, I'll say it again. I know, I know how Calvinists twist these things, man. So I'm just trying. I'm not saying you're trying to. I'm just simply telling you. I don't believe regeneration precedes faith and repentance. Okay. Repentance and faith precede regeneration. God responds to our response to His Word. So we, we hear the gospel. It yep. comes by hearing. Hearing by the word of God, we hear the truth of the gospel. We respond to that in childlike faith and repentance. And he responds to that by giving us his Holy Spirit. We're regenerated, we're changed, become new creatures in Christ. What the Bible teaches. We, we both agree that it's okay. only the gospel that saves. Okay, but, but my, my point, second, I wasn't saying that I would preach those the bad news and not preach the good news at all. Okay. I'm simply telling you what I would focus on. The majority of my message, if they're full of pride, I'm not giving them grace. But if, if they're humble, I'm not going to preach much about the anger and wrath of God and judgment of God. And that's what you see all throughout the scriptures. The woman at the well is humble. He doesn't talk about hell. So, yeah. He mentions her sin a little bit, but I'm talking about hell. Yeah. Right? The woman caught in adultery. He doesn't mention hell there either. Right? But he's talking to the Pharisees, full of pride. Hell, judgment, sin. So we're on the mountain, he's preaching to a pl plethora, thousands of people. He's talking about sin and judgment and hell and talking about the mercy of God. You need both. That's what I'm saying. You That's need to exactly giving, right. You need to tell people that they're against a righteous and a holy God on judgment day. And if they don't put their faith and trust in Jesus, they're going to pay for their sins in hell. But you also need to say God is loving that he sent his son to pay that punishment on the cross and to live that life that they can't live. They cannot live a righteous life without Christ. Okay, so are, we are, can agree with that. So right? are, you, are you saying that we're not doing that? No, I'm oh, asking okay, you. Okay. That's why I no, came no, to No, no, definitely, talk to you definitely doing both. Okay. But I'm simply telling you that if the focus from them is pride, the focus from me is going to be the bad news. Sinners are going to be prideful, man. And, and even us Christians sometimes. Well, no, 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 no. Not, not, but we I, need to be giving the I, whole I think, I th I'm trying to help you understand that. I, I don't think you're getting it, though. So if the crowd is mostly puffed up in pride, I'm not saying they can't, everyone can't be prideful, but if they're puffed up in pride, I'm going to give them the bad news more than the good news. And so I'm not going to give them the good news at all. But if they're humble and contrite and broken over their sins, I'm giving them the good news mostly. That's what you see all throughout Scripture. That's the pattern you see. Law to the proud, grace to the humble. Can I say something really quick? Yeah. A lot of the stuff you got up here, I was that. Yeah. At one point. So was I. That was me. Yeah, so was I. Go two years back, that was me. Um, and I used to see stuff like this, and it would always, I had the reaction of pride, right? I would see stuff like this, and I would get very angry. I'd get angry at God, take a step back. I had no desire to read the Bible, no desire to go to Bible study, none of that stuff. Um, and a good buddy of mine who was a, uh, uh, he's a missionary. Um, I started grabbing lunch with him, and he heard what I was saying, and I saw his ability to understand the sin. Not to agree with it, not to say that you're going to heaven or anything like that. He, he told me, look, I understand everything you're saying, and I love you, but as of right now, you are going to hell because of these decisions, right? And I was like, you know, that's fair. And him loving, empathizing, understanding, you know, loving me through all of that is what got me back to God in the end. Okay, but listen, we, we, don't, we don't take experiences and determine what we do by experiences of other people. We do what we do because it's biblical. That's it. Okay, so I don't interpret the Bible in light of my experience. I interpret my experience in light of the Bible. Sure. That's the proper and way to do it. I, I and, and, and so I, I'm, just, I'm just simply saying to you that just because the Lord used your friend in that way and you got anger at people that you say are like me for a while, I don't know what they, who they were, but you're saying that doesn't mean that I'm doing wrong and I should be doing things the way your friend is doing. That's all I'm saying. I'm not saying you're okay. doing anything. I'm, I'm about to leave. I'm just going to say one more yep. thing. And just preach the, I just want to encourage you, man, because you need to preach the full gospel and know that we're not doing the saving. God does the saving. The gospel alone is the power of salvation. And thank you for taking time to talk to Okay. Me. Just one last word. Yeah. I am doing that. Okay. I don't feel like I can save anybody. God doesn't save you. Yeah. Well, Who's God saves, but they have to repent. They have to repent. They have to respond to the message properly. Because God's not forcing it upon them. 
like yeah. We'll have disagreements, but yeah. Yeah, I'll be talking about yeah. Do you think this is bringing anyone to Jesus? That's what I'm trying to, that's what I'm getting at. Well, that's, I just responded like to that, it, though. It I thought that's where you were going. That's why I responded to that it that way. That is where I was going. So that, that's why I responded to it that way. So if, if what I'm doing is biblical, that's my primary concern. Okay. Not not uh, pragmatism, not uh, people call it effectiveness, but am I biblical? That's it. And if I'm biblical, I'm doing it for the glory of God primarily, first and foremost. Do I want sinners to be saved? Yes. But I'm not going to compromise my message or my methodology in order to appease a sinner who's got their feelings hurt. That's simple. Okay? So Jesus, John 7, 7, this is what he said about himself. The whole world hates me because I testify of it that its works are evil. Sure. Okay? So we think, let's just take some pragmatism to that, that statement. Well, Jesus... If you're the cause of the world's hatred toward you because you're testifying to them that they're evil, stop testifying that they're evil, and they'll stop hating you. But he didn't do that. He kept on doing that. Yeah. So he then went and had dinner with these people and loved on them. Who are you talking about? He had dinner with sinners and prostitutes. And okay, so, okay, so Jesus did not have dinner with prostitutes, number one. Okay, I don't have a problem with that, but that never says that in the Bible. And Mary Magdalene wasn't a prostitute either. I know that's probably coming next. But the fact is... He was having dinner with sinners. Tax but what was, the, what was the context of having dinner? Because you can just say that. I'm to not, share the news. I, to share the truth with them. So yes. I'm, not, I'm not opposed to having dinner with somebody who's a sinner. Nothing I've said here or done here no, no, shows that. Right. Okay, so, so I'm not opposed to people doing that. I'm not opposed to myself doing that. I'm not opposed to, to what he gave, talked about his friend earlier, what he shared with him one-on-one. -on -one. I do those things as well. But the primary method that God commands us to do and to employ is to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Not go into all the world and make friends. Not go into the world and have a relationship for six months, then tell them the truth. You go into all the world and preach the gospel. The, the preaching of the gospel is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved is the power of God to salvation. And he quoted half of that a little bit ago. And so, the guy, not you, the guy was standing here. <laughs> but so, so when, it, when, it, when it comes to these things, I'm not doing it for their praise or for their friendship or for their approval or for anyone else's approval for that matter, including professing Christians. I'm doing it for the approval of God. And I've been doing this for seven, seven, over 17 years now. I've been a Christian for almost 25 years. And I've heard these, these objections a thousand times. I just think when, when signs like this are being held up, they see hate, they don't see love. You know? Well, and, well if, they, if they want to see something that, other than what it is, that's not my fault. That's just the state of mind that they're in. Right but, but listen, if, 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 you, if, you, go on a, if you go on the, on the highway, right? You go on I-75. I, I, I you see a sign for Chewy's, the Mexican restaurant. It says, come in here and get a good burrito. And they say, well, I see hate in that. Should Chewy's take the sign down? Should Chewy's adjust their, their marketing terms because someone doesn't like it? I don't think so. I know this is love. God knows this is love. Just because they think it's hate does not mean it's not, it's not love. Let me ask you, he said that he wasn't a sinner. Is that your belief as well? Well, I was a sinner, and so was he. But we live for Jesus Christ now. You're forgiven by his grace. You forgiven? No. I obey God. It doesn't mean I can't sin. I don't have the ability to sin. I'm not tempted to sin. It means I'm obeying God. That's what a Christian should be doing, so obeying God. you've been a Christian for 25 years? Almost 25 years Almost now. 25. You haven't sinned in 25 years? No, I didn't say that. I just told you a second ago that Christians can sin. Right. They're tempted to sin. I'm trying to understand your theology. Okay, so I'll just sum up to you like this, okay? I got saved almost, well, this June will be 25 years, okay? So in the last 25 years, almost, I've been tempted hundreds of thousands of times, probably, yeah. right? I've given it a sin, I've given temptation to have sin, to my own shame. Every time I did that, I didn't have to do it. No one made me do it. I could have overcome sin every single time. And above that, if I would have continued in it, and died in that state, I would have went to hell. So there's no rules that are different for me than for somebody else. Yeah, rules aren't different for me than anybody else. You're saying if you believe in Jesus and he forgave you, but you continued in your sin, then Jesus' sacrifice is not I am, I am, I am. That's exactly right. God, God's, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ is only available to those who repent, put their faith in him, and persevere to the end. But that's your that's your opinion. You haven't proven that. No, but, but that's you can walk away like that if you want to. But you haven't proven that. You didn't bring one Bible verse to play. But that is that is true. That, yeah, the grace of God is not available to you unless you're repenting and you're pursuing that path. The that grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. That's what I believe. 
And the reason I'm talking to you, it's more it's more about the approach. I don't I don't disagree with anything you're saying. Yeah. That's, you know, that's just where I'm at. That I, I I believe in the um, and obviously it's hard to do in this specific setting with being on campus and not having personal relations with any of the people that, that you're preaching this to. Yeah. Um, I, I believe in the you know trying to understand showing that, that God 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 trumps all of that. All of the stuff I'm preaching. God God trumps all of that. If you give if you give yourself to him, you know. And you repent. What's the other side of science says? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. I, yeah. So it's got to be both sides, not, not just one. I just think it's, you know, and it's, I, I know how you feel about it because you, you made the example about the Chewies and the, and, the, and the sign with that and everything, but I just think the approach being taken is more likely to make people not want to open a Bible ever. Well, that, that, that's straight pragmatism. That's all it is. I mean, you're, you're, making, you're making assumptions um, because people will get angry about it. I'm well, making assumptions based on personal experience. Okay, but you regret deeply. But, but your experience is not everybody else's experience. And are you saying your experience was the right experience? No. Are, are you saying that because you got angry at people supposedly like me, that that means that what I'm doing is wrong? You were a sinner at the time, right? Do I take the opinion or the feelings of a sinner above God's word? Of course not. I can never do that. Well, it does kind of seem like that. I mean, in a roundabout kind of way, it sounds like you're telling me that. So I'm just simply telling you. When I, when I go out to the open air to preach, and I'm praying and meditating upon His Word and studying His Word and comparing apologetically, I never once think, I wonder how people respond, and if they do respond a certain way, I should probably make this change. I never think that. And God never leads me in prayer to think that either. Never once. Do I care about them? Of course I do. But I'm not going to give in to their false definitions of love, their false definitions of hate, their feelings being trumping God's word. I'm not going to give in to the fear of man or the fear of God. I have to tell them the truth, no matter what they think about me, no matter how they care about me. If they hate me, they mock me, they scoff me, they crucify me. I'm still going to keep on doing what I'm doing. That's the cross we're called to carry as Christians. So right, so that's, that's, my, that's my point. So I'm not going to change because of they, what they say. That their feelings are not based upon even upon the word of God. I don't, I'm just saying, don't you think there's an approach that, like, uh, similar to what, um, I forget his name, Chase, but Chase was saying earlier, there's, a, there's an approach that, that shares the hope as well as, well as the, uh, the judgment. I'm doing both. I don't know why you, why we'd even say I'm doing both. I don't I don't have that answer. Well, uh, they're doing like uh, they're doing this. Yeah. God tells us that we should preach His word. They're doing that, even though they have these signs. Yeah, but they're going to be ignorant to it. People, some people will accept it, some will not. That's that's free will. God gave us free will to accept Christ or not. Absolutely. And people don't understand that. We, God tells us, like I said, to preach His word. That's what they're doing. And some people, like I said, are ignorant, and some people will accept. Here's one thing I don't understand. I, you know, I go, I've preached like 130 different college campuses now in the last 17 years, okay? And most times, not all the time, but most times, professional Christians, they come up to me, they mostly have criticism and judgment and how you're doing it wrong. And most of them, they're not doing it themselves. I like my way of doing it wrong than not doing it at all. And number two, you have sodomites and sexual perverts holding up their wicked, perverted signs that God hates, and they won't say a word to them. They'll say a word to the preacher. In fact, the only time a lot of them will stand up for their faith is when the preacher comes. And, and comes out here, it takes two hours of time to drive here. Take out my whole day. I could be making money, working, spending time with my family, resting at home. I take my whole time to come here and preach to these students. They mock me, they scoff me, they criticize me. And then the professional Christian will be on my side. They come and criticize me and join with them. That's what I don't understand. I don't get that at all. I would think that a man of God does this which is very rare in our day and age, that he'd be encouraged, he'd be supported, he'd be prayed for, not criticized because of my supposed approach being wrong, which is based upon the scripture. And every time I, I talk, I've talked to four people today about the same thing. And every time I give them scripture, 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 example, 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 of people doing exactly what I'm doing, and they still want to hold on to feelings, pragmatism, they're not, they don't like you, you're making them mad. But where does the Bible tell me to hold on to those things? I'm not saying, look, as Christians, we do have to make people mad. We're called to share the word. I, I, I don't, I'm not, okay, I'm sorry, I'm not trying to judge her. 
I'm judge, uh, will come over here and put you down for what you're trying to do. I'm, I'm trying to just have a mature discussion about an approach that, you know, doesn't necessarily come across the way that it's coming across. I don't I don't mind the discussion. Yeah. There's no problem with that. I have discussions all the time, thousands of times a year. And I it's even more so for me to understand. Okay, yes. so, but, but what I would say is this. What I would expect at a Christians at a college campus, at the least, if they don't like what I'm doing, okay, so be it. You don't like my doctrine, like Chase doesn't like my, he's a Calvinist, so be it. Go follow up with these people who are hearing the truth and say, well, what do you think about what he said? You don't have to agree with me. You don't have to align yourself with me, but share the gospel with them. That's a good point. They need the truth, man. I'm only going to be here three times this semester, three days. And what do you have, four months? You guys are here every single day. Say something, do something, man. If you don't think I'm doing it wrong, do it the right way then, according to you. You're right. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. That's a good point. I haven't thought about it that way. So. I mean, this young man over there, I can't remember his name. He's got kind of like the long hair, little scraggly goatee right there. I've talked to him almost every time I've been here. We've had discussions like this before. We don't really talk very much anymore. He, he knows where I'm at. I know where he's at. But look, he's over there sharing the gospel with somebody. That's what I desire. Even Chase, who's a Calvinist, so I think his gospel is false. He's over there sharing with somebody. You know? So that's what that's what I would encourage you to do, young man. I mean, I don't like I said, I don't mind having these conversations. I don't take it personally. I'm not offended or anything like that. I'm simply just telling you, it's, it's, it's just baffling to me. Then I go from place to place, traveling around, doing this, taking my time to do this, my money to do this. I'm not getting paid to do this. I don't make money on YouTube. Yeah. Yeah, people who accuse me of that earlier, I don't make money on that stuff. Um, I do this, it, it makes more sense to me that if a Christian would open their eyes and see the truth and just be more supportive. That's all I'm saying. I appreciate you taking the time to talk. Um, yeah. I, I really do appreciate what you're doing. Um, even if I, even even though I don't have a full approach yeah. that, would, that would differ from it, um, yeah. I, I do I do. What you doing. So, yeah. I, I What's your name? Andrew. Andrew Kerrigan. Kerrigan. Give me your Andrew. Camera. Camera. Nice to meet you. Thank you for doing your job. Hey, you're welcome, Camera. God bless you. Uh, my friend, you can you can hop in on this conversation too if you like. I don't know whether you were listening. No, I wasn't listening. Oh yeah, we're we're talking about bridge building. Uh, bridge building. Yeah, just just the approach. Okay, well, I mean, I don't see bridge building in the scripture. I see just tearing down bridges between him and the Pharisees in Matthew 23. So if you tear down a bridge, how can they walk? Oh. Actually, just about that. That's what he did. So John the Baptist did what the apostles did, what the prophets did. They all tore down bridges. Like, according to the way you're saying bridges, I'm saying. Hypothetical. Yeah, they, they tore them down because they just preached the truth. They let, let the truth fall where it may. They were sowing seeds. They don't determine the ground. If it falls on the sidewalk, the seed's not going to take root. Rocky sound, rocky ground here for a while, thorny ground for a while, but good soil. We don't determine the, the state of the soil. We determine the state of the seed, the quality of the seed. And if the quality of the seed we're sowing is good, the soil of their hearts is not something I can determine. not a pedophile. So it's not about, that's all pragmatism. That's all like, that's like Joel Osteen stuff, man. Joel Osteen. Joel, Joel Osteen. Joel, I don't know him, I don't know him. Joel Osteen is one of the most popular, you can't even really call him a preacher in the whole world. He's a pastor in Houston. There's like 50,000 people listen to him every Sunday. He, he, his, his church building is the former Houston Rockets stadium. Really? Yeah. That's, that's not, it's not biblical, that's just pure pragmatism. The Bible is not pragmatic. The Bible is simply truthful. And the Bible says that, that the, the preaching of the gospel is foolishness. Not just the gospel itself, but the actual preaching of it is foolishness. So if God has chosen this primary method of seeing people saved is by someone yelling, for all practical purposes, yelling in a public place to a bunch of people, why would he do it that way? It seems foolish. Even to the natural man, I mean, I think even as a Christian, I think about it, it sounds kind of foolish. But it's because he requires humility. And so it requires humility to stand here and listen to a man in public preaching his word. It takes humility to listen to it with a humble heart. It takes humility to actually consider it, to believe it, to obey it. And that's what God's looking for. He's looking for humble people, people who have humble, childlike faith. This is a fascinating thing that I, I really I really like. So I, I mentioned my friend here. I'm by that William. Do you so? Uh, I'm a growing Christian. Okay. I, I um, spent my time in the Marine Corps and okay. didn't do much in, in terms of going to church. Now I'm starting to try to change that. Okay. And the conversation I just had with you there was amazing. That's I 100% agree with that. Being humble and then approaching Christ in that way. Yeah. Uh, 
and the approachability of that was 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 amazing. That makes me want to go to church. But the issue that I have, and I'm sure you've heard this often, is of course, you know, the methodology in which you guys are reaching out. And I was just telling you, Christian. I'm just telling Christian a horrible thing we gotta say to him. Is that I, I'm worried that, but don't worry. That, the, that the message essentially that you guys are doing only creates antagonistic emotion. And with okay. antagonistic emotion, okay. you only breed more antagonistic emotion. Okay, well, that's not, it's definitely not true that it only does that. Some people do that, but like I said a second ago, going back to my analogy, the biblical analogy that is, of sowing seeds. You know, just get one example, Jesus Christ. King of kings, Lord of lords, best preacher there ever was, right? Okay. John 7, 7, he said this about himself. The whole world hates me. The whole world hates me. If I testify of it, that its works are evil. Now, William, the whole world doesn't hate me. Okay, so I'm doing a little bit better than Jesus from the natural perspective, right? So if you're going to criticize people not liking me, my method, because people don't like me, you're going to have to go back 2,000 years and criticize Jesus, too. And John the Baptist for calling the Pharisees a brood of vipers. They probably didn't feel real good about that. That probably didn't build bridges. That probably didn't make them want to go to church. You know what I mean? And when Jesus called the Pharisees a brood, a brood, a, not a brood of vipers, but a, a whitewashed tombs full of dead man's bones. And told them when they made converts, they made them twice the son of hell they were. That's not building bridges, man. See, the, the things you're talking about, they're not from the scripture. I understand why you're saying it, but it's not from the scripture. I understand. And so my, the basis of everything I do ministry-wise is God's word. Yeah. My, my message, my methodology, my apologetics, it's all from God's Word. Man, have you seen, uh, have you seen that show? By the way, if you haven't watched it, you should watch this show. It's an app you can download. It's called Chosen. Yeah, I've seen it. I love it, man. I mean, it's, I it's, it's okay. I mean... I love it. Because, like, all right, well, for me, for me, it's like, it's like a, uh, it's kind of like a human. It, like, almost, like, you know, it's like you, you read historical figures, you know, like Abraham Lincoln and Washington, and, like, you, you, you think of them in that context. And, like, yeah. Jesus and his apostles, for example, like, you think of these historical contexts, but, like, that show almost makes them, almost makes them human-like. It's like they're right there. Yeah. That's what I like. Uh, and what you just said made me think about it, like... Oh, it was, it was the first episode, it was the first episode, I don't, I don't want to yell at you, yeah. uh, it was the first episode, it was, it was when Jesus like introduces himself and, and he introduces himself to, to this woman. It wasn't, it wasn't Mary, it was Mary, it was, what was it Mary, what was her name? Still learning. It's, it's, uh, the girl, she was, uh, possessed by many, many demons. That's Mary Magdalene. Okay, yeah, and yeah. he, and he basically just like, boom, yeah. you're gone, yeah. you know. That is amazing. So, the, the question, alright, hold on, now I'm getting excited. It's like, the, the question that I'm, that I'm getting towards is like, contextually speaking, Jesus, from my understanding, I don't know much. Yeah, okay. I don't know much. Okay. Uh, Jesus went out to the individuals that were hurting, the outcast of society, you know, like the tax collector and, and things of that nature. Yeah. And, and basically brought them in. His versions of the outcast of society versus our versions of what would be considered the, the outcast of Christian society today. Do you think, do you think mm, that as Christians we're, we're doing a good job in the representation of that? Well, I can't speak for everybody else, but I think I am. Really? Yeah. In, in what ways? Well, I'm, I'm preaching the gospel to them. Right. That's how they get saved. I'm off from the grace, of, the grace and mercy of God. Yeah. Once they understand why they need it. And you think, under, okay, so you're talking about the understanding of why they need it is the most important Part well, that's the most important the part. That's cornerstone. Or? Well, the Bible doesn't say go into all the world and build friendships, and build relationships. It's go into all the world and preach the gospel. Mm -hmm. That's what I do. I preach the gospel. I'm not opposed to having a friendship with someone who's an unbeliever, but typically speaking, the way that works is if I tell them the truth and they don't want to hear it, they're not going to hang around me anymore. If you do like it, if you want to hear it, they keep on hearing it, they're going to get repentant and get saved. So they're no longer an unbeliever. Yeah. And Jesus is the same way. Every relationship he had with unbelievers is based upon the truth. He wasn't coddling them in their sin. And he wasn't uh, withholding the truth from them and waiting for a, a period of time before he shared with them. Every relationship he had with unbelievers is based upon truth. That's what I try to do. So I have a relationship with unbeliever. I want them to know where I stand, where they stand. 
that's what I, I, I'm, I'm required to do that. Otherwise, let's say I, I decide, decide I'm going to have a little friendship evangelism going on. I'm going to build a relationship with someone for a couple months before I actually share the truth with them. What happens they die before I do? I'm responsible for that. Their you know, blood's on my hands because I didn't have the boldness and the courage to get over my fears and my decision to do this unbiblical thing of building a relationship with them, and I didn't tell them the truth. You know, so it's every relationship I have should be built upon the truth, whether it's a family member or a stranger. Mm-hmm. Someone I go to the gym and play basketball with. Yeah. You know, it's the yeah. same thing. Yeah. So I'm always trying to spread the truth because faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. You have to be saved by grace through faith. They need faith. But in order to have faith, they need to hear the word of God. Mm. In order to hear the word of God, they need a preacher. That's you and me. We're the preachers. Because mm. we, we claim to have eternal life. How dare we hold it back from someone who needs it so desperately? Yeah. And we got off for it too much. Yeah. I love it. You're, you're, you're so convicted, man. I love that. I love that. You know, and that's that's something that I'm coming to learn, too, is, you know, is in fact, of addressing the fact that there is God, there is Jesus, died for our sins, which is immense to think about because he died for everybody's sins, right? You know, fathoming that is insane. And then, of course, you know, knowing the fact that, you know, having the opportunity of eternity is just an amazing thing. Yeah, I, I, I personally like to envision it as, like, uh, I don't know, I, I go up there, if I'm so lucky, and him and I just, I don't know, just have, like, a pathway, and we just kind of walk and talk, you know? that's, that's how I kind of like it. But, um... Well, he wants to talk to you now. Yeah, I know, man, I'm working, I'm working on it. I'm working on it. You got to get... You got to, as a young believer, here's some advice that I can give you. I've been doing this for 25, I've been Christian for 25, almost 25 years now. Make sure you set a time each day to spend time in private, personal prayer. Yeah. Okay. Make sure you set time each day to spend time in the Word. Make sure you're part of a good, solid, biblical church. Make sure you're sharing your faith. Make sure you worship God in song. I mean, if you do these things, these are these are the means by which you will grow. These are the tools that God uses if you take use of them yourself to to continue to keep you to continue on the path to God's kingdom. Hmm. That you don't depart from the faith and go back to your sins and become a wicked person again. Now, those are the means that God uses for those things. So that's 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 the best advice I can give you is to make sure you're doing those things. You're in word. You're in the pra- in prayer. You're going to church. You're sharing the gospel. You're worshiping God. If you do these things, things will go well for you. See, man, I'm all about it. Like that, that message to me is is amazing. If I were to sit down in a chair and talk with you, dude, 90% of what we're talking about, me, I I just. You know, I, I can't bring myself to agree with the overall message. You know, I I, I was telling Christian, um, just a super perfect name, that you know, I, I was in the military, right? Uh, I like it. So was I. Dude, you know, the funniest thing is like coming from the military back into this environment and realizing how much these kids are going and focus on emotion, right? That I think in terms of effectiveness, I'm not, I'm not going to criticize it. This, this is not the good stuff. It's okay. In terms of the future, if you want to hone this a little bit more, in terms of effectiveness, I've come to find that reaching out to them on that emotional level really, really gets them, really gets them involved and curious. And it's, it's not... It's not necessarily criticizing them in such a way. It's more of a possible, better way to do outreach. And it's just, it's like, whereas it used to be like facts, 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 here are the facts. And everybody's like, ah, oh, okay, I agree with that. It's no longer like that. These kids are like. So you're, you're saying that the Word of God is no longer relevant? No, I'm saying the Word of God is extremely relevant. And I'm essentially trying to pass on a way that... And you're in, in your updated and modified way. More effectively bring that word to them okay, in well, updated here, time. But here's the thing, though. I mean, you're, you're, so you're telling me that I need to update God's word to have better methodology, different methodology in order to get the truth to them. Not necessarily. Right, that's what I'm hearing. Uh, I need a better right to Okay. Okay, so God's word is God's word. You don't need to update God's word. Okay, well, what about, is, I'm not just the, the facts, though. I'm not just talking about just the facts. I'm talking about the methodology. The methodology, let's, let's, let's define methodology, is God's way of bringing about word was through apostleship, right? So sending his apostles to go out and speak to them. Well, God's way of bringing the truth to people was through preaching. 
preaching. Basically. Talk. Yeah, preaching. Yeah. Well, preaching is not just talking. What we're doing right now is talking. Yeah. What he's doing is preaching. What I was doing earlier was preaching. What's the difference? It means to proclaim loudly in a public place. It's a Greek word, caruso. It's what a, a herald would do. He would go ahead of his king into a city and say, the king oh, is coming. Preach. The king is coming. Okay. Prepare yourselves. Okay. John the Baptist was a herald of Jesus Christ's first coming. Yeah. Right? And so that's what it means to preach. I see. And so if, if, if you're trying to subtract that out of there and say, well, that's not as effective as it used to be. Times have changed. People have changed. Let's reach their emotions now. Facts are not enough. You're essentially updating God's Word. Because the primary method God uses and promotes is preaching. Yeah. Not that he's against witnessing one-to-one. -one. You know, I, I have gospel tracks I make, give the people, I give them a gospel track. You know, I, 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 there's all kinds of things I do. I witness online. So I don't have a problem with any of those things, but but to, to criticize, this this is the method, this is the interesting thing, William. If this is the method that's criticized more than anything else. You don't hear people getting criticized for passing out tracks or witnessing one-to-one -one, or maybe doing some charity events, going to a soup kitchen and, and, and you know, volunteering, mm -hmm. helping a lady across the street. None of that ever gets criticized. But the primary method, the method that God promotes more than anything else, preaching, always gets criticized. Yeah. You shouldn't do that. That's that's too rough. That's that's too harsh. You're gonna you're gonna turn people away. You're you're you're, you're not. They're gonna get angry at you. They're, they're never gonna go to church again. They're never gonna go to Bible study with you acting like that. That's what people say. But what does God say? What does God say? Like I said earlier, it takes humility. This is why God chooses, because God is looking for humble people. He's looking for prideful people. He's looking for humble people. And so he presents the message primarily with a preacher. And most people probably from pride. They get angry. They don't like it. They come against him. But I'm okay with that. I can handle it. Right? Not only that, look at people here, man. Look at look them standing around. Look at them. My friend Adam here has been dealing with them for like an hour now. Yeah. Most of them are, are opposed to him, but he still keeps on going. He's doing it in love, he's doing it in gentleness, he's doing it with patience, and they keep asking questions. How many of these people are gonna ask that questions on a church building? How many people are these? Would even go to a church building? You see, so they're hearing it from him. They're hearing yeah. it for him. One, one thing that I realized earlier, uh, regardless of everything that's happening, Close and, your name, man. I'm sorry, you're Mason. Right. Yeah. Um, I, I, I was talking to, I believe this, is his name Adam? Adam, right there. Adam, okay, perfect. I was talking to him and just said, I don't know that it's effective, really the tactics that you have. First, I led with, are y'all trying to bring people closer to Jesus? And he said, we're trying to share the truth. So, not necessarily. Uh, what I have realized is there's been a number of Christian pastor, pastor buyers that feel like they need to do work on y'all's part. Just because they feel like y'all are completely misrepresenting the, the importance of what is trying to be shared. Yeah, but Mason, here's the thing, though. Yes. It doesn't matter if someone calls himself a Christian or not. It doesn't matter what, what, what the source of the criticism is, Mason. If, if, if my basis of what I'm doing mm -hmm. is the Bible, and a professing Christian comes to me and says, I'm doing it wrong, I'm going to show them what the Bible says. If they can show me from the Bible that I'm doing something wrong, I'm going to repent. I'm going to do it right. I'm going to make some changes. Mm -hmm. Listen, I've been doing this for 17 years, man. Yeah. I've heard the same objection a thousand times. Yeah. Yeah. And it's always the same thing. And there's never any kind of Bible to back it up. And and I was talking to a young man earlier. He, he actually apologized. I was, I was very thankful for that. A professing Christian. I think he really is a Christian. And he was criticizing. And he you know, he, he said, you know, I, I, I should be supporting you. I shouldn't be criticizing you. Yeah. You have all these people here with these wicked signs, these filthy signs. It says nothing to them. He criticizes the preacher with a biblical sign. You're doing it wrong. He won't say anything to you, right? You're the lost one. I'm the one that's found. He won't say anything to you. He'll come to me, who takes two hours to drive here, two hours to drive back, my own money, my own time, my own effort, to come out here and preach the Word of God for no other reason but because I, I love God and love people, and they're going to criticize the preacher. That's, that doesn't make sense to me. So I, I had somebody that also loved God, and I was going to show you this. This is just... This. An example, and I, I was trying to give Mr. Adam like my two cents. It's not worth much, two cents. But yeah. um, have this here, and it's it's actually something that somebody gave me. It's a little painful. You can kind of look at it if you would like. Just about 
I'm, I'm assuming it's about different misconceptions. He said well, those are both true. I mean, just because a, a professing Christian, give, it's not saying everything is true. I mean, I mean there's, there's Christians who believe lies. Yeah, yeah, Christians right. who are deceived and who are wrong about things. I'm just saying. That's good. I, I, I'm going to take this and actually read it. You know what I'm Well, I have some things you can read, too. What's that? I have things you can read, too, if you want to read things. Yeah. Yeah. Here's a gospel track right here. I've been standing out here for almost two hours. I'm, I'm actually okay. okay. Um, I've been standing out here for almost two hours, and it's okay. Do, do all of you have that as well? We all have tracks. Okay. Um, definitely, definitely push that more because something that somebody can have as a reminder will, will help them like wonder. It, it'll, it'll be a uh, subconscious thought. Of, should I be doing this? Right? Should I? Should I? Is this something I should be doing? Especially if they have. I mean, I'm gonna have this, and it's probably gonna sit on my desk, and I, every time I look at it, I probably think about it, even if it's just for a second. Definitely, definitely be getting those ideas. Well, I do give them. I give them out by the thousands every year. I actually make make them myself, write them myself, and create them myself. Yeah, again, I've been out here for two hours and didn't know they existed, and have and have seen y'all out here before and didn't know they existed. That's, uh, well, well, we we've, we've given it out before, but we're not we're not sitting around. Get, we're we're here to to preach. Mm -hmm. and to minister. That's like more of a thing I give someone at the end of a conversation. Mm -hmm. If I see they're interested or someone's walking by, I'm not preaching, I'll hand them up to people. Mm -hmm. but I give out thousands of these every year. Yeah. I mean, I, I literally, I have an organization that makes them yeah. and millions of them have gone out. Millions. Okay. So, awesome. there's no disagreement there. Fascinating, man. Hey, uh, it was a pleasure talking to you. Okay. William, oh, there we go. Where did you serve? Army. Army. Or brag. Uh, I was I was the Marine Corps. Okay. Man. I was the Marine Corps. You just weren't ready to be a Marine yet. I won't hold it against him. I won't hold it against him. That's one way to look at it. You I see, guess. but this, uh, this, this is this is something that I love, Mason. And I'm, I'm glad you're here to see this. But is is this is the kind of conversation that needs to happen? Absolutely. And I, I can. I well, can, actually, William, well, it's not the only kind of conversation that needs to happen. Well, you know, all the contentious it's in ones, a, it's in all a the good ones right where direction, in my opinion. All, all the ones that are contentious. And there's reason and dialogue and people are angry and we're responding to them with the Bible, those need to happen too. I think we would probably disagree with that, but well, that's okay. Read that, the Bible then, that, man. That's okay. Read that's the Bible. Okay. Read the I'm Gospel. Read the Book of Acts. I'm working on it. Yeah. Just tell him, man. It. Bible and the Book of Acts. See, look at that. The Gospel and the Book of Acts, man. You'll see it over and over again. Um, Thanks, thanks for taking my questions. Yep. Yep. Uh, I, I'm going to go away from this saying, like, I agree with you, like, 90%, like, maybe 10% disagree. But, like, um, how long have been a Christian for? Oh, gosh, man. I grew up in a, in a Baptist church. Like, no, 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 I grew, 12, when did you become a Christian? 11, got baptized when I was 13. But when did you become a Christian? You know, I think it Born really again. truly happened when I went to boot camp. I was all right, so I was already in like indoctrination mode, you know, in the Marine Corps. And everything. Yeah. But truly, like, you know, I, I, I truly came to know God when I was broken down at the worst, you know, like really. And, and so when did you give your life to Jesus and become born again? That was that was in boot camp. Okay, how long ago was that? That was in boot camp, so that was 2015. Okay, was 2015. Yeah, so I, I got saved in the military as well. Yeah, it was 1997, June. I was in my barracks room by myself with Fort Bragg. I knew I was a sinner. I was on my way to hell. I knew I deserved it. I saw the great love of God at the cross through Jesus Christ. It compelled me to give my life to him. What life have been like pushed you into that? Well, there was no one thing. There was nothing. I knew I knew my sin, my drunkenness, my fornication, my lying, my fighting, my yeah, all the wickedness I was doing was not satisfying just to me. Just kind of came to terms. It was not satisfying to me. It was not pleasing. I mean, it was, it was pleasing to my flesh. I mean, I, I liked it. Don't get me wrong. I drank it like it was water in the desert. But it was, it wasn't doing me any good. And I knew I was on my way to hell for it. But I saw what Jesus did. And I was like, well, the only proper response to such love as that is to give him my whole life and love him back. Mm. And I did that that night in June 1997 in my bedroom. It has been completely different since then. Really? Everything, all that wickedness stopped. Stopped. I had to, I had friends who I had to basic training with, AIT training with, with the same base. I had to stop hanging out with them. They were going to drag me back into it. About six months, I was staying in my, my room, reading my Bible all the time. And then I was able to go to them in the midst of their drunken stupor in their barracks rooms. They had a, a hot hanger. They were branding themselves, giving themselves tattoos, and preached to them. Hmm. 
did you get through to them? Some of them, yes. Not everybody. I mean, I, I, even Jesus didn't get through to everybody. Yeah, He's the greatest preacher ever. Course, so, I mean, you know, we, I, all I can do is, is, is what I, God gives me the ability to do. And then, they, they decide for themselves whether they're going to do it or not. Yeah. I say, and this is, this is my, whole, my whole argument, is, as a couple people have realized. Um, you came to them, right? There's personal. What do you mean by that? Like, you, you initiated conversation. Right? With him? With uh, the people that were... In- well, I was already friends with him. Right, right. So there was no developing of a friendship or relationship. Tight knit with the boys. But, but you know, I, yeah. but they, they, it's not, I guess, yeah. Was the Septuagint translated out of Latin? No. What was the Hebrew? No, it's Hebrew. Hebrew, Hebrew to Greek. <laughs> yeah, so... You know, I, like I said, I'm not opposed to that kind of stuff, yeah. but the primary way, that's what we're doing right the now. primary method God, God promotes in the scripture is preaching. And everybody's opposed to it, but it's God's primary method. What does that tell you? Should I follow man, do what man says, or do what God says? Hey, brother, yeah. was that, that wasn't the Erasmus text, though, right? No, Erasmus was way longer. Was way, He's no, like 1500s. That's right. Okay. Yeah. yeah, so I mean, it, I understand people don't like it, they're opposed to it, that doesn't make a difference to me. I'm on God's side, I'm not on man's side. I mean, no offense to you, Mason, I'm on God's side, man. So I, I'm, I'm trying to do what God wants me to do, not what you want me to do. That's pretty good. And, and, and even Psalm 1-1, the first book of Psalms says, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. And so if you come to me, Mason, you're ungodly, and you give me counsel about how to preach, what I should do, and give me advice, I would cease to be blessed by God if I took your advice. Uh, I would argue that you also, I, I would argue that every single person is a person. No, I'm not ungodly. I used to be ungodly. I would argue that every single person is a Yeah, but here's the thing, Mason. I, I don't think that you live a... Maybe, maybe out here in this, in this setting, you are 100% you're doing exactly what God wants and expects of you. Yep. Um, no, no singular person is perfect. Like, you, you, well, what do you mean by that, though? Meaning that to say that I'm on God, that you are God. Uh, There's a separation, and I'm sure that separation is sick, correct? Yeah, so when the Bible talks about godliness or perfection okay there's two different definitions okay there's definition that only belongs to god it means god has never ever ever sinned period okay then there's the definition that god gives to man god calls men perfect in the bible noah job david the, the parents of john the baptist they're all called perfect by god okay and so the perfection that you're talking about we're talking about them is that they've repented of their sins had their sins washed away, and now they're obeying God. That's the only perfection I'm talking about. I, I make, a, I make, a, I pray every single day, yeah. and in that prayer, I ask for forgiveness. And okay, but here's the thing, Mason. If 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 you have a friend, who's your best friend? Who's your best friend? It's me. Yeah. What to say for for <laughs> for example, it, it's William. Okay, and you go to William and you go. Pam! Right in the face. Oh, oh, sorry, sorry, nice. sorry, 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 sorry. Well, you can't, you well, can't well, mess up the money maker, bro. Well, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, well, I'm, so, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, so, sorry, sorry, one. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, sorry, please forgive me, one. <laughs> and you keep doing it every day. Eventually, William, if he's smart enough, but realize you're not really sorry. And so you go to God and say, God, I'm sorry. Drunkenness. I don't know what you're saying. I'm just giving an example. Drunkenness, fornication, looking at pornography. Oh, I like that girl. She looks nice. And then, oh, God, I'm so sorry. And you keep doing it over and over again. You're in a sin, repent, repeat cycle. You're not really repenting. But you think you are. Because repent is... To turn away from it. Yeah, exactly. Turning the wrong Right. So God only, God only forgives those who truly repent. Yeah. So if you're working, say, okay, so... Say just for cursing, right? Yeah. Uh, you're doing it, so it's a bad, bad habit. Right? Yeah. I don't know what that's from. If you're making a conscious effort to curse, that is. That is. That is re- one anim- no. That no, it's not repenting. Repenting is not cursing less. It's not cursing altogether. Okay, so even when I was, if, even if it's not uh, a conscious effort. Because what do you mean I, by I that? Can, I can be in this conversation and I can look at you and say, you. Yeah. But I won't. Right. You just did actually. <laughs> it was a hypothetical. It was a, yeah, right, right. No, it was actually it was actually literal. You did it. Okay. Well, I could look at him and say, "Fuck you." Yeah. And at that point, you know, it is what it is. Okay. So, Mason, every every sin is is conscious, though. Every sin is willful. 
Okay, there's no there's no accidental sin. Okay, the only kind of accidental sin there is is, is sin done in ignorance. So if, if you're not aware that like when I first so became is, a Christian, is judgment a, like if you everybody judges people. You look at somebody, you judge them. It's it's something that your brain did without you saying judge that person. Is that conscious? Judging is not a sin. Judging right judging unrighteously is a sin. Judging according to a appearance is sin. Um, you know, that's, but but that, judging. That's what I'm talking about. Okay, so yeah, if, if you're like you're like saying, oh, that person guy's wearing pink, he must be a sodomite. That's uh, that's unrighteous judgment. Okay, but if someone says, I love pornography, and you say, well, you're going to hell. That's a righteous judgment. That's just according to God's word. That's what you're supposed to do. Is tell them the truth. Okay. Okay. So there's good and bad judgment. So we're supposed to be doing good judgment, not bad judgment. But if someone if someone judges, I don't think at all we're supposed to judge. Mason, when, gosh, man, you know, first, well, I'm, trying, I'm trying to leave, but, but like you guys are bringing up. But here's like, here's the thing, Mason. First Corinthians two fifteen says this. Okay. Once again, I go back to the scripture. First Corinthians two fifteen says the spiritual man, that's a Christian, judges all things, and he himself is rightly judged by no man. Matthew 7, 1, the verse everybody loves to bring up about judging, just not lest you be judged. For the judgment you use is measured back to you. See, so the, the, the context there doesn't say that judging is a sin. It says the way you judge is measured back to you. So you better watch what you say. And then down in verse 5, it says, first take the plank out of your own eye, and then you can see clearly take the speck out of your brother's eye. So Jesus is giving the solution. Don't be a hypocrite. Get the sin out of your life first, then you can help someone else get the sin out of their life. Right? Um, well, I, I was about to say, I, I try to, the way that I view forgiveness is if I can forgive somebody, say, say you were homosexual, that's something I can forgive. You know, I, you're, it's okay. But, but how can you forgive him if he doesn't want it? He doesn't, he's not sorry. He's not repentant. I can lie to him. If he's continuing in homosexuality and doesn't want to stop it, you, there's no forgiveness available for him from anybody. Not from you and not from anybody else. I, okay, so I'm not, I'm not homosexual. I'm, I, I do, so going back to the curse of example, yeah. Yeah. I don't like the fact that the curse. Uh, okay. I don't think that it's, it's pleasant. Okay, um, that's good. That means your conscience isn't seared. Yeah. That's all it means. It doesn't mean, not mean you're really repentant. Right. Okay. If you read Romans 7, the Apostle Paul is, is talking about himself right before he gets saved. He's talking about hating the things he's doing, not wanting to do them anymore, but he's not saved yet. So when you hate your sin, you're, you're getting closer, but a true follower of Jesus Christ stops it. They don't just hate it. They take action and repent, okay. forsake it. Other, other than, say I had no moral kind of compass. Yeah. Right? So say, say my parents cursed, because this is probably the only thing that makes me think that cursing is bad. Okay. I feel like cursing can be used bad, used badly. I also don't think that me, say, say I saw something on the ground and I said there's some S over there. Yeah. Right. That's that to me doesn't feel bad. It's only because my parents do it. Yeah, see, if, I, if my parents did, yeah, but that's, I that's, I, my brain wouldn't process that as sin. But here, here's the thing, though, Mason. When it comes to our conscience, which is given to us by God, Romans 2 says, the conscience is given to you by God. Your law of God is written upon your heart. See you later, William. The law of God is written upon your heart, either accusing you when you do wrong or excusing you when you do right. Okay, that's the conscience God's given you. But you can corrupt it. You can defile it. You can ignore it. And so whether you feel bad or not, that's not the ultimate standard of this is right or this is wrong. The ultimate standard of right and wrong comes from God, not from our feelings. And so the ultimate standard of, of right and wrong comes from God's Word. And so if you want to know if cussing's wrong, open God's Word and read it. And Ephesians 4, 29 says, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. But what is good, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace. Well, that goes back perfectly to my example. Because a corrupt word to me would be like what I said to him. But you're saying to me, you're saying to me though, what does the Bible say? And if you study the history of curse words, I've done this before myself, you'll see that in, in the English language, the F word, as it's IT word, those things have always been considered curse words, foul language, corrupt language. It's never been considered an okay or pure word. And so in every language, just about every language has these words. And people know what they are. Society knows what they are. And even if you say, well, society's changing. They don't think the S-H-I-T is a bad word anymore. And I don't feel bad about it. So 
God must be okay with it then, too. What? You guys mm. okay That's the way it works, though. Yeah. Oh, okay. uh, no, he's only the last baby. I do appreciate our conversation. All right, Mason. Good talking to you, man. Hey, it was a pleasure, man. I'm actually right, going to go now. Okay. okay. Good talking to you. Uh, yeah. Good. Good luck again. You know, I, I think I'm, I'm leaving pretty much with, with my 10% disagreement, right, in terms of messaging. But otherwise, man, you are spreading the word, and it is good work. So keep it up. Okay, well. Yeah. So. Um, like I said before, if they're if they're prideful, if, if someone loves their sin, they're gonna hate what preaches against them. Like for example, on his sign on the other side, it talks about drunkards, homosexuals, um, all of that stuff. Thank you. you know? So let's say I was an atheist and I saw that, I would I would be an enemy. You know? I would hate that because it's 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 like a mirror on someone's soul. If you see your sin on there. Then you know that you're in danger. But your your natural reaction is to either humble yourself to it or to get prideful against it. And if you're prideful against it, it's just evidence that you love that sin, you know? Like drunkenness, uh, fornication, all of that. You know, so it's not a matter of the approach, it's just a matter of loving that sin or not. I do think though, like sometimes with especially with young people, it's not always that they like love their sin and hate the truth, but a lot of times it's that they're so self-loathing in the fact that like oh we do have this great hope that this father loves us no matter what, but then they still feel like they're they're beside that. So I think a lot of times it's not always that they're like, I love my sin and you're wrong and you're a judgmental person and I love my sin, but also it can be a lot of times like a, I don't feel loved by this. Why would I? Why would I want to go to heaven if I'm not loved? Still, you know. And so, like, not necessarily. I don't think the sign's wrong at all. I just yeah. think that. So like, can I just address this? So, if you put yourself in their shoes. What would you deem as hateful on this side? Since you don't oh, I don't think it would be hateful at all. I just think that it wouldn't draw in light. No, I'm saying you put yourself in their shoes. Because I know you say you don't think it's hateful. But put yourself in their shoes. not a Christian. Right, so... Yeah, what would you deem as hateful about this sign as, a, as someone uh, who's living this sign? Because I, I just want to better understand because you say that it's... Uh, the approach is wrong, you know, but I'm telling you straight from scripture that men love darkness and hate the light, and if they see their sin on there, if they see their darkness, they're going to hate what exposes it, because anything that exposes sin is the light, you know, and this exposes the uh, sin, you know, so that's what I'm trying to explain to you, it doesn't, it doesn't matter about our approach as long as we're preaching the truth, as long as it's coming from the Bible, you know, and you say you agree with it, so that's good, but you're saying to put yourself in their shoes, so I'm trying to understand why why they think this is hateful if it's all I don't true. necessarily know if they all think it's hateful well, or some of them I would yeah but I mean I don't and I don't know why they think it's hateful because I, I think it's how they yeah but that's that's the thing is that they don't they get to hear like when they read that sign they read like oh I'm like all they see is like God hates me because I do the sin, and not that that the sin is that that's, that's just that's, what they read, but they don't get to see the fact of like He actually loves you, which is why He doesn't want you to do that sin, which is why that sin is wrong, and that's why that's just why like I don't think the sign's hateful. I don't think it's wrong, but if I were to put myself in their shoes and I were to read something about me, yes, it's exposing the truth, which is why I would probably be like really. You know, so, offended by it okay. but i i would love to see like the truth that like jesus loves you. i think it that's just the main message that above all it says faith hope and love and out of these three love is the most important and so not that these are not i think they're truth and i think they're hope and i think they're love but i think love is the most important part of how we be walking on the street that's the first and there, it's only that is the faith in our minds it's just love well 
Okay, look at it this way. So these are obviously warning signs. Oh, right. So you have stop signs that tell you to stop. And if you don't do that and a cop were to catch you, you'd obviously be in violation of the law. So that's exactly what we're doing here. They may not like the message, they may not like the approach, but it's still the truth nonetheless, you know, and we're telling them to stop, don't go to hell. You know, we're we're just we're trying to redirect them. We're, these are U-turn signs, you know. U-turn signs to, to repent, to turn to Jesus. And that's what we're doing here today. That is love. That the exact that is love. So to tell someone the truth is is the best way you can show love. You know, to lie to someone and put off telling them the truth is not love. Because let's say you wanted to use that friendship evangelism method, but you never got to the gospel until you guys established a firm uh, 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 relationship, and then they died like maybe that night, they would still go to hell. But if you told them the truth, then their blood is off your hands, you know? So there's urgency with the gospel. It's not trying to get buddy-buddy with everybody. It's telling them the truth, you know? And that's what we're doing. I don't think the sign should leave. I just think maybe add a sign. <laughs> oh, we have, did you read the other side? Did you read the other side? Add a, add a sign that says, like... Did you read that sign? I think that just, like... Love is first. I don't think the signs are wrong. I don't think you guys should get rid of them. I just think, like, first and foremost, the first thing I'd want to see is that, like, somebody loves me, somebody loves me especially because a lot of these people just don't feel loved. What's the greatest example of love? I mean, I, I do agree. I think it's truth, and I think it's God's No, I mean, who is the greatest example of love, I should say? Jesus. Okay. So how many times did Jesus in the Word of God that we have recorded preach about God's love for all of humankind? <laughs> How many times in the Bible? So Jesus is a great example of being a loving preacher. We want to model ourselves after him. How many times did Jesus in the Bible preach about God's love for all of the humankind? It's just once. No, John 3.16. And you look at the one person, Nicodemus. So you're, you're, you're actually holding me to a higher standard you're holding Jesus to. So our first word doesn't have to be love. And our only focus is not love. And there's... That's it. You, it seems like you're talking about me like tender love, but we're talking about tough love. Okay, tough love is telling people the truth, even though they don't want to hear it. Tough love is telling your friend, you got something stuck in your teeth, man. Go, get, go wash your teeth, man. You're gonna make you like a fool. You know, that's the kind of love we're talking about here. We want them to know the truth that they can be, they can be saved. And me telling them to I'm blue in the face, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. That's not gonna help them. What's gonna help them is telling them the truth. I don't. I just think that you can, I think it's a great way you can do both at the same time, and I don't think that there necessarily has to be an order, but I think like, and I think you're doing that in your conversation, and you are believing that you're doing that, and if people, you know, hear that and take that and change, then that's up to them, um, but I don't think it's wrong to do them at the same time, and not that you are saying it's wrong, but I would I wouldn't mind holding that sign. I would just also love for my friend to be holding one that also I think it ultimately comes down to like if someone was walking by and they just read it and left, I mean, that's like, about a long what, like yeah, yeah, without yeah, yeah. having a conversation with you and like understanding like the whole picture, I feel like they could just be like, Oh yes, yeah, so well, what what if what if Jesus was preaching in Matthew twenty three and someone was walking by and only heard him say you whitewashed tombs full of dead man's bones. You travel over land and sea and make a convert, make them twice the son of hell that you are. If they walk by and just heard that, what would they conclude about Jesus? But, but he's not hateful though, right? Jesus is the most loving being that's ever existed on the face of this planet. And so just because someone walks by and doesn't stop to listen to the whole thing, doesn't stop to have a conversation or misconstrues or we're or, or bringing out our signs, or twists and so does that mean we're doing anything wrong? It means something wrong with their heart. It goes back to the heart issue. Prideful or humble. And, that, and that's why I said at the beginning, I challenge uh, professing believers to just examine in scripture the times where Jesus was, uh, you know, harshly rebuking people, the prideful versus the humble, the, hum uh, the humility, you know, that was there. He gave, he offered them grace, you know, 
obviously there's there is grace for them, but he was harshly rebuking their pride, you know. And that that's that's really what these signs do. It, it rebukes people's pride, you know. They don't like to see themselves on in the mirror, you know, for what they truly are. And you know, Jesus, he did the same exact thing. He probably didn't have a megaphone or or, or signs like this, but he he was the word, you know. He was the word, and he he preached it. He preached it so perfectly, you know. <clears throat> so, you know, I just, I, I just, uh, hey, to the pure, all things are pure. That's Titus. Pure, all things are pure. And, and to the, uh, to the, to the unbelieving, to the defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. Uh, I don't remember, bro. Sorry. Titus? Doesn't sound like Titus. It's kind of close to Revelation, but that's not what you're what you're talking about. I got a bad memory. So Revelation and the Revelation talk something different like that. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of things, so yeah, I can understand. So the pure, all things are pure. <laughs> Titus 1, 15. That's there you go. I was close. You were close, bro. <laughs> you got it. It says, I was looking right at it, too. Unto the pure, all things are pure, pure. But unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. But even their mind and conscience is defiled. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him, being abominable and disobedient to every good work reprobate. So when a homosexual-minded, sexually perverted person looks at the Scripture, where it says David considered Jonathan's love greater than the love of a woman, they automatically think sexual. Yeah. Right? It had nothing to do with sex. It had everything to do with their relationship. A brotherly love that was he was closer to Jonathan than any of a one it was better than uh, a relationship he had with any woman which makes sense because they had multiple wives I would say and so makes sense that you know I would understand why he would say that so the pure minded you know the pure in heart shall see the Lord that's what I was talking about what's your name William uh, turn to Jesus with me. What's up? How do y'all do it? Huh? The hecklers and others. <laughs> grace of God. <laughs> That's right. Like, just dying to the flesh. Look. Even in prayer. I mean, experience helps too. You know, going through it. And then just submitting to the Lord. You know, and the Lord perfecting that over time. It's just it's just Christ. I can't take any credit. It really is just developing the character of Jesus through prayer and you know, having a heart and compassion for sinners is another thing. You know. Um, and just staying steadfast in that. And the other thing is we want to glorify God. That's my biggest motive. I don't want I don't wanna bring shame to the name of Jesus. In anything I do. Right. You know. I don't want somebody to look at me and say, Hey, and this is a bad excuse, and it won't ride at the day of judgment. But I don't want anybody to say he's the reason why I'm not following Jesus in truth. I don't. I don't mean because they didn't like what I was preaching. I mean in truth. I don't want them. To, I don't want people to have that excuse when they stand before God. And I want to glorify God. That's really my chief motive. So a lot of it's just like experience. Like y'all just like stand out here, wait for people to come up to you. I mean, we just go preach the gospel. Wherever, wherever we are, whether it's here or at another campus or at Fuck. a concert or at a festival or just in a city like Columbus or Atlanta, we'll just, as the Lord leads us, we'll just post up and start preaching. And uh, the Holy Spirit draws people. You know, we don't go looking for this persecution or, uh, let me not use that word, that's kind of a strong word, but reviling and, and, uh, uh, we don't go looking for that. It's just a byproduct of preaching the truth. It's like, I think brother, my brother here mentioned it one time when we were at Valdosta State. We're like, preaching the gospel is like garbage. And you're basically dumping out the garbage and there it is in front of you. And what are you going to do with it? Are you going to repent and turn to Jesus and get that out of your life? Or, you know, are you just going to put it back in the trash can and hide it again? And some people can't handle that and they get mad or... Depending on how emotionally tied you are to the sin yeah. that we expose, you know. I mean, Jesus said, you know, uh, uh, 
they, they, they hate you because they hated me first, pretty much. Say when he's going up to the wedding at Canada, he said, the world can receive you. Uh, talking about his brothers, who yeah, are not, brothers. not followers of him at that point right. in time. The world can receive that cannot receive me. Right. The whole world hates me. Yes. I testify a bit that it's works are evil. That testify it so it works are evil. That's it. That's it. When he was about to go, and then he went up kind of secretly. It is. Uh, I'm still here for it. I'm asking if you can. So yeah, man. That, that, that's, we don't come looking for this. We just go and preach the truth, and it just happens. It just happens. Yeah, but so so how we do it? I would just say this: that the fruit of the spirit, love. Joy, peace, long suffering, suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self control. As the Spirit of God dwells in the Christian, and he continues to walk with the Spirit, walk according to the Spirit and not fulfill the lust of the flesh, that fruit gets developed yeah. in you, and the patience grows. Like one of, my, one of my major sins before I became Christian was patience. I was so impatient, man. I was a road rage guy. So, seriously, and immediately God began to work on my patience as soon as I became a Christian. So it's, it's it's the fruit of the Spirit and it's love. Love is patient. Love is kind. And so we have the love of God in our hearts. We have the Holy Spirit living inside of us. The fruit's being developed and over time, I mean, I, I hope 17 years later I'm a better preacher than I was 17 years ago. Yeah. Hope God a little better, but I hope all along the way, I hope I wasn't bringing any shame to the name of Jesus the yeah. whole time. You know? Yeah. Amen. you are doing God's work. Right? Well, Appreciate it. God. Glory to God. Yeah. What's your name? Owen. Owen? Yeah. Amen. I didn't even ask your name, bro. I'm sorry. Ozzy. Ozzy? Wait, I think I met you before. Are you sure I haven't seen you before? One other time? You've done this before? Yeah. Yeah. Around. Okay. What are you doing? You look... like, actually, I'm about to use lunch, but I have one more question. Okay. What do you guys, like, what do you want to answer? Uh, what do you guys think about purgatory? Oh, he... do you want to take purgatory? purgatory? Oh. You well, know, purgatory is a corruption of a biblical teaching. So the biblical teaching is that when we die, no one goes straight to heaven or straight to hell. Okay, we all go to a place called Hades. And Hades has two different parts. It has the part, we look at Luke 16, it talks about this, the part where the people are in torment and the part people are in Abraham's bosom or paradise is called. And so it's kind of like, um, like if someone gets arrested on this earth, they get put in jail to await trial, right? So that's what it's like. You're, you're put in God's jail to await judgment to be cast into the lake of fire, which is also called hell. Okay, so that's, that's the biblical teaching of Hades, that you go to a place to await the resurrection from the dead that you can be judged by God. And so what, what Roman Catholics did, they perverted that and said, yeah, you go to a place called purgatory and your family can pay your way out of purgatory. So instead of going to hell in the end, you'll go to heaven or God's kingdom in the end. And it's a place of cleansing before you go to the kingdom of God. Right, so, so Hades, if you go to the lower part of Hades, which is waiting judgment, or the upper part of Hades awaiting the resurrection of the dead being in God's kingdom, you can't switch. So if you die in your sins and go to the worst part of Hades, you're not going to God's kingdom. You have no way to get out of it. It's been settled. It's been dealt with. Your, your, your faith has been sealed. And if you, if you go to the better part of Hades with Abraham, the father of the faith, you're definitely going to God's kingdom. See, so purgatory is a corruption of a true teaching of Hades. And so that's what they kept. They did it mostly for money. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you guys. Yeah. Yeah. Take care, man. Take care. Is there any way I can support y'all? Prayer? Any social media? Or? If you're if you're a believer, bro, you can pray for us. Um, yeah. Yeah, you can pray for us. Bro. Same name as Adam. Yeah, Adam. Kerrigan. Kerrigan. Yeah. All right. Yeah, for sure, man. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Owen. Take care. Yeah. Appreciate it, man. God bless, God bless you guys. Bless you. <laughs> <laughs> It's like a Jewish That's argument. That's what a Jewish, so a Jewish person would say. I, actually, if you look, if you look at the Hebrew, uh, actually, check out Dr. Brown on this subject. Uh, Dr. What's his first Michael name? Brown. Michael Brown. 
on this subject. He breaks that down pretty well. He has a PhD in Near Eastern languages. Too. Yeah, I'm more of a Bart Ehrman kind of guy. Oh no. Uh, well, I mean, he has a PhD in Near Eastern language, including yeah. Hebrew and Aramaic. Does he have any books I could read? Oh yeah, he's got lots yeah, he's of got books. Lot of what, books. Was it, what was his first name? Dr. Michael Brown. Yeah. Dr. Michael Brown. You can go to Ask, Ask, A S K, Dr. Brown. Yeah. Dot com. Yeah. Or dot org. I can't remember which and, one it is. I'm gonna write it down. I'll yeah, yeah. Right. And he he kind of uh, he goes into the Hebrew on when it's talking about servant and it's me and it means Israel, and when it means an individual person, which is namely the Messiah. Yeah. So on the context. Uh, so Isaiah was written by Jews, right? The so, prophet Isaiah. Yeah. yeah. So why um, why do you think that it's more likely that they're talking about Jesus than Israel themselves? Okay. Well, so at one question I would have in response to that, to respond with the question is, if it's talking about Israel genuinely, then why do they subtract it out and never, never appeal to it? And their, their readings, their yearly readings, they go through readings every day. Why do they take that out of their readings? Why do they ignore it and act like it's not there? Why wouldn't you go to them and talk to them and you actually like just read it to them? They don't recognize where it's from. You say, well, who do you think this is talking about? They said, well, talking about Jesus, obviously. That's what a Jew would say. I mean, there's actually a guy who is a Messianic Jew in Israel who actually did that experiment. He went, he, went to, he went to a bunch of Jews in Israel, Orthodox Jews, and he read to them this verse and asked them, where is this from? And he said, oh, I was always talking about Jesus. And they gave them the script of reference, like, oh. And these are scholarly? Like scholars of Judaism, or these are just normal, just Jews. everyday people? I mean, there were, there were, I think there was a rabbi in there. I think there was maybe one rabbi in there. Yeah. But whether it's whether it's a scholar or not, that word's thrown around very loosely. By the way, whether it's a scholar or not, what, what I mean is not a lay person. Like like a, a lay a lay person Christian would not be able to answer a variety of questions about the Bible. Same thing for a lay person. Too. I'm just simply telling you that it's obviously anyone who reads that, it's obviously talking about Jesus. Obviously. Ah, but there's so many people that disagree. I mean, I'd even disagree. Like, they disagree because they've they they have a, a bias to begin with. They have they're not being objective, being subjective. No one goes to that Isaiah 53, uh, 4 through 7 and says, that's not talking about Jesus. <laughs> I mean, they, that's just what it is, man. It's, it's talking about Jesus. And so if you if you go to it with any other bias, of course you're going to say, well, I can't be talking about him. I don't even believe in him. Well, it seems obvious because we understand Jesus as to be persecuted and to have resurrected and be crucified, etc. Without that knowledge, though, it seems... I mean, if you try to that, that's that's beside the point, though. I, I'm not I'm not Bart Ehrman in here. That's beside the point. You go to people and tell them what that verse says, which is written like he said, 700 years before Christ came into the world. You ask them who's it talking about, they're gonna say Jesus. They they know. I'll quote it. You tell me who's talking about Israel. It's all a suffering servant. It's an individual, not, not a group of people. Surely he had born our grief. They're moving from their readings. Yeah, exactly. So that's why. Sin of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. Is, is, is that talking about Israel? Or Israel's is, healed by their own Israel stripes? Israel's healed by their own stripes? I mean, are they bruised? And, and then it says it, 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 um, that, and the Lord had laid upon him the iniquity of, of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. They opened their mouth. They opened their mouth. <laughs> He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before his shearers is dumb. Not even Jewish scholars that don't don't Jewish scholars that don't believe Jesus is the Messiah, they'll tell you this is talking about the Messiah. Yeah, so just not just not Jesus though. Just not Jesus. The Messiah, but not Jesus. The Messiah, but not Jesus. Jewish scholars I mean, who don't I, believe in Jesus. I don't know about that specifically, yeah. but I, I do know that a lot of the language was by early Christians were taken out of Old Test, like uh, the Torah rather, like the Book of Isaiah and things, and put into the Gospels. Isaiah, Isaiah's not a Torah though. I said it's not. The Torah is the first five books of the Old Testament. Sure. Well, yeah, I understand that, but like there are other pieces from the Torah that I know that have been taken specifically, like putting to John or Mark. Uh, they did that to to give it show. credibility. No, no, to show that this is the man that fulfilled this prophecy. That's why they did. Now, what, what did you say they did again? Sorry. Tell me what you said they did. What did they, the early Christians, do? They took so there's prophecies, right, uh, that the Jews believed in. They uh, took pieces of that and tried, like Matthew, Matthew especially, the, it's the Jewish gospel, if you will. And they they take things and they put it in there specifically to try to fulfill the prophecy to prove or to show that Jesus. Is the Messiah the suffering Messiah? Okay, so so for you to say for you to say that you'd have to know their motives, which you don't know. 
because you're, you're 2,000 years later. True. I'm just okay, saying so, it's, so it's more likely than... No, no, it's not more likely. You don't know that. You're saying that because you've been taught by Bar Ehrman. Okay? That, well, that, that's why you're saying this. Yeah. You've been taught by him. I haven't had the fortune to take one of his classes. Well, reading his books is like getting taught by him. You're reading his ideas, which he's teaching you. So, so I just, I'll just tell you something. I mean, you, I understand you're trying to sound intellectual and like you know a lot about these things. I'm, I'm just, I just want to explain to you this, that if you really want to know what Christians believe, don't go to an antagonistic source to get the truth. No, I, I grew up Christian. Uh, well, okay, well, I'm just telling you that or if you want... Church. I don't know what y'all call a Christian. Okay, a Christian is someone who's born again of the Holy Spirit. They have their sins forgiven. They've been changed and transformed. They're a different person now. Okay, yeah. never did that. Okay, so you, you've never been a Christian. Going up to church is not doing anything for you, unfortunately. So, so when it comes to these things, you have to read the primary sources, okay? You don't, if, if I want to know about you, what's your name? Matt. Matt, if I want to know about you, Matt, I don't go to your worst enemy and hear, hear about you. They're not going to tell me the truth. They're biased, okay? If I want to know about you, Matt, I'm going to go to you first. Then I might go to your enemy, and then I'm going to compare the facts and see what the facts are, right? I'm not going to go to your enemy first and try to say, well, that's definitely what Matt is. Matt's a, he's, you know, he's a liar. He's, he's, a, he's a whoremonger. He's, he's doing drugs. He's getting high on cocaine. Just because your greatest enemy said that about you. Okay, bro. Well, you know, so for Butter, Butter Man to, to, to yeah, yeah. think... the greatest enemy of... To, I didn't say well. I'm just giving you an example. Okay, okay. He's not. He's obviously antagonist against Christianity. Okay, obviously. He makes all kinds of statements that he cannot back up. That's a fact. I mean, this That's a debate. fact. Well, what is your name? Sir? My name is Kerrigan. Kerrigan? Yes. Look up Timothy McGrew. He's got a good lecture series that totally debunks Barton. I don't, okay. I don't agree with one of his doctrines as far as doctrinally, well, but he does debunks Barton historically. What would you say is is like? If you could dwindle it down to like one, two, or three objections, like your biggest ones. Of Christianity? Yes. Um, I mean, well, okay, so my my real objection to Christianity, well, the re okay, the reason I don't believe in Christianity is I think that, okay, let me really start this. I think that there's a percentage chance, there's like a 5% chance there could be a guy, but because of Bart Ehrman and the inconsistencies, I, I believe that if there was a book given to us by God, that there would be no flaws in it. There would be no contradictions, nothing. And I think that there are well over a hundred contradictions within the Gospels alone. That I've I've read the I've read all the Gospels horizontally, vertically, everything, and there's clear contradictions. Like in Matthew, where they say that Jesus he specifically writes that Jesus rode into Jerusalem on two donkeys, but in all the other ones Matthew it wasn't. So. Okay, hold on, hold on. Okay, so let's stop right there. So I know what you're doing. Okay, yeah. I've taught through the Gospel of Matthew myself. It took me two years to do it, tell you. verse by verse. Okay, I've been a pastor for a long time now. Here goes this Why guy. Why don't you go again. to a fucking bar? Why don't you go somewhere else? Why don't you go take your hate off this fucking campus? Because you are a worthless piece of fucking shit. So are you, and so are you. This is fucking terrible. Get the fuck out of here. No nope. one wants you here. We're not going anywhere. Get the fuck out, dude. Nope. Go, dude, okay. Dude, you are literally the worst type of fucking human being there is. You can't go and take on a fucking real man somewhere else. I said, you have to come to this fucking campus to take on a bunch of kids who are trying to learn. What's your body. education level? Bachelor's, probably fucking, uh, probably no, bro, bullshit in what? In Sense. fucking what? Business. Bullshit, dude. You probably have what, like, Tell not even a truth. fucking GED, because then you would have some fucking knowledge I'm about, bro. Degree, you dude. are a fucking idiot is what you are. Go debate someone who, go debate someone else. Get off this fucking campus, dude. We're not going anywhere. Dude, Thanks. you're a fucking idiot, bro. Mm -hmm. Take care, man. Take care. Where were we? Okay, so we're talking about the Gospels and harmonizing them. Okay. Yes, yes. Harmonizing the Gospels means you have different accounts from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Sometimes they're found in three, sometimes they're found in two, and they're found in all four. Hey, come on, man. Let me talk to you. So, when it comes to these things, if you actually objectively go to these texts that you said you've already gone to, does it say he only rode on one horse? Or is it just uh, one donkey, or is it, just, is it mentioned the one That's donkey? An one. And so, so what we have in scripture, we have something called telescoping. Telescoping is like you know, picture a telescope. You zoom into the moon, and you see bit greater details in the moon that you can't see with your naked eye, right? And so, some authors they give more information. If there was a car accident right over here, and I was on this corner, and you were on that corner, and you were over there, we'd see different we would things. Have different but, but it doesn't mean they won't corroborate. Okay, so. 
You may say, well, no, no, well, if I say it's a blue car and you say it's a green car, that's a those contra are contradictions. But, but there's a lot of those in the Bible. But, but it, no, there are no contradictions in the Bible. And the one you just gave, which is your best one, supposedly, is not one. Well, that's just one off the top of my head. It's okay. been a minute since I've had these conversations. I've I'm just telling things. you that that I've, I've studied <laughs> these things out, man. And you, you're going to Bart Ehrman and looking at things through his eyes is not going to do you any good. Have you ever searched out whether people have actually harmonized these things? Yes, sir. Absolutely. Well, no, no. And actually, you haven't found anybody harmonizing no, these things? Bar, no, I was a Christian before I read Bart Ehrman. And I, I would... Well, you I say would, that, once again, but not according to the Bible. Well, sure. I went to a church, whatever you want to call that's it. That's fine. I'm going to say Christian just because, yeah. So, um, it, make, it makes your argument more strong, right? Because you used to be a Christian, and now you're not. Well, I believe Jesus Christ was the Messiah and the Lord, and you that doesn't make you a Christian. Him, so. That doesn't make you a Christian. Whatever you want to define, okay. you need to be born again or whatever. I, I, I wasn't that, but yeah. whatever. Um, I don't remember what my main point was. You were talking about whether you looked into the harmonization from a different source. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, I, had, I, I talked to atheists. I like to debate. So I, debate, I would debate Democrats and atheists and all that shit. And I'd have fun. And uh, eventually I came to, when I started reading Barter, I mean, because somebody told me about it, and I was like, well, this is full of shit. So I read his book and I was like, I don't know how to get rid of this. I don't know. How, there's problems in here that I can't reconcile. And that's what eventually got me out of it. Uh, with the help of Dawkins and uh, Hitchens, of course. Okay but, okay, but my point still remains. If you want to know what the Bible teaches, you don't go to Dawkins and Hitchens and Harris and, and Bart Ehrman. You go to a good source that actually does harmonize those things. Yeah. It, and I, I mean, let's, let's not play and act like no one's ever tried to harmonize these things. Here, I'll, I'll ask you. In Matthew, after, right after uh, the resurrection, uh, or right after Jesus' death, there's a bigger quake in Jerusalem and the dead rise and they walk around. Do you think that actually happened? Of course I do. Of course I do. So, you, so you're, you're looking at it from a naturalistic, atheistic perspective. Of course people don't rise from the dead, right? That's a miracle. But you don't believe in miracles, so of course you're not going to say it's false. Well, I, well, you're subtracting God from the equation. Cannot God raise people from the dead? If there was a hypothetical... Well, I don't even know what a God exactly is. Like, we're, not ta we're not talking about what a God is. I'm simply telling you, if the Christian God exists, I gave you an if there. I know he exists. Sure, if if he the could. Christian God exists, can he raise people from the dead? If that okay, so there you go. Yeah. So there you go. So, so your, your problem is not whether the Christian God exists or not. No, no, no. Your problem is you look at the text, un, you look at the text I, bias. I find it unlikely that we would have one account through Matthew and no other writing. Why is it unlikely? Why is it unlikely? I mean, the scripture talks about itself that God inspired men to write certain things down. God has the right to inspire Matthew to write about that and not anybody else. Okay. God has the right to inspire John to write John 1, 1 through 3 and not have any other apostles write those things. It just seems convenient. But No, it's, it's only that way because you're biased. Convenient. It's, 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 it's only objection from you because you think it helps you win an argument. We're all killed, bro. Except John. It's not convenient to write those things in that time. No Wait, way. you think the same John that wrote John, like the Gospel of John wrote Resurrection? Wrote Revelation? Revelation. Of yeah, course it was. Of course it of was. Course he was. Historically, he was he was banished to Padma. Very Man, I, I, I would, I would just, I would just say this. Overall, just overall, I would just say this. Well, hang on you, one second. I'll let you, just overall, I would say this. You have a lot of misinformation. Sure, sure. Seriously. What, what language was John written? John? Yes. The Greek. Yes. Koine Greek. Greek. And the Revelation was. Koine Greek. Yes. Um, if you look at the, now I'm not a, I don't speak Greek. I know Greek. You do. Yes. Excellent. The original writing of Revelation, the Greek is. Fat. It's not good Greek. Whereas John is written very, uh, a highly educated person would have written John. These are okay. clearly two different. But Matt, but Matt, Matt, Matt. Where did you get that information from? Yeah. Right. Mr. Barner. See, that's, that's my man. point, man. You keep going. And this is like, he's like your God. Literally, he's no. like your, no, he is. Literally, he is your God. I don't because, worship to because, him. Well, you, you basically do, because everything he says is truth. No, 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 no. The only person I trust in that way is God. It's God. So you're, you're basically, you're, you're assuming that Bart Ehrman's not going to deceive you, that he doesn't have any kind of false motives, that he's completely unbiased. Why would you assume that about a man? I, I, I don't assume that. There are other scholars that come into this. No, wait a minute now. Matt, if he you, just if, happens to be one that I trust. If you don't assume that, Matthew, Matt, sorry. Matt. My son's name's Matthew. That's okay. So, sorry, I hate Matt. Matthew. Okay, well, don't hate it's Matthew. It's too biblical. <laughs> okay, well. <laughs> not your son, the, the name. Okay, so, so, Matt, why wouldn't you instead... Look at the. You got a little crowd here for yourself, but why don't you, why don't you instead look into the facts from the Christian perspective? I'll give you the reason why, Matt. Why, why won't I? Because you want to be a sinner. I do like sex. You're not wrong. Um, 
Yeah. Right. 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 But, but uh, in, I think I think it's Luke. Don't quote me on this. I think it's Luke. Uh, Jesus has to or date Joseph, the father. He has to go back to Bethlehem because uh, there was a Roman tax a thousand years before. You got to go back to where your ancestors were. You're familiar. Yeah. Why is that only in one gospel? And why is it that if there was this tax really happening in the Roman Empire, why wouldn't the Romans write about it? Why would it only be in one gospel? Okay, so so this this ar this argument you make, Matt. Does it this it's not an argument? It's an observation. No, it's, it's an argument. This it's argument, that, this argument you're making to supposedly disprove the scripture. No, sir. Does it disprove it? No, sir. Okay, so so so. What I'm trying so to prove Matt, is that it, it's not inerrant. So Matt, I don't have a problem. With that Christian. does not prove it. That does not prove it has errors. That's already been dealt with. Though. That is just a fallacious so reasoning. So do you believe that tax with. really happened? Of course I do. Okay, then why didn't the Romans write about it? Matthew, Matt. Augustus. Sorry. Matt. The first Emperor Matt, Rome, if I can't if I can't give you an answer to that question, does it prove the Bible is not inerrant? If I can't give you a definitive answer to that question, does it prove that the Bible is not an errant? Of course not. Of course not. So in Luke. Oh, hold on, hold on. Getting them to join in with you and agree with you is not meaning you're right either. Well, no, no. I'm, I'm that's not called ad populum argument. For the that's ad populum argument is what it is. No, no, no. That's, that's already been dealt with. What's, What's your question? question? What's your question? So in, in Luke, there, there there's a tax, and Joseph and his family and Mary and Jesus, they have to go this travel. This is the kind of reasoning Bart Edmund produces. Uh, Joseph's ancestors. Timothy McGrew uh, deals with that problem. David or something. On his, and on his there's a tax on it. it was the Roman need, Empire need, controlled I mean, the area. You need like 15 minutes Augustus, to go through that. He would have written about it if this really happened. I'm just dealing with the heart of it. So my question is, why didn't the Roman Empire, if he believes in the inerrant he has to believe that tax really happened. If that happened, why why wouldn't the Romans write about it? I don't think they went, they didn't run, like, I think they went away because they were taking a census. Yeah. yeah, so why don't we have any, why would it, why is there not an order from, Augustus was a prolific note taker. We have so many notes. Before. Why wouldn't he write about why? Matt, are, are you saying that, that, that everything was written down? No, sir. Okay, so then you just proved your own argument then. You just disproved your by that one statement, no, no, no. no sir. It you just disproved your whole it argument. Was an emperor, an it's empire crumbled empire underneath wide. of you. An empire wide census of tax of people having to go. Is everything to their recorded? Is everything recorded in history? And everything's not recorded. It but it seems Bam. Very, it was. It, it seems bit, that's what it is. The it foundation was. of your argument is that you destroyed by your own answer. Not everything's recorded. There's your answer. So, Not everything's recorded. It seems very likely that such a large event. It seems very would be likely. By at least one person. Well, it was written by one person. <laughs> That's not, but you just you just you simply discredit it because you don't like it. You have no other there reason to discredit Luke. Not anyway. one reason can you give me yep. to discredit Luke except he believes of things I don't believe and I don't like what he believes. No, 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 That's it, Matt. Not. That's all there is to it, man. Oh, it's such a straw man. You know. No, no, no. That's no, not a straw no, man. The author, the author of Luke has an incentive to try to prove he believes the author of Luke believes that Jesus is the Messiah. That's what he's trying to prove in his entire book. He would write things to try to prove that. So, so, so I need an independent source that does not care to uh, <laughs> to says who. Luke says who? His death, death wish says who? Writing that gospel. Where, where does that standard that come empire. from, Matt? Why? Why would he benefit from? Wait. Writing how that do gospel? you think? How do you think the disciples learned ancient Greek? Like they, they spoke Aramaic. How? How do you think that they learned fluent Greek? How do you to think? Write? Huh? And how do you know they didn't? Well, no, have, I don't think the disciples. How do you know they it? didn't have somebody writing that for them? How do you know that? Well, some of them were having. Like, the because the like Mark. Because the literacy rate was less than 10% and only very educated people would do that. So it wasn't like there would be scribes that would be hired. This wasn't a job at the time. So it simply doesn't make sense. Matt, you're bouncing all over the place, man. man. The, the, the main, source, main source of your problem <laughs> is Bart Ehrman's or God. That's right. That's it. Oh, come on. And like I said, look up Timothy McGrew. He answers that. I'll check him out. He answers that objection about, and then he answers the objection about Isaiah being written by two people where Jesus quotes him in two different parts. And there's a lot of different things in there that he... He actually debunks Bart Ehrman very easily. I mean, I mean, brother, there's, even, there's even just a plethora. Even without that. I mean, that, it's not just one guy. Yeah. There's a plethora yeah. of people who debunk Bart Ehrman left and That's right. right. But, you're, right. But, but you're, but you're, but you're so blinded in one track on Bart Ehrman, you don't see because you don't want to. You don't want to. Let me ask you this question. That's the issue. If you had um, one shot, every answer, one every answer that. You're looking for all the contradictions. They're all answered. Yes, I would believe in God. I would believe in God. Hold on, hold on. Would you give up your sin and follow Jesus? If if I truly believe that there was a heaven and a hell and that the Bible was inerrant and whatever you guys believe, yeah. Absolutely. Well, that was your that was your reasoning of why you don't believe the Bible is because all these so-called hundreds of contradictions. That There's you not really one. Brought up too. There's not one. That are easily answered by scholars that actually love Jesus. I love Jesus. 
So if those if those if those contradictions are answered for you logically and succinctly, educate by educated men with PhDs, would you give up your sex before marriage? Would you give up everything and follow Jesus and go preach the gospel? Let me say this, Matt. Let me give you a little analogy. I know Islam's wrong. Let me give you a little analogy. Before we go to Islam, let me, that's yes. a whole other trail. I'll give you a little analogy. Sometimes I'll send my children to go find something. Okay? I have children from 18 down to 7. Go find this. I'll tell them exactly where it is. I can picture it in my mind's eye. It's right here. It's under this, on this shelf, whatever it may be. I tell them to go find it. Dad, I can't find it. It's another person. Oh, that happens to me all the time. It's the next person. Dad, I can't find it. I go there, and it's right where I said it was. You know why they couldn't find it? They didn't care. That's why you can't find Jesus. You don't care. You love your sin, man. That's why you can't find the answers to all these objections you supposedly have about Christianity. It took me three years. To get all these contradictions you by reading Bart Ehrman for three years. No, no, no. He, Bart Ehrman was the nail in the coffin. You, so, so as, a, um, as an unbeliever, a non-born again Christian, you were debating atheist. You completely turned away from the truth. But you never searched out the ones who had the answers no, from I Christianity. Did. I did, though. Like, name, uh, name one person. Name one person. Christian apologetics. Oh my God. Um, what's his face? Ah, oh, I can't remember the names. I'm so sorry. It's been years. I was like 17, 16 at the time. All right, it's a long time ago. But I went to Christian apologetics to get debate terms so that I could debate people and use their own ideas. You know, because uh -huh. they're smarter than me. Well. But let me ask you this. How are you sure that Christianity is correct and no other religion? There's so many out there. How can you be sure? Well, I mean, philosophically, that would take an internal critique of every religion. Of every religion? Uh, yeah, but experientially, I've, I've experienced Jesus Christ for myself. He's changed I, me. I, yeah, I can't debate with that. He's changed me. He's delivered me. But I, we can, you brought well, up... A Muslim could say that, too. Like, I can well, ask no, Muslims that's, question, uh, why did, I didn't say that was the only thing I had. I'm yeah, so so when it comes to Islam, for example, just just one, just one, because it's a major one in the world today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, it's the second largest. So they, in, in their own Quran, they say Jesus did not die on their Hadith, either Quran or Hadith. They say Jesus did not die on the cross. They actually, Allah deceived the whole world and Judas died there instead. They <laughs> said, crazy. yeah, it does seem kind of crazy. I, I agree. Um, they they Allah says about himself, he's the greatest deceiver in the whole world. He's the greatest deceiver. So he says about himself. Okay. He says the Trinity is wrong, right? But he also tells Muslims, go talk to the people of the book. He's talking about Christians and Jews, for they have the answers for you, right? And even the Bible is called the Word of God. He, it mentions books of the Bible and calls them the Word of God. It mentions the Injil, which is the Gospel, and calls it the Word of God. And here's the issue. You bring that to a Muslim and say, well, the Gospels have been corrupted, right? The Word of God, that's why you can't trust the Bible. That's why we have the Quran and the That's the final authority, the final word to correct all the mistakes, all the errors in the Bible. But they'll tell you the Quran can never cease to be the Word of God because it's the Word of God. Yeah. Do you see a problem? <laughs> yeah. So they said the Bible is the Word I'm of God. And I'm, I'm just telling you, this is what I do with, with Islam. The Bible is the Word of God, but yet it's become corrupted. But the Word of God cannot become corrupted. And they'll say Jesus is just a prophet, but Jesus himself in the Gospels calls himself more than a prophet. In John. Only John. No, it's not true. Mark, Matthew, or Luke. That's not true. That is true. That's no, not true. That but true. but that's beside the point. That's one of the Gospels. And Jesus died on the cross. And that all. Is, it's not one of the Synoptic Gospels. It was written, what, 100 years? You keep, you keep introducing oh, these, these, these uh, subjective standards that I don't submit to. I don't know where you get them from as if John's not valid, but Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are. I don't know where you're getting that's that from. Text. John is just as valid as Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They're all valid. So I don't submit to your, uh, your, your standard of, oh, that was only in John, so it doesn't count. I don't submit to that. And Jesus died on the cross in every single gospel. So if I do submit to your standard, I agree. we have I that issue. That I just think okay, so, into a so we have these problems with corrupt the, the, the Islam itself doing an internal critique does not hold up. It doesn't hold up. So I dismiss it. It's wrong. God could not be. <laughs> I just went through everything, man. No, no, just that last thing. Inter there's internal contradictions within it, therefore it does not hold up under weight. It cannot be God, God cannot be the author of the thing because God not the author of confusion. And we know in the Bible, who is the one who comes to kill, steal, and destroy? The devil. Who is the one who's the father of lies? The devil. Who is the greatest deceiver? Uh, and Allah is the devil. Okay. So, oh, so you think that Allah came down to Muhammad and gave him the hadith, the, the Quran? No, I believe a false angel, a false messenger did. A fallen angel did. You heard his That's his own testimony. Lucifer? That's his own testimony. His own testimony. Well, it might have—it well, might have—it might have been Satan himself. I don't know. I, he said Gabriel, I believe. I don't. That's what he called himself, but that was a lie, because Gabriel's a good angel. 
We well, know from the scripture. I think it's fairly likely that Muhammad ran into Christians in the Middle East and took some of their ideas. No, I, I don't. I don't. The Gnostics, you know. About I don't. I don't deny that he had an experience, but he rolled around on the floor and foamed at the mouth. Give me one example from the Bible where someone has an experience with God and a revelation from God where they foam at the mouth and roll around on the ground like an animal. That's demonic in the Bible. That's demonic in the Bible. Do you believe in a, um, what's it called when a priest has to like take a demon out of somebody? Exorcism? Yeah, do you believe in exorcism? Oh, uh, well, I don't believe Catholic priests can do it. They have no power to do it. But I, be I, be I, believe, I believe that Christians can drive out demons from people. Yes, of course. I don't understand. Cool. There's definitely spiritual forces of wickedness so, in this world. So what's the goal here? So drunkards? Is getting drunk is something? Yeah, like, of course why, it is. Why, like, why wouldn't you want to draw people in by showing the good side? Wait a minute, hold on a second. Like, what's the where, good side? No, no, everything's the good side. Well, where, where, does it, where does the Bible say to draw people in with the good side? That's not what I mean. Like, I'm a Christian, so I like... I'm well, I'm just, I'm just trying to understand your... I'm trying to understand your objection. No, but... Are you born I, again? Are you born again? Yeah, like, I, you did the whole born again thing? Okay, so he is a Christian. Like, yeah. It's okay, Matt. You can mock now. You want to mock him later, man. Why? Like, if you do, like, if you really want to draw them in to, like, tell them, like, you, like, because you can't set them to a, like, you can't set people that aren't Christian to a standard of Christians. You know what I'm saying? No, that's what the Bible says. The Bible holds everybody to the same standard. You can't hold people that aren't Christians to Christian standards because they're not Christians. This is not a Christian standard. This is God's standard. God says you should not be a fornicator. That's a standard for people that follow. So I can't tell fornicators are going to hell? What? I can't tell fornicators are going to hell like the Bible says? I'm just saying. So I'm trying, I'm, I'm a little confused. I'm trying to understand what you're saying, but I'm not really getting it. I'm telling you, why wouldn't you want to, like, if you really care about getting people to join your side, kind of. I'm not interested in that. You're really not interested? I'm not interested. My primary purpose of being here is not getting people to join my side. My purpose here is to preach the truth, to sow the seed of the gospel, the Bible calls it, so that they can, might hear, so that they might really believe and, so and repent. So they might believe. So if you but, but, but listen, listen, but you, you want me to do it a different way than the Bible tells me to do it. No, that's not what I'm saying. But this is what the Bible tells me to do. No, this is what the Bible says. Like, yes, it is. It is. <laughs> no, this is what the Bible you read says. You the Bible? I'm telling you. No, 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 like, no, this is why you got to get out as soon as you can. Yeah. I think you're basing your Jesus on some movies you watched. Or feelings or emotions. No, that's not true. That's what it sounds I'm like. Man. Hey, bro, shut up, bro. Oh, now he's telling me oh, to shut no. up. Wow. Just don't be like, you got to be respectful. The right no, there. I'm respecting you. Be respectful to me. I said it sounds like you're talking about a Jesus that you watch on a movie. No, that's not true at all. Okay. Why but does, it does sound like it, though. Let me, let me ask, why do, you, why do you have to look down on me as a Christian? I'm not looking down. No one's looking down, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to find We're addressing what you're saying. You might actually am. Because, don't question that. The, I'm going to question it because the Bible tells us to question it. I know, but you don't need to be do, like... Do you mind if I say something? I think I can make, I can make a point. No, 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 forget about that. No, forget about that. So, so when, it, when it comes when it comes to these things... You have, to ba you have to base it upon the scripture, okay? Okay, I'm, don't get defensive. I'm just, just, I'm just telling you the facts. So what we're doing here is based upon scripture, okay? So if you can show me from scripture that I'm doing something wrong, I will repent, okay? But it, it, oh, okay, well, then, okay, we're fine then. Like, why don't you have a balance? Like, why don't you have, like, the good stuff as well? What, what, are you, what are you talking about? This is good stuff right here. Oh, it's good, but this is the good news right here. This is the bad news. Bad news on the back. And that's good as well. Wait, what's still, the problem? I don't, I don't get it. Huh? Are you still a sinner? Yeah. I a sinner. See, uh, that's wow. the problem. Yeah. You don't know Jesus, then. According to the Bible, there's no sinner. There's no sinners in the kingdom of God, bro. Right? Uh, so show that's me in the Bible where your believers are supposed to be sinners. Huh? Every, bro, everyone's a sinner. No. Where does the Bible say that? Where does the Bible so say that? Like? that no one is right. No one is well, perfect. No one's perfect. Like, what do I have not, to not, not Show one, me a scripture. Not, not no one's perfect. Well, we've all sinned. We've all sinned. In the past. But you're talking about present tense, right? Yeah. So you guys think you guys are perfect? Then? In Christ, I'm perfect. In Christ. Because of his in Christ. power, yeah. Obviously, we don't, we're not sinners. You're the not Bi sinners. Bible says no. the Bible no. one's righteous, not one. Yeah. That's, that's Romans before, 3. That's Romans 3 before God conversion. Yeah. yeah. It talks about after as well. No. no, it's not talking about after. That's not what it says there. What if I don't have any teeth when I die? When I go to hell? So well, saying, well, for example, like, as a, as a what's y'all's religion? Like, for example, no denomination. For example, 1 Peter 1. That's why? What's why? I'm a reformer. 
I'm a reformer. Oh, well, you're a Calvinist. Oh, you're, a Calvinist. you're all kinds of error, man. No dancing? There is different types of reformation. There's so you believe in original sin, There's one Lutheranism. saved, always saved. I'm a reformed Christian, a reformed Baptist Christian. 1689, London Baptist Convention of Faith. Yeah. Same thing, same, same thing. tulip. But Same thing as the Westminster Confession of Faith. No, we're not Arminianism either. We're neither. We're not Arminianism. We're neither. Okay, let me just give you the Bible. Forget about all the isms. Let's just talk about the Bible. How about 1 Peter 1, starting in verse 14? As obedient children, not conforming yourself to your former lust, as in your ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, so you also be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, be holy, for I am holy. So we have... As obedient children, we have former lust in your ignorance. He who calls you holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Because it's written, be holy for I am holy. If you're a Christian, then you're perfect. You're in Christ, yes. So if you're a Christian, you're perfect. In Christ. But this is part of the Christians. What's that? What about the fallen Christians then? If they were perfect in Christ and if they fell, that means they weren't perfect then. They never were perfect. Well, if, if you... But they were. You were saying if they were... Well, you can fall away. You can fall away. You can fall away. You can backslide and fall away. No, I am in Christ. In Christ I am. Well, the reason why I'm perfect in Christ, and if I fall out of the Christianism, then I'm not perfect. Well, the reason I'm saying in Christ is because of the Bible says in Colossians 1, starting in verse 27. Okay, but hold on a second. I don't think you do because Colossians 1, verse 27 says this. It says, Colossians, I'll just read it for you. Colossians 1, starting in verse 27, says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Okay, I'll, I'll wait till you're done. I'll wait till you're done. The Bible says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ. To this end we also labor, striving according to his working which works in us mightily. So yes, I'm striving to present people perfect in Christ. And this is what that means. It means the person has repented of their sins, put their trust in Jesus Christ, they become born again of the Holy Spirit, and then they live a life of obedience to God. That's what it means. That's what we're doing. Okay, that's all we're doing. Of course I do. No, absolutely not. That's that's right. Oh no, I've since become a Christian. When you value it, no, I to my own shame. Okay, let me just try to explain this a different way. Then. Let's, 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 let's see if it, I can help you a different way. Hold on a second. Let me see if I can help you explain. I mean, I'm trying to help my... Maybe I'm a bad explainer. Okay, I'm trying to help you. Okay, okay. so so I became a Christian. I was wicked before I became a Christian. I was sinning all the time. Thousands of times, okay? I became a Christian, turned from my sin, and I started living a holy life. Since becoming a Christian almost 25 years ago, I've sinned many times for my own shame. When it comes to salvation, but the pattern of my life has been victory, victory, complete victory over sin. Now, in those times where I've sinned, if I didn't repent of those sins really and continued in it and sin. died in that way, I would go to hell for my sins. I turned back to it. I didn't persevere. I didn't endure until the end in holiness. Okay? But because I confessed and repented of them, God forgive me again. But for someone to say, we sin every day as Christians, that's ridiculous. The devil can't do worse than that. Okay? We're supposed to live holy lives of obedience to God. That's what I... But it's, it's actually possible to do, and we should be actually doing it, not just striving. We don't strive for the impossible, we strive for the actual possible. Okay? That's all I'm saying. And so if I was in some kind of sin as a, as a professing Christian, I'd be in trouble. It's like anybody else. No, there's no different rules for me than anybody else. So I, so I could sin. I have free will to sin. I'm tempted to sin, but I'm overcoming sin. I'm living a holy life. There's no sin in my life right now. Oh, well, no, not right now. No sin in my life. Every sin I've committed is in the past. I've repented of it. I've put it away. But you believe you can still sin? Of course. I have free will. I'm tempted. Of course. With the Antichrist. I don't have to. Like, None of us have to. Midway, I believe in No, I don't know the answer to that question. And, 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 and hold on a second. 
the fact, the fact that you asked, the fact that you asked me that question tells me you don't understand the argument I'm making. So you don't think it's like near? Even if I did sin every single day, which I don't, it would not defeat the fact that what I'm telling you. That God expects you to be holy, and you're supposed to be holy as a Christian. That's all I'm telling you. So it's not like I'm comparing me. Oh, I'm better than you. I haven't sinned in a week, and you sinned today. Not like that. Well, right now they have. We say we have no sin. That's First John one eight. Now read First John two one. They're making red heifers now too. I heard. They've been breeding red heifers. My little children are writing to you. They have a. Okay, stop right there. So why is he writing that letter? Okay, but oh, okay, but it's. But why would he? Why would he write those letters so they wouldn't sin? But he's saying they have to sin every single day. If, if anyone sins, yes. So there's, there's a supposed yeah, you could, I mean, but you don't have to. So if you're going to interpret First John one and say that we always have to have sin in our life, you have a problem with First John two one. And then go back to go back to First John one seven uh, five through seven. It says this is the message we heard from him declaring to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he's in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses from all sin. How can you say you're walking in sin and walking in the light at the same time? And if you're not walking in the light, you don't have fellowship with Christians and you don't have fellowship with God. No, no, they are they're post rapture. They think the tribute is going to happen and then rapture. Right, that's right. He just said right there if you don't walk in the light, you're a liar. We're trying to walk in the light. Yeah. No, no, if you are walking the light, you have fellowship with other Christians and you have the blood of Jesus Christ cleansing you from all sin. If you're not walking at light, you don't have cleansing of sin. Do you think I'll have an opportunity? Don't tell me you can't when it's telling me you have to. When the seven years happen, and then First John think, uh, 2, the next chapter, verses 3 and 4 says, Now by this we know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. He who says I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar. Now, there, so you're following his commandments, correct? That's right. If you look at what the millennial well, we have thou shalt not lie, thou shalt not steal. Uh, if you look up, I don't want to lust after her. You're committing adultery in your heart. That's right. Now you're talking. Not, now, now, now you're talking about ever. You're not talking about present tense. I've already responded to the ever. How many times I've committed? I don't know what that's going to look like today. That's right. Somebody still have That's right. I've already answered that question. We've talked about this several times now. You guys keep going back to the past. And I've told you that I was a wicked sinner before I became a Christian. To my own shame, I answered that earlier. To my own shame, I've since become a Christian. But if I stayed in that state, I would have went to hell if I died in that state. So Christians need to I'm repent if they've sinned. But you shouldn't the, be the sinning. It's that simple. Okay, but I will say I this. I will say this. <laughs> it is Everyone is preparation. That's not true. Yeah, and you, you have no way of knowing that either. Unless you're God, you have no way of knowing that. No, it's not says that everyone has sinned. Romans 3, 23. Everyone has sinned. Actually, the Bible calls Christians saints. The Bible never calls Christians sinners. It calls them saints. What does the word saint mean? It's holy one. What about the thing where Jesus came to the world from a sinner? He didn't come to the name of the beast. Save the one that needs I don't think it'll actually be a 666. For the ones that don't need saving, he came for the ones that need saving. Okay, but has he saved you? Has he saved you? From what? With implantable information on you that you use with credit cards. But what has he come to save sinners from? Because they have that technology. Sin. Okay, so he's come to save you from your sin. If you're still in sin, you haven't been saved from your sin. So, um, it's that simple, and that's I mean, uh, an you know who Nero is. Right? The you see how he's a yeah. Christian so, and he sins. No, 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 hold on a second, hold on a second. Yeah. David was not a man after God's own heart where he's committing sin with Bathsheba and having Uriah killed. He is not a follower of God. While he's, that's why Nathan came to him, rebuked him, and he repented. That's what Psalm 51 is all about. But David, so you don't think he was a man well, I happen to after think that God's heart until after that? Heart. That's not what I said. I'm sure you're I said, while, Nero, hold on. I said while he's committing those no sins, he's not a man after God's own heart. But you just said, though. How can he possibly yeah. be a man after God's own heart while he's committing oh, adultery with Bathsheba and trying to kill Uriah to cover yeah, it up? That's that man's nature. Yeah. Yeah. So, hold on a second. That's not my question. My question, once again, listen to it once again. Let's see if he answered this time. How can David be a man after God's own heart while he's committing adultery with Bathsheba and then plotting 
to kill her husband to cover it up. He's a man. He's not a man after God's own heart. No, but he's a man. I didn't say he wasn't a man. I see. You don't want to answer the question. It's very obvious. You don't want to answer the question. Nathan the prophet came to him, rebuked him from God because he was a wicked sinner. You know, you can you can appeal to your self nature to continue to be a sinner if you want to, but the Bible says. But the Bible. What are you saying then? I'm simply saying that I'm a man who sins. I go back to Jesus to be saved. I keep repenting. I I agree that you're a man who sins. That's your confession about yourself. I agree. I'm a man who doesn't sin. Martin Luther was wicked, man. I don't even talk about Martin Luther. He was wicked. He was wicked. He was wicked. Yes, he was wicked. How? Predominantly. And you think you're perfect? In Christ. How is Martin Luther wrong? Where do I start, man? Where do I start? Okay, well, being born a sinner, having Jesus' righteousness transferred to us. Wait a minute, you want me to answer your question? You know, let me answer. I let me get through one thing. So, so sin being transferred to Jesus? That didn't happen. He said Jesus became the most sinful being in the universe. But Luther said that. Martin Luther said that. So I'm telling you why I think he's wicked, huh? Okay. Well, listen, I, I don't, I don't have the source with me right now in my hand, okay? I wasn't expecting to talk about Martin Luther today, but if you want to know about Martin Luther, you can search for a video on YouTube. You ask me why Martin Luther is, is wicked, I've given you some examples. If you want to know more about what things he said and believed, I would encourage you to search for it. Okay, well, I'll go through it again. He would teach that Jesus became the most wicked person in the world on the cross. Because he believed that our sins are literally transferred to him. That's not true. That's a wicked doctrine. Jesus has never been wicked. He's always been holy, always been righteous. Okay? Another thing, he hated Jewish people. The doctrines of Hitler. He derived them primarily from Luther's writings. And he, he was a Jew hater until he died. What about the, what, Hold on, we're dealing with Luther right now. I know, okay? I have a little something about that. One of the main conduits where you say, like, you but you wouldn't disagree about, that like, for like uh, a thousand years, how it says in the Bible that you only Christian sin became No, no, it wasn't. They were persecuted. So, you don't think he was taking, like, yeah. the sin was like, so your interpretation of that is similar to Luther, that you think he became the most sinful being in the universe. But the predominant. Okay, so then you agree with me that he's wrong? You agree with me that he's wrong then? I don't know if it's wrong. That Luther's wrong. No, he didn't write that. That's in the Bible. I know it's in the Bible. I'm talking about your understanding of it. Yeah, man. Luther understand that verse in 2 Corinthians 5 to say that Jesus became the most sinful being in the universe. He became a prostitute. He became a liar. He became a thief. He literally became those things at the cross. Well, it says what he said. 2 Corinthians 5, you keep on reading it. He who knew no sin became sin for us. It's right there in 2 Corinthians 5. Um, what do you think what's that your Jesus understanding of that? Well, if you look in the Old Testament, we have the example of Jesus, the shadow of Jesus is the scapegoat. You're familiar with the scapegoat in the Old Testament? Okay, so one, one time a year, the high priest would lay his hands upon the scapegoat, set him out into the wilderness, and it's a metaphorical transfer of the sins. That goat did not become sinful. Goats can't be sinners. Okay? And then the lamb was slain and the blood was poured upon the mercy seat and the Holy of Holies on the Ark of the Covenant. That's my example. So Jesus didn't literally become a sinner. He was a sin offering, just like the lamb was, just like the goat was, a sin offering. So what I'm saying is, like, you don't think that he yeah, took upon the way that, like, okay, the sins, he took the sins of the world to die okay. for him? You so in, in, in a metaphorical way, not a literal where he actually had sins on him. Sins, sins can't be transferred. That's what I'm saying. That's what Luther said. He said that literally he became a sinner. That's a really big problem. That's blasphemy, in my opinion, to call Jesus a sinner. Why do you think? Because where did it say that? Where did it say that? 
uh, when he was Mary, on the cross, where does it say that God turned away from him? Gabriel, I think it's Gabriel, that came to I don't know where it's at, but like, Gabriel, like, that's Mary, literally, like, you know what I'm talking about, right? Because I, yeah, I don't remember that's that. what I know that Gabriel, they, they both knew that Jesus was one of the was that were not actually canonical. Why is it they would be so no, 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 no. out it's, by his it's actions? in the Bible, that, like, where... The Bible doesn't say that God turned away from him. Okay, but but let's let's let's, let's, let's run with that for a second. Let's say God, the Father did turn away from Jesus. So you so you understand the Trinity? Okay, so Father, you believe it, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So what, what, what you'd have to tell me is that Jesus literally became a sinner. That's why the Father turned his face away. He couldn't look upon sin, supposedly. He looks upon sin every day in our world, but he couldn't look upon Jesus because he was sin, sinful. How do, you, how do you deal with the Trinity in that situation? How do you deal with the Father and Son not being separable, being one God, but two different persons? How do you deal with that if Jesus literally became a sinner and the Father turned away from him because of that? How do you deal with that? No, no, no. I, I, I think the Trinity is the thing that cannot be I'm going to double check like, like, if we just can't fathom that. You know what I'm saying? Okay, but that's my point, though. My point is that the Trinity teaches that there's three persons, one God. They're completely unified at all times. Yes. But you're telling me, I think so, that Jesus became a sinner, and that's why the Father turned away from him. Uh, I'm not saying Jesus I mean, became a sinner. It, it, it says that in Matthew 27, verse 45 to 46, it says, Now if you take down the adult and God will remind the ninth hour and about the ninth hour, after that, God will oh, say, yeah. My God, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Okay, but forsaken doesn't mean he turned his face away from me. Uh, Jesus said something truly to Okay, so what, forsaken? Okay, well, I, get, I know I know what that word means. I'm just simply telling you that if you look at the, the, the story of Jesus, Jesus in the Gospels, many times they wanted to kill him, they wanted to stone him to death, they wanted to throw him off a cliff. And every time the Father's protection was upon him, he was going to get every situation. And that, and that, the definition of forsaken literally means abandoning and deserted. So do you want me to explain it? Yeah, but then you okay, because I was trying to explain it to you, and I think you were just I mean, looking I, down your phone all the time. He says that, that you don't know what now, that, that word forsaken means. There, he is speaking with Judas. Forsaken means abandoned. Do you believe that Judas is a beaver? Okay, 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 so, so I... But it says that why you forsaken Then what do you think that passage means? He does speak to That's what you're trying to say. What makes you think I don't believe that? Twelve judges. You're just saying that you don't believe that. No, I didn't say that. I said he didn't turn his face from him. That's what I said. Because... abandoned Abandoned. God forsaken well, yeah, Jesus. It's here, but and, and in what way did he forsake him? As the representative of him. What way did he forsake him? It doesn't say how. Uh, that's what I'm trying to explain to you. So please, I don't, I don't have a disagreement with that. I haven't had to throw that the whole time. I'm simply just trying to explain it to you. So maybe you can explain it to me. Because you think I'm wrong, you explain it to me. I mean, all I'm simply saying, he said that the verse that, that God turned away from God. And you said no. No, he said he turned his face away. And the Bible doesn't say that. It says abandoned. Okay, it says so forsake. Does not say abandoned. Forsaken. But, but okay. I mean, the whole point of that conversation we were having about that is you were saying, why did God turn His face away from Him if He wasn't a sinner? If He didn't become sinful at the cross. But that was the context of the conversation. That's what I was addressing the whole time. You can't get context and make your own sense of what He said. I'm not doing that. I'm trying to understand what He's saying. You're putting your That's what I said. Okay. So what are you saying? Why did Why did He turn? That's what I'm asking you, why did he do that? Have, like, that I'm asking you why did he do that. So, but what is your reason for saying he did that? Let's like pretend like this is the first time we've met. That that why did, why did that happen? Why did God That's what I'm asking you. What do, what do, what do you think happened there? So you just, uh, I, said, I mean, I'll give you my explanation here in a second, but I want to know what you say about it. So every time I try to explain myself, you guys are looking down at your phones, you're ignoring me, you're turning away, you're never listening to me. So, I mean, if, if you want me to explain, I'll explain it to you, but I want to hear what you have to say first. Everything I've said has been wrong. For sure. So what do you what do you think it means? I'm asking you. And he was what you have to say about it. Okay, man. I was I was explaining it a second ago. Did they just say what he thought about it? I was explaining it a second ago. I was trying to. I don't know if you heard me. But but all throughout Jesus' ministry, he had three years of ministry. People tried to stone him, throw him off a cliff, lay their hands on him, and every single time, the Father protected him. He's able to get out of the situation. And at the end, he took his hand of protection off of him. Because it's time to die on the cross. That's all it means. There's no problem within the Trinity relationally. Jesus didn't become a sinner on the cross. He forsook him in this way and only. He took his hand of protection off him and allowed the sinners to do to him what they wanted to do to him all along. That's it. Well, do you, can you confess that you do judge? I don't judge. Okay. Okay. I don't judge. I'm not saying I don't judge. So, so the Bible's like, not against what judge, it's against what type of judge. Yeah, no. So we can't That's right. judge somebody's soul and condemn them to, like, help. No, exactly. Similar to the way... 
David had the army withdraw from Uriah. I, I, I try not to judge Similar people and their souls and their actions um, as much as like, because it's not. But that, that's that's some issues I have with Luther. I mean, I, I just, I mean, he did some good things, no doubt about it. But I have so many disagreements with him, so many problems with what he believed. But no way I could agree with him. Even like, the other side of the point, I'm just saying. Like, Cause look at this side. Like look at like this side. The other stuff. He what he so said. Like, Ninety-five thesis. Oh, what? what he did basically. Have you read the Ninety-five thesis? Yeah. Huh? Have you read the Ninety-five thesis yeah, for yourself? Yeah. I mean, most of us. It's not. I mean, I don't. It doesn't really do anything <laughs> well, I mean, for me, really. I mean, you good to know that. I said he could repent. Just saying, it doesn't really. It's not as great as people say it is. Talk about Calvinism as well. Yeah. Are you Calvinist or not? You say you're non-Calvinist, correct? I'm not a Calvinist. I despise Calvinism. I hate the way it misrepresents God, including Lutheranism. I don't like the way it misrepresents God either. Okay, I love God. I know who He is from the Word, from experience. I know His character, what He's like, and I can't stand it when people who call themselves followers of Him misrepresent Him and blaspheme His name and tear down his character. So do you think it's possible for like different denominations of Christians to go to heaven or is it all like Yeah, I don't, I don't think that someone's necessarily going to hell because they have wrong thoughts about well, things, doctrines. Well, I, know I mean, go. it's, it's, it's a it's a case by case basis. But I would say this: that Calvinism, yeah. legitimately, okay, if you follow the doctrine to its logical conclusion, leads you to be a sinner every day. If you're sinning every day, there's no way you're a Christian. Is it likely their there's no way. And, and, and it leads you to believe things about God that couldn't possibly be true. That He's like the author of sin. I mean, that's an abominable thought to me. That's an abominable thought to me to say that God is the author of sin. And that's what Calvinism leads to. It leads to saying God's the author of sin. And so I have a hard time believing that Calvinists can believe stuff like that and still be worshiping the same God as me. You know, so there's issues there, but I, I'm not going to say all Calvinists are damned. It's a case by case basis. You know, but I definitely despise Luther's teachings and Calvin's teaching, and even Zwingli. If I align with anyone from that period of time, it's the Anabaptists who were both destroyed by the Roman Catholics and the Calvinists and the Luther. They all were killing the Anabaptists. They like, hated them. And then that body's going to drop and, and, and so. decay so much, it's going to burst the sun. Been out here all day? It's a very odd way. Since about 11. Okay. Not an odd way yeah. at all. It happens. Say again? So you know it's logical, too. Just last three, yes, ma'am. That's the way you marry the two. That's, 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 How come? that's basically what happens. How come? Well, we pray about where the Lord leads us to go to preach, and we come here usually two or three times a semester to preach. We pray about the days we're going to come here, and this is one of the days the Lord let us to come out here. Before Jesus was here. In My sticking point? Well, I, I just want to preach God's Word. Uh, the good news and the bad news, the whole truth of God. A lot of people to hear it for themselves. They have free will given to them by God. They decide for themselves whether they're going to believe it or not, whether they're going to mock it and scoff it, they're going to hate it, they're going to love it. Whatever, their reaction, that's, that's up to them, their reaction. I'm just here to preach God's Word. All of it. Not just the good parts that everybody likes to hear, the but bad like parts, said, too. Before, Quote, unquote, bad parts. Well, I'll just disagree with you. Do you accept that Judas was hung and that his body separated? Oh, well, I mean, when you become a Christian, you're supposed to forsake all of your sin and live a holy life from there on out. So, so that, that, is, that doesn't mean it's necessarily going to happen. I mean, Christians have free will. They have temptation. They can still sin, okay? But ideally, a Christian should never sin again. I'm not, I'm not saying that's But when is it going to stop completely? When Jesus returns? You can rectify that. That's when it's going to stop completely. I just think that... Uh, you and all sinners will be put in hell. And all the curses will be on, on the kingdom of God on earth. And there will be no more sin ever. Okay, so Judas, I think that... That's when it'll stop. was some fisher guy. And he was very uh, unhappy with life. He left the of Jesus. And he was like, you're telling me that I can be a... Like a a judge of Well, hang on. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, it's a metaphor. You're not going to look up No, no, because if you, if you look at, like, for example, Matthew 25, where you're talking about the sheep and the goats, he uses the same word eternal for life for the sheep and damnation for the goats. And so if we're going to say eternal doesn't really mean eternal for the damnation, it doesn't really mean eternal for the life either. But you, you, can't, you can't have it both ways. So it's eternal in both situations. And God is just and condemning the people for hell for all eternity. He's just in doing that. Because they rejected his son, rejected his truth, rejected their conscience, rejected the word of God, rejected the conviction of the Holy Spirit. They rejected all those things. 
And so God's going to give them what they justly do. Once they go there, no, no. Your only chance for your only chance for for forgiveness and salvation is right now. Doesn't God like overcome hell and doesn't Lucifer in the Bible? Isn't he throughout the Bible? So we think about true separation. No. No. Now Lucifer, Lucifer never goes to hell and comes out. There's there's demons in Revelation who go to the the great abyss, and they're there. I thought the same thing. It's a different place completely. But yeah, there's in, in the in the book of Revelation, there's demons who are let out at the end, who are in the great abyss. But I thought the same thing. And the Bible makes it very clear. Today's the day of salvation. The only hope you have is right now to get right with God. So that's why God has so much urgency and serious and sobriety to get right with God. Don't play games with your soul. Forsake your sins. Yeah. What about when Lucifer or when the devil is seen when he teleports Jesus on the mountaintop when he's tempting Christ? Yeah, Matthew 4. He's not in hell right now. He hasn't been in hell yet, period. Well, no one's in hell right now. Hell's the final place. How's the final place? So no one's in hell right now. Okay. He's never escaped hell. He's never been to hell, so he can't escape it. It says that he was in hell, but uh, no, it says that Christ overcame hell. No, it's, it's actually the Greek word there is Hades. So if an English translation said hell, there it was inaccurate. Hades is a different place than hell. Hades is the temporary abode of the dead where everyone goes when they die. Okay, then there's a res the first resurrection is for the resurrection of the righteous. All the righteous rise from Hades, and then the ones who are still alive rise to the, to the sky to meet Christ in the clouds, and they come back and live with the Lord in the kingdom of God on earth. Is that some sort of uh, purgatory? It, well, purgatory is... Oh, don't do that! Hey, hey. Fuck you! Hey, yo! That's like not cool. Uh, That's not right. so, so purgatory is actually a corruption of the truth. Purgatory is a Roman Catholic doctrine that teaches that you can get you can get out of hell. You can you can have your sins paid for, and you can get out of hell somehow. That's what it teaches. But that's actually a corruption that Roman Catholic Church taught and brought forth to make money. They did. So when it when it comes when it comes to these things, Hades is the truth. She does not represent KSU. She really went out of her way. She got a chat text. She don't go to KSU. Yeah, she got a chat. I know that you believe this. She believes in a spaghetti monster and stuff. Actually, they can't even read those guys. No. My guy disappeared, bro. I'm never afraid that I'm wrong. No. Never once. In the last 25 years almost that I've been a Christian, I've never thought once that I'm wrong about these things. Because I believe in Christ, but I don't. Don't you? Can I hold it? No. Oh, and probably not. Baptist Church, and I, as I grew up and stuff, I didn't really believe any more about, especially the translation of the Bible, that it was so literal. Like when it describes, for example, in Genesis, when it talks about the devil and he comes into the Garden of Eden, and they describe him as like being turned into a snake. Like he's not ever described as being a snake. He's described as being like a, a creature, like as yeah. another walking creature. Like he's never. Okay. Like, why wouldn't he have been allowed in the Garden of Eden anyway if all the animals existed? And like, why would he not have been? Like, why do they describe it in that sense that he was let in instead of just like existing and walking up to him? Like, it describes him as like like a human being, like not a snake. Like, that's just like yeah. an example of what the translation. Well, I, I mean, I mean, these are these are things that get me worked yeah. out. I mean, I, I wouldn't let that turn you away from the faith. I'm not, I'm not saying I'm not saying I'm saying I, I wouldn't let that discourage you. That's all I'm saying. So, when it when it comes to um, things like that, he's described as a serpent there, right? And Revelation describes what? A dragon. A dragon like a serpent. So it could be metaphorical and and, and Genesis two, or it could be literal. That's why I wonder why it says that about hell. Like, how do we know that it's not yeah. when you like throughout the Bible when it's referred to as like, forms and different ways that it's not like meant as something else? It's like a, 
Like What's your name? Ella. Ella? I'm Kerrigan. Five. Ella, watch out for the seat snatcher. The, the seat snatcher. Seat snatcher. Matt, Matt, Matt is a is a Bart Ehrman fan. He'll seek to turn you away from Jesus. I'm just, just warning you ahead of time. He will he will seek to turn you away from Jesus. I am, but I don't agree in like like I have a lot of doubts and questions about the translations, and I don't believe that homosexuality and stuff is something that God hates. I don't think that God that like hates people. I don't. Well, think he hates people. I, I don't want to like take over anything, but the point you were making, it's a very good one. I, I was interested. Thank you. See, seat snatcher. Like I, I can add to it. Like, yeah, go ahead. I want Yeah, so uh, what you're talking about is Jesus probably said that. The, oh, no. Before he did that. Before he did that, and then right. after, he God redeemed him. Is it God redeemed because him. Because he truly repented and that did it. Uh, but there is the whole idea of repentance that he, he was still a man of God's own heart, but he stood up. Sure. Go ahead. That's, that's why I still got water. That was so rude. I'm all right. Um, so I know you've been doing this for a while. Yes, ma'am. Do you know about how long you've been like coming to here? Oh, Kennesaw State. I think the first time I came here was 2007, and then I didn't come here again until 2018. I've been coming since then. Okay. And then what church is it? Uh, we're Maranatha Fellowship, but we're not. We're not like. Trying people to come to our church. Okay. We're just here to preach the gospel. Yeah, I would We're from two hours away, though, so it'd be in, in it'd be hard for someone to come to our church from two hours away. Yeah. Okay. Hey. I do. Yeah. I was just gonna congratulate you again. Thank you. I know it's hard, yes, <laughs> especially in the last days of the Lord doing. Like this. Yeah. If I remember right, you told me last time you and your family hold signs? Yeah. Okay, yeah, I appreciate you. We haven't been you. able to because my mom's been sick, but my yeah. father started again this week. So, yeah. Praise God. Even if I try to evangelize on campus, it's like people don't want to hear it. So it's, it's really hard. Well, keep persevering. Yeah. God will use you. Yeah. Thank you for your encouragement. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you for doing this. Amen. Yeah. Thank you for being a godly woman in this wicked and corrupt generation. I know. It's hard. I'm only 18. So yeah. it's like, yeah, I just got baptized last year. People okay. Think, um, usually people think I'm Muslim. I'm like, no, it's just modesty. You know, yeah. God calls us to be holy, yep. to cover ourselves. That's right. Because if I don't cover myself, I'm going to cause someone else to sin. Amen. And I had to learn that at a young age because I did like dressing, like with revealing clothing. That right. was all me. I've been there before. So. Right. Yeah, it's difficult, but it's for the better. So, Amen. Yeah. Thank you, sister. Thank you. Thank you as well. God bless you. You too. <laughs> Isn't like a like a website, like a YouTube, like a yeah, I can give you my. Uh, gospel track here you can find the website yeah there's a website in the back and that'll lead you to my website and also youtube channel will be there as well Mama? I, I, I didn't mean any disrespect here. oh that's okay that's okay i don't think that was right either yeah but again, this is something like, we have all some sort of three points yes. everyone's trying to find the right thing yeah everyone's trying to find the right so it's okay to have I mean, I, to, I, I get like a whole idea of this. Like, I mean, it's good, you know. I mean, like it's called oh, yeah. to it's say. Yeah. 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 The gospel. Yeah. yeah. It's okay to have passion and discussion. Oh yeah, yeah. It's definitely. Yeah. 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 I mean, that's something that. Yeah. Uh, it's a good thing to have, you know. Yeah. yeah. And like, not everyone's gonna be free. That's the thing to think about. Like, how like heaven's gonna be? It's not gonna be like cookie cutter, like robots just getting up, walking out, doing the same thing, coming back. Like, that's the good thing about like mankind and like God. Design. There's gonna to be tons of different stuff, and at the end of the day, it's all gonna to come together, you know. Right. And it's just gonna like just, it's his design, which we don't even know right now. You know, like it's just all gonna come in. And at the end of the day, it's gonna work out how you want it to. Anyway. But it's just yeah. well, keep seeking the truth. God will reveal Himself to you through His Word and and by experience as well. Good talking to you, man. Good talking to you. My name is Kerrigan. Kerrigan, I'm Ashwin. Hi, good to meet you. Nice to meet you too. All right. I'm Ashwin, yeah. Okay. Uh, just for a couple of This is like my so what's actually, I like to talk about What's that? Like uh, so what's Christian actually about to see those obey? Yeah, oh, you're like spreading Christianity like something. Spreading God's word. God's word, yeah. yeah. Interesting. Bible. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, I'm trying to learn about all these things. Oh yeah? Yeah. What's your background? Yeah, I'm, um, I'm, I'm a Hindu. Oh, okay. Okay. And your name is Asher? Ash Wynn. Ash Wynn, okay. Yeah. I was going to say, Asher's a biblical name. <laughs> <laughs> and they 
I, I think we're I think we're getting ready to leave Ashwin, but um, there's a gospel track that tell you a lot about Christianity, and I have. Can you give me something else to read too? Can you read it? Okay. Uh, what's that? Is that the LGBT community? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, something like that. Let's see here. Is it the washing of regeneration? Oh, yeah. yeah, it's in green. Are these rainbow colors? Yeah, they are rainbow colors. Yes. Isn't it pretty? In the, in the New Testament, <laughs> it never calls a sinner. Anytime you mention, I know I don't, I don't think I have it on me. Okay. Well, you can show me in the scripture where it calls a believer. Enough, and that's oh. okay. Here's another one. Oh, okay. But if you seem like you're interested in talking about this, um, I'm going to leave here in a minute. But what I was going to say is, my website's are on the back here. Oh, okay. Right there and right there. And I, okay. I'd be glad to talk to you through email. Oh, evang oh evang I've heard of this word. Endpointevangelism.com. Evangelism. Evangelism. Yeah. evangelism. Yeah. Okay, got it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so if you email me through those websites, you have questions, I'll answer them for you. Oh, okay. Yeah. So what are they uh, doing here? Oh, they're protesting us. They don't like us. Lord, yeah, they hate Lord, what we stand for. <laughs> so. I hope you guys stay out there. Yeah, appreciate it, man. Thank you. Appreciate that, man. Then, uh, in my uh, beliefs, like, I don't support um, gay marriage or yeah, lesbian marriage. Are. Because God won't accept that. That's right. So you're gonna yeah, we agree on that. We agree on that. Yeah, it's, it's, the Bible calls it perversion. Yeah. You know, man, man is meant for woman, woman for man, not man for man, woman for woman. And, and there's no this, none of the stuff of, I'm a man in a woman's body. Oh, okay. That's nonsense. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, God, God, God is, God is binary. Oh, okay. Male, male female. And female. Yep. There's no. Marriage there's just something between a male and a female. That's right. And, and there's no, my preferred pronouns are he, him, oh, they, okay. her. That's that's nonsense, man. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> that the Bible teaches. He sure does. Jesus told the adulterous in the Jesus will not accept the man that he just healed. Jesus will not accept her gay marriage. No, he won't. Or a lesbian marriage. He won't accept sin at all, actually. Sin, yeah. He calls people to repent of their sin, to stop their sinning, to follow him and obey him, not be a sinner. Oh, okay. <laughs> What's your name again? Kerrigan. Kerrigan. Yes, Ashwin, right? Yeah, Ashwin. I'm nice talking to you, Ashwin. God bless you. I'm, I'm a civil engineering major here. Okay, yeah. cool. You can Great. Too. Yeah, yeah I, I like that kind of stuff. I love you, that's why I tell you the truth. <laughs> Take care, Ashwin.